getting this present. It started. How many people know what the loop fire was? I mean, you've read about it and lost interest in it five minutes after you read it. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm going to be leading it off. Uh, my name is Gordon King. I was with the uh, Bridge of Hot Shots from 61 to 66. Started out as, I'm going to use terms you probably aren't familiar with, but I started out as a foreman, worked up to assistant superintendent, then to super for two years. Back in those days, you didn't stay long in any position more than two years, and they moved you along pretty quick. You have to understand that uh, this was a little bit after the Second World War, and a lot of people that were in the Forest Service that went into war didn't come back. So there was a lot of rebuilding of the Forest Service. Uh, my first indication of what the hot shots were was in 1951. Probably when your grandfathers were teenagers. And maybe even before that. <laughs> With Del Rosa, believe it or not. I was on Del Rosa for six weeks, went to four fires. I was playing football at San Diego Valley College. And that was one of the things you did when you played football in San Bernardino. You went up and you got in shape at Del Rosa. Uh, they found out, well, I graduated from high school when I was 16, and they didn't bother to check my dates and find out how old I was. So six weeks into the fire season, in the middle of a fire, the uh, su superintendent walked up to me, his name was Gordon Bostetter, I'll never forget it, and he said, why in the hell didn't you tell me you were 16? And I just looked at him and said, well, nobody asked, so why should I tell? And then he hauled my ass off there right away, and away I went. Anyway, it was interesting, but I liked it. We did several fires at Cajon Pass in those days. The trains would come down and start fires, just like clockwork, 2.30 in the afternoon, you'd get a fire call and run over there. Uh, Give you a little bit more history about what it was like back in those days. The trucks that we traveled in were stake sides. They had stakes on the sides. They had benches. The tools were stored in blankets underneath the benches. There was four benches in a row and as many as six people per bench. Sometimes there was eight people per bench, which kind of did this to you. Uh, one of the funny things that happened to me was my first fire I went to. We practiced getting on and off, on and off, on and off. Well, the first fire we come running down there and all the old timers were standing around. And I said, what the hell? And they saw us green horns come up and say, go on, get in there, get in there. So up in the front we got, oh boy, that was fun. And they piled in there. So we started down the theater over Del Road. So there's a little twisty road go down there that makes a run all the way out to, to the highway. Well, that's when I discovered that that's not the place to be because there was bugs that hit you in the face, the teeth, your nose, everything as they're going down the road. And all I heard in the back was guys bent over giggling and laughing, you know, because we were all, oh boy, this is fun. What the hell was that? <laughs> hit by a bug. And after that, we wouldn't fall for any of that stuff. Uh, let's graduate on up to 1958. Uh, I went into the Army, served several years there, got out, and had a failed marriage and looking for some place to go. Glendora, I wound up on the Angus. I was on the Dalton Hot Shot Cruise. For those six weeks on Del Rosa, they made me a crew foreman on Dalton. And I had no clue what the hell I was supposed to do. Bob Cathy was the foreman, but I had a good time there. Uh, I went to about 11, 12 fires. The biggest fire was right here on this district, the Stewart Fire. December. 17 days on that fire and all we did was watch it because you never knew where it was going to go. It was burning over here on the Stewart Ranch. Uh, other than that, came back, went to the uh, fire manager officer and told him that I, that I was going to stay with the hot shots. He said, no, you're not. You're going to become a fire prevention technician. Uh, I want to tell you something, there's nothing to me more boring than being a fire prevention technician. But I spent 59 there, and uh, in the winter of 59, I got told, I'm not going to say who his name is, he's well known, that I didn't want to be a, here anymore, and I quit. This was in December of 59. He said, you sure? I said, yes, I, I'm sure. He said, well, where are you going to go? He says, I'm going to go down to Cleveland. 
and to get a job down there. I got a, had a, met a guy that had worked down there, and he said it's a pretty good place. So I jumped in my car, wound up going down to Santa Ana and applying for a job. And they put me in down here in Timbiscal Canyon. Me and the foreman and a Mormon Harrington, 100 and 200 some odd gallons of water. And I sat there from uh, January 3rd to about April 1st. And every day we were in a Plan 8, which meant high fire danger. San Andres blew constantly. The only fire we went on was a house fire. We saved the foundations. <laughs> and they did a real good job, man. They looked good. They, they rebuilt them and everything else. But that was about the extent of it. I wound up over Silverado Guard Station. Uh, me and the other guy could lay brick pretty good and block. And so we wound up building 5,000 5, gallon water tanks all along the North Main Divide. And I think some of them were still there. They may be. Then I went over to Tabuco Canyon as a tanker foreman on a class two tanker. Class two tankers in those days was a truck with no side gates to them and they slip on a 180 gallon water tank with a pump on it and water like that. That was what's called a class two tanker. Class ones were the bodied ones. Class twos were open and class three was a pickup truck with a pee pumper on the back of it. And I stayed there for about a month and I said, you got to get, I talked to an assistant fire manager, I said, you got to get my butt out of here, I'm going stir crazy. And he said, well, can't, hit, can't put you anymore. I said, well, send me up to Del Rosa, or up to El Carrizo. I heard they just started up. And I said, well, they don't have any position up there. And I raised hell with him for about two weeks. They finally said, okay, okay, okay. And they came up here, which was over at the old camp over here. I got here just in time to go on a fire on the Six Rivers. Uh, the very day I showed up is the very day they were getting ready to go to a fire on the Six Rivers. And that plaque down there, I'll give you the Six Rivers, I forget the name of the fire, but it was in the timber. And, and all we had done is trained in the brush. And now we had it trained in the, to go fight fire in the timber. No chainsaws. But in those days, you didn't need chainsaws because you had logging companies that were very active in those days. And they had sawyers, and they usually, as soon as the fire took off, they quit their job and go work for the Forest Service. They got three times the pay. And we used them to cut that trees. We didn't need any chainsaws in those days. And they weren't very dependable anyway. But the chainsaws that those guys carried were about that long. They were huge things. It took a pretty good sized man to handle the darn thing. Okay, that begins to pretty much where I came from and how I wound up on up here in El Carrizo. Uh, about well, when coming back from that fire on, up on the Six Rivers, the foreman of Crew 2 was having some lake problems. And he had Doug Campbell, who was the superintendent, then said, OK, uh, we're going to have to transfer you somewhere else because we're going to need to call them down. So I wound up taking over Crew 2. And that's what I did for the next two years. Um, 63, Marv Stout showed up in 62 as the assistant to Doug. The next year, 63, became the superintendent, and I became the assistant superintendent, on and on and on, up to where I became the supervisor. Now, the Loop Fire was rather a peculiar fire. It was a Santa Ana, what was left of a Santa Ana fire, let's put it that way. And Santa Ana was just a gentle influence from the east when we arrived on the fire. We got the call early in the morning, because the fire started at night. We got the call early in the morning to get ready. Uh, the fire was actually going out towards L.A. County. And they weren't too sure that they needed any more hotshot crews on the fire because they had three, I think it was three hotshot crews up on the contractor's point. And nevertheless, the dispatcher said, have your guys get ready anyway. Pack some lunches and just sit around and wait. You know, sit around and wait. You, know, you tell a fireman to do that and he goes bananas. So about 10, 30 or so, we got the call from, the, these calls were all from telephones, landline. There was no radio between here 
and Escondido. There was no radio between here and San Diego. It was all pick up the phone, dial the number. Uh, got the call and said, get ready to go. And when you, we'll give you a call here when they actually want you. So loaded the crew up and I was sitting in the office and got a phone call and they said, head on down to Little T, Little Tonga. There'll be somebody there that'll direct you where to go. If there's nobody there, continue on up to Contractors Point. Well, I was familiar with the, that whole area. I worked there for two years and was familiar with it. So, as soon as you get over Pomona Hills in those days, you were out of radio contact with anybody on the Cleveland. So, it was just keep driving until somebody flags you down. So, we went up into a little Tahunga and came up on the station. It's a lot different station than it is now. We came up to the station, there was nobody there. We looked around over there, so we continued on. Went up following the flags and went on up to Contractor's Point, offloaded to Contractor's Point in the early afternoon. Uh, I was the line boss, the division boss, who I knew very well. Uh, we came over and said, you know, here's what here's the situation. The fire is burning that away away from us. Uh, Del Rosa, Chileo, and Dalton have been cutting line over on the east side, northeast side, and they tied off to a cat line. What you do is go down this cat line till you get to where it ends, and you'll come to a gully, and right across there is where the fire line is at. What they wanted us to do was to cold trail. That means nothing. You just walk around, feel, if you see a burn spot, feel it, see if it's hot, if it's hot, knock it around and make it cold. <coughs> so we got on, got unloaded and we didn't take fire shelters, we didn't take our headlamps, we didn't take our files. In fact, all we took was water in our hand to us. And went over and said, what we'll do is we'll, you guys go on and work your way down to the bottom where LA County is down there and we'll bring your trucks around. Okay, so we started out, uh, got this rock slide, and all the rocks had pretty much fallen. You could see where the brush had burned away and the brush that was holding the rocks that slid down. So I talked to my crew boss, it was Raymond Chi, a little Indian kid, who's also the head hook, and I said, I'm going to go across, you keep your eye open, you see something, yell. So it wasn't very far across, probably from about here to that wall there. And, Cross I went, nothing. So I told Chi, send three people over, and you too. You come over with. So three guys walked across, and then there was four of us on that side, on the west side. And so I took took Chi. Says I'm going to go down along this path here. Down there was sort of a. It's a lot different now than it was then. This is 50 years ago, and the, all the rains have really gutted that place. But I went down through this little wash and there's no brush. Brush was on the east side, there's nothing on the west side. So brush had come up top, right on top of the hill and then it dropped like this and it was burned all over there. In fact, I stood on a rock, grabbed a hole to, to, to see where the fire was at and you could see it was all burned out. So I told Ray, I said, bring them over two at a time and when you get about 10 of them over there, send them on down to me. So I wandered on down, there was nothing going on. Uh, got down to the Oh, I'd probably a hundred yards from where we were, because I was waiting for some of the crew to come across. There wasn't really anything that we could do except walk out. There wasn't any brush. Once in a while, you found something, and Ray would knock it out with a brush hook, and that was the extent of it. We got down to a point where there was two big rocks. I mean, they had big boulders, decomposed granite. They had wedged together. You could see that this was an area where Rain had washed out these rocks and they came down and they, boom, they stopped. And sand piled up behind it. It was like a little waterfall down below. Dropped about eight feet down and then cleared out. I worked my way around on the right side of it because that was the easiest way to get around it. And I was standing down below. And Ray came up and he said, I got the ten guys across and there's some more coming across. I said, okay, fine. I turned and looked down and I could see the L.A. County off to my right. Uh, two cats, several pumper crews, they were laying water lines, a hand crew was behind them. And 
this wasn't anything really going on. They were just building line, building line. I stood there for a few minutes and I looked down and I could see that on the next canyon over there was a smoke way down below and the LA County were headed that way. The cats, they were a lot closer to it than I was. And I looked at it for a few minutes and didn't pay any attention to it. And I turned around and I asked Chi how many guys behind him. He says, well, I count about ten. They're all scattered out of there. I said, okay. I took about two steps and I heard a helicopter. And there have been helicopters. These are G3Bs, a little single two, three seat people, passenger, two passengers, two passengers, a pilot, and they carried about 70 gallons of water if they were lucky. And you couldn't see it because it was below where I was at. It was on the other side of the ridge. I could hear it. And I didn't pay any attention to it. I was looking where the smoke was at and I was looking where we were going. We are going to go down this way and the smoke was over there. So I was getting ready to tell Ray, I said, well, bump about five guys around and we're going down a little bit further down. The helicopter, I heard it flare. They slow down, they flare, and then they throttle down, use the rotor to slow down. Then they throttle up, and I heard it throttle up, take off. I didn't see it. And the next time I did look up, see it way down the valley, and it phone up, made turns going out. Didn't pay any attention to it. Um, I, I heard something, I heard the guys, the LA County over there, start yelling. And I could hear what they were saying. They were yelling for the guys with the hoses to get over here quick. Uh, it, there was a big deep V, and that fire was way down below there, so they couldn't do anything but stand up on top and shoot water down to it, which they couldn't do anyway because the hose line hadn't come up that far yet. Cat line was about 100 feet from there. Um, I heard something. I was, look, I was looking like this, looking at Ray. I heard something, I turned around, and I looked down there and I said, oh, Christ. And I said, Ray, send me a hot, hot spotting crew. And that was a Pulaski and two shovels. Basically, we'd go down, the Pulaskis would dig up the decomposed ground shovel and throw dirt at it. So we'll go down there and put that fire out. And I turned back around again, and then way down below, I could see the brush, the leaves on the brush just crimpled like this. They just like popcorn, just crimpled. And I looked at it, and I but first it didn't register what the hell I was seeing. And then it registered. It was hot air. And I turned around to Ray and I said, Ray, reverse to an order to get the hell out of here. And I was standing about like this. And I was yelling, get the hell out of here. And I turned around like that and wham, I got hit right in the butt. Drove me right into the rock. I lost my hard hat. Good for What the hell's going on? I got up, turned around and looked to my left and wham, I got hit all along here, face, all and I got my hot air. It wasn't fire yet. It was hot air coming rushing up there, probably two, three hundred miles an hour, strong enough to knock me all over the place. I didn't hear anything after that. The ray was gone. Uh, it hit the rock and I assumed it went, went straight up. So I sat there and I looked out. I had my sleeves were actually rolled up for back in those days. Got to be rolling way up there. And I looked and skin was hanging down on both sides, my hands, skin was hanging all over there, and I could only see out of my left eye. I thought, what the hell? But what I had didn't know or at the time I recollected afterwards that when I turned back around and I looked this way, I got hit here. Well, I had a pair of dark glasses like that with plastic, and I took my hand and whacked it because they shriveled up like that, and I saw them do it, so I whacked it, and I wanted to damage my eye. What I didn't know at the time was that the whole side of my face was a big bubble. It was just first degree burn. When I whacked it, it was a second degree burn, and the flap of skin dropped over my eye, and I was looking out through a transparent, translucent right eye and a good left eye. I didn't bother me at that time. All I could think about is, you got to get out of here. This is no place to be. Well, first thought was, I ain't going that way because that's where the fire's at. I was off to the west and I had to climb way up and drop into another canyon. So I did the cardinal rule, don't go into the green. Well, I broke it. I went into the green. All I could think about then was just getting the hell out of there as fast as I could. 
Uh, brush was moderate. I don't know what the classification you're familiar with. It's type 13, which is way over your head, probably 15 feet in those days. And it was pretty thick. But in brush in those days, there wasn't much leaves down below. It was all up above. So I started doing this, working my way down through the brush, and falling down several times. I had a one gallon canteen strapped to my back. Fell down a few times and looking at my hands, I realized I've been using my hands to get my way down the chute and slow down and they decompose granite, leaves, rocks, everything. It's all through my arms. I said, hmm, that's, oh well. So I got to get the hell out of here. It's all I could think about. It's got to get the hell out of here. I looked back once and all I could see was smoke. And I didn't know what to think actually. I didn't know what happened to the crew. Uh, went over to this, worked my way down to this one spot where when you look at the photographs today of the same area, it's entirely different, but the, there was about a 90-foot cliff straight down where the wash in the earlier days had washed, there's sort of a big horseshoe take wash it straight down. And I'm standing there, I'm looking down, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you got to get the hell out of here. Uh, I look off my left, and here come a uh, L.A. County pickup truck I come driving down from the dam. I don't know what he was doing up there. But I said, okay, and I just lift my feet up, put back on my canteen, lift my hand, and slid all the way down. <coughs> Fortunately, I didn't hit anything on the way. If I'd hit a rock or something, I don't know what would happen, but I slid all the way down on my canteen and my back. And I would wind up on my feet about 30 yards in front of the truck driver that was in that pickup truck. Turned out to be a battalion chief. And I was standing there like this with things hanging all over me and this big old patch of skin hanging over my eye. And he, he slammed on the binders and cause I, I don't think he knew what was going on. He got out of his truck, he walked towards me and he stopped. And he said, you all right? And I said, oh yeah, you know, I'm all right. And he, I could tell that he wasn't feeling too well. <laughs> he was kind of, getting ready to puke. But he said, we, he said, come on, get in the truck. I'll take you on down to where the rest of the tankers and the overhead was at. I said, fine. He opens the door. I jump in. I'm not holding on to anything. I just thought this was all it was burning. And I sat down and holy crap, my butt hit the deck and whoosh, right out of the car I went. It was burned all the way back here, all the way down here, all the way up and down the back second degree because I popped every blister I had and I said no that ain't gonna work I can't get I can't sit down and he said well you know you can't walk down there it's too far so I said well I'll hook my arms around the tailgate and stand on the bumper you take me down there he says you sure I said that's the only option so I hooked my arms around there climbed up on the bumper down like this and we went on down to where the battalion chief and all the rest of them. Well, they, in the meantime, they were seeing what was going on up there. I wasn't. I couldn't see a thing. Uh, I was still in shock. I didn't feel a thing except when I sat down. And uh, I would tell you, when you get burned, your body does some strange things at times. It really depends upon who you are, I guess. But I felt no pain. I felt no problems except when I tried to sit down. When I'm standing, everything was cool. So I get down get off the pickup truck and I'm walking, I have my arms like this, I'm walking over to where the guys were at and they were all eyes big as saucers, you know, I don't think they'd ever seen anybody that was burned. And this one guy came over and I had this, this one gallon canteen in my back, it was an ammo belt with suspenders is what we used in those days. And he said, here, let me get that thing off here. And, he it, and I couldn't get it off, you know, so I bent over and he pulled it off the back like that. Well, when I bent over like this, and he pulled out where I stood up, that flap of skin was up here like a sea again. I thought, oh, good. <laughs> I was still in shock. I didn't realize what was going on. You know, all I knew was I was alive. So they sat me down on the back of a tanker, and they started pouring water on me. Don't do that. I can tell you that right now. Don't do that. Cover the, the burn first and then pour water on don't just pour water on a burn. It's the worst thing you do. I come off that thing screaming. 
Oh, it's okay, sit down, sit down, like that. And about, a, I don't know how long I stayed there. I know it was getting dark. I know people were arriving off a helicopter, which Kyle's going to tell you about. Uh, I went out of shock into, I don't know, blackout. I would come and go, come and go, come and go. Uh, next thing I know, I was being loaded in an ambulance. They took me down to Silmar, a small hospital down there that was not equipped to handle what had happened to us. But anyway, they did the best they could. They trimmed away most of the burned skin. They trimmed away most of the rocks and dug them out. And it was just constantly swabbing off with warm water and brushes and warm water and brushes. There was another guy sitting there in there with me. And to this day, I don't know who that was. You know, I never been able to find out. But he was burned too. He was brought in off the helicopter. Um, that night, Somewhere during the night, they decided they were going to ship everybody to L.A. County General, the meat factory, where they teach people to be doctors. So they shipped all of me down there, and pretty soon I wind up in a room with these ugly little <coughs> guys standing around there looking at me. And there was, well, how many of them were there? Seven? Seven. And we were all, they were started, I was on one side of the room, they were on the other side of the room, and the guys on this side got smeared with some kind of crap, and the guys on that side of the room got smeared with a different kind of crap. They were experimenting on us. They had no idea what they were going to do with us, because they never, you know, a lot of guys up there burned, some of them bad, some of them not so bad, but we were all burned. Uh, the, the thing that pissed me off was that they wouldn't let any of our family in to see us. The only ones they let in were the TV crews and reporters. But they kept the families out. They wouldn't let wives and mothers and whatever come in and that first night. Um, my experience in the hospital lasted about four days, four or five days. My mother, who was a registered nurse, knew what the L.A. County General was like, and she made arrangements to have me transferred to the Good Sam Hospital. She had some connections and doctor there, and they transferred me there. It ended the Good Sam. The very first thing they did was put me in reverse isolation. In other words, anybody coming into me had to be completely bug-free. They couldn't get in there if they weren't scrubbed down and had masks and all the rest of that. They cleaned the clothes and everything else. Uh, I spent probably five days with the doctor, four or five hours a day, picking rocks out of my flesh, out of my meat, the bones, and everything else. Just sliding down and just embedded them. He had never seen anything like that. And it, uh, I said, you don't see very many people sliding down the side of a hill either. So it was. We had a good laugh there. The one thing that I did like about it, I could drink all the beer I wanted because I could replace the liquid that I had lost. Mm -hmm. So they, guys from the Andrews would come over there and my refrigerator was full of six packs. <laughs> Just loaded with six packs. And 44 days later, I got out. Uh, they discharged me. And went back to El Carrizo here, was living in the village at that time. Uh, in February, they transferred me down to the Descanso District, and I worked out of their assistant fire management officer for a couple of years. Decided that's not what I want to do. I want to go back to college. Me and the wife both went back up to Humboldt State College and got our degrees. I got a degree in forestry. She got a degree in psychology. Guess you know who made some money? <laughs> not me. <laughs> so anyway, that's the extent of I came back, came back to the Six Rivers and stayed on the Six Rivers uh, till 70, 78 and I got a good offer from the BLM and I took it and I went from a GS-7 <coughs> to a GS-12 overnight. I was a resource officer for a couple of years. Then I found out quite by accident that they were scheduling me to go to Boise. and. I've been to Boise with a hot shot crew. It's a hot place in the summertime. It's miserable in the wintertime. And I said, what do I want to go up there for? It says, well, we're thinking about starting up an interagency fire center in Boise. We want you to represent 
the BLM because of your fire experience and all the rest of that stuff. I went home and told my wife. She looked at me and said, I'm not going. Boise has nothing that I want. And I said, well, you're the only one that doesn't think that way because I don't think Boise has anything I want either. So I went back and told the guy that uh, he was the resource management officer in California for the BLM. And I went up to Sacramento and I told him, he says, I appreciate the officer, but no thank you. I don't want to go up there. I don't want to get in, in part of that. I didn't even want any part of fire to begin with. But um, I quit. <clears throat> on a Friday and on Monday, I opened up an automotive repair shop that I bought and had it for 20 years and retired. And here I am. Any questions? How did the Green Berets get started? Well, Gordon. Oh, no. How did the Green Berets get started? Oh. <laughs> uh, these little things. 1965, my son from my first marriage uh, became a ranger in the U.S. Army. And I get a phone call from him in late 65, that, uh, or no, I'm sorry, late 64, that he was being shipped to Vietnam. And they were down at what is the, then the El Toro Marine Base, and they were flying all of them out from over there. And so we drove all the way up from Descanso to El Toro and went in there and met him. He had a green beret on. And he was a member of a six-man team in the Green Berets. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And when I got back, wished him goodbye, and then when I got back down to uh, El Carrizo here, I thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. And I went down. I also were down there and I found a guy that sold green berets. In fact, you could sell a brown beret, a black one, a blue one, anything you wanted. I said, how much are they? And he said, 75 cents each. And you have to understand, that was 63. So I said, oh, okay, give me a hundred of them. So about a week later, he had a hundred green berets. And I found another guy that, had, that I wanted to put a little emblem on like this. And then there was an engraver about two doors down. And I drew out what I wanted. And I said, what can you do with this? He said, oh, no problem. That was easy to make. So make me a hundred of them. So he made a hundred of them. I went down there. I think I, the whole thing cost me about 20 bucks or something like that. I don't know what it was. 20 bucks in those days was a lot of money. Doesn't seem like it nowadays, but it was a lot of money in those days. And. I came back up in, in uh, 65, that summer fire season started. And I didn't really have any idea what I was going to do with these green berets, give them to the guys or what. So the guys that had been there in 64, I gave them the green berets. There wasn't very many of them, they gave them green berets. And I said, you guys decide how you want to give them out. And they came up with their own rules, I guess. I had nothing to do with it. And I, you had to spend so many hours on a hotline. You had to go to so many fires. You had to pass so many courses. But the hotline was the big thing. Was, uh, it was easy to get on the hotline in those days. I mean, if El Carrizo showed up, you, they put us right where the fire was at. And they expected us to put it out. So that's how they earned the Green Berets. And usually two fires, three fires, you had it because we were always in the initial attack or first one there type of situation in those days. Even here on the forest or even over in the Angeles. We went to a lot of Angeles fires. Uh, the Green Beret became sort of a symbol in fire camp. People hated it. People liked it. The ones that hated it were the overhead. The ones that liked it were the guys, the crew. So I figured, well, it's pissing the overhead off, so it must be a good idea. So <laughs> we kept going. Um, <laughs> got, they, when the fire actually happened, I think the press made a bigger deal out of the Green Berets than what it really was. But that was back in the days of Vietnam War. So they saw you know, Green Berets, they made us look like 
superhuman heroes or something. They were the elite of the elite, or whatever the hell that was. But that's basically where the Green Beret came from. And then each year we put a little date, had a little thing made in the date. And then after the fire, they banned it. Got a direct letter from Washington saying no. And uh, somewhere, Warren Burchette had that letter. I don't know why he ever did with it, but I didn't want any part of it. And they just basically said that, uh, no, you can't wear that anymore. You, know, you can wear your hard hats and that's it. Well, that was, that, you know, I was off the hot shots, but then I was down at Del, uh, the Scanson. But I felt kind of sorry because it actually picked up your spirits. You could only wear them off duty. You couldn't wear them when you were on duty. Around the camp, lunchtime, and off duty around the camp, and fire off duty around the fires, and fire camp you could wear them. And the guys always carried them with them anyway, so they never left their side. And several times they would we'd be coming in off of a 20, 30 hour shift and beat the crap out of us and they'd rip out the green braids and put their hard hat in their back pocket and go walking into the fire camp singing songs. That pissed people off. God, it pissed people off. Everybody else come dragging in like, oh, God, man, you know. Okay, where's the child wagon? Where's the water wagon? And we come sashay in there like we'd just come in on a picnic. And what they didn't know is when we got out of sight, we collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times guys never even bother to take their boots off, they just collapse and go to sleep. Anything else? I got a question. <laughs> Over here, Tori. The um the duck, where did that come from? Really? Yeah, the, the duck. The Gonna have to ask these two guys. Okay. <laughs> the duck uh, came about from Doug Campbell. He was a superintendent at uh, El Carrizo in 1961. Um, he wanted some kind of symbol uh, for the, to recognize the group. And uh, he presented some ideas to his wife, uh, uh, different characters and everything. And they came up with the duck, a Daffy Duck. Okay, that's where it first started, uh, and it's just been a tradition ever since. Until you guys, at some point, I don't know what year they changed, but they went to the the one with the, the duck coming out of the bamboo and everything. And and now they're coming back to the original duck, which I'm pleased about. That's it. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you guys actually know how the hot shots started? And when they started, and why they started. I don't think so. I, had, I did a little research on this because I'm now semi-retired. Is it was it brought on from a concept from the Russians when they started when they would do their forestry and they had they would do hot shots and. Well, it them. actually goes back before the turn of the 20th century, believe it or not. Uh, go back to the lumber days on the East Coast when they started cutting down trees to build homes, to build ships and all kinds of things. Uh, they had no regard for the slash or the trimmer that they didn't use. So as they were cutting their way westward, they would leave a lot of debris on the ground. Well, there were some terrific fires that arose from that. People lost their lives in the thousands, even before the 20th century came into being. Uh, San Gabriel, San Gabriel Reserve, which is the, one of the first forests on the West Coast, uh, the reason why it arrived, because it was in an area that the missionaries back in the turn of the century used to call the land of the smokes. Because in Southern California, there, in the summertime, there was always a fire going somewhere. Uh, it just just was. 
you're coming up into the West Coast, the Redwoods, and all the rest of that area where they're cutting timber. A lot of money was made cutting timber. Not anything was done in regards to what they left on the ground. So catastrophic fires arose from that. Several towns were burned to the ground. People lost their lives. About uh, just before the First World War, people were starting to get Forest Service built up to where the actual patrolmen were the police. They wore a sidearm. They could arrest you upon sight if they saw you doing something that would harm the forest. They rode horses. Uh, it was really, I have a story where in 1958 at Glendora Ranger Station, they had a, a basement down below, and in the fall of 58, or I should say the spring of 59, I had to go down there and categorize things. The reason for that was, in those days, in order for you to get paid, you had to carry a notebook, and each day you had to write down what you did. And you had to turn the notebook in before you got paid. Now, and back in the earlier days, the policemen were also the judges. They were the ranger. They took care of things. They took care of the wildlife. So each day they would write down what they did, almost per hour. And each one had a different pay scale. So they got different pay for what they did. Uh, I was down there one day with district ranger, and he was unloading a box of stuff that was dated 1909 or something like that. And we would we were going through it and leafing through it. Some stuff was just nothing. Well, the the policeman or the mounty or the ranger, whatever they were going to call themselves in those days, had to keep pad of pencil. And if you know where San Gabriel Canyon is, you know that there was a lot of gold that was discovered up in San Gabriel, East Fork of San Gabriel, you know, going up towards Mount Baldwin in that area. There's still those gold mines up there today, and they still pan for gold up there. Well, there was a, a camp up there, a miner's camp, and believe it or not, it was called Silverado. And there was no silver up there, it was all gold, and they called it Silverado. And the ranger, right down here, got into camp one day, and the camp boss, Basically, it was like a mayor told the ranger that they had a guy locked up in what they called a jail. Actually, it was a tree, and he was locked around it. And they called him One-Eyed Pete. Well, One-Eyed Pete had killed a miner, and they were holding him for the ranger to get there. And they actually held him for about a month before the ranger showed up. The ranger came up there, and on there, there says, looked at Pete. Or when I peek, talk to him, ask him if he killed him. He said yes. I shot him in the other eye. Now he was the executioner, and that was the way it was in those days. That was there was no sense of trying to draw it out. There was no lawyers. They just did it, and then they wrote it off. And I looked at that. And I said, shot him in the other eye. Oh, damn. <laughs> that was it. That was, so those records, from what I know, went to Sacramento. Then they went to San Francisco, and I had no idea where they went. There was thousands of these little booklets. So I know there's a few crews that were established before Al Caruso, like Dalton and uh, uh, Ed Del Rosa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I got me a new hearing aid, and all I can do is hear. I can't understand. <laughs> so from the stories, I understand like Del Rosa and Dalton were established before Al Caruso. And then I know Rich and Ed were saying about uh, Al Caruso was the first shot crew to get an out of out of fort, I mean out of state assignment. Is that where the first interregional hot shot comes from, or? Well, in the '38, <coughs> when the logging industry was going great guns in the Northwest and all around this here, um, they were well aware of how they had to be for preventing fire. If a fire got started. They had to hit it right now and then and there. They couldn't wait. So they took the youngest, dumbest, strongest guys on the, on the different logging crews and made them farmen. Now, no, don't <laughs> you wrong. This is what they did. And those guys, as soon as a fire was reported, they would quit logging, run back to camp, get whatever tools they were trained on, and head for the fire. Um, it actually was in 37 when this, this came up. Uh, when they, uh, 
guys were not logging, they were fighting fires. It's some term, some buddy, I don't know, they never did identify, came up with a hot shots. So you think you're hot shots, huh? That's basically how it started. And they liked that idea. And in 1938, the smoke jumpers up out of Redding made the first jump on a fire. And they were pretty gutsy to be able to use a parachute in those days to jump out of an airplane. And it turned out uh, they were very successful. And so the smoke jumpers were basically the first fire crews in on fires that they couldn't drive to, and which was a hell of a lot big area. Uh, and when World War II started, the Army came to the Forest Service and asked if they could train people to be uh, jump out of airplanes. And sure, we had old Ford tri-motors at Redding, and so they started training the first parachuters for the Army had. And then they opened up, the Army opened up a school down from Redding where they trained more and more and more and more, using the Forest Service airplanes to jump out of. But by the time World War II started, at the end of 41, they had DC-3s, uh, the old commandos, which as you might see some pictures of here today, that the airborne used to jump out of planes with. But it was the Forest Service that taught them how. And the idea for hot shots re-emerged right after the Second World War. As they began to see the fire danger that was going, people you know, were losing homes and losing in the forest, not on the flatlands in the forest. So they came up with timber crews. Basically in the winter time, they would cut timber, stack it, and burn it in the slush. Summertime, they would go like to camp only and be firefighters. And the, pretty soon the term showed up again being hotshot. Uh, Haven hotshots, Del Rosa hotshots, Los Prietas hotshots. Uh, they all came out of the mid 40s. Uh, when they finally got a the better equipment, better, they were getting radios from the Second World War. <laughs> they were heavier than hell and the battery only lasted a couple of hours, but it became modernized. And they started organizing crews. In 1958, El Carrizo arrived on the scene. Danny Street was the superintendent. Uh, they were up at Camp Only, they weren't here. But they would come down off Camp Boldy and come up over El Carrizo. Now El Carrizo and Camp Boldy were all CCC buildings back in the Civilian Conservation Corps of the 30s when they built all these things. The Forest Service took them over and used them. And Danny Street was superintendent then in, in 59. The Decker Fire <coughs> down here. I don't know if you guys know too much about the Decker Fire. Lost a couple of El Carrizo hotshot guys there. 1960, Lynn Bittison, who was the fire management officer at that time in the district, wanted Doug Campbell to come down to and start the crew, start up the crew, in rates the crew. Well, Doug was committed to something else, and they couldn't release him, and they basically just kept it up with Danny Street. And in 61, everybody, everything changed. They came up with two 20-man crews a cook and assistant cook, and a superintendent. So I wound up with 43 people at that camp up there with a one holer for toiletry. It was a sit-down potty chamber <laughs> and four showers, and they had 43 people up there. And I, when I arrived up there at 61. Now they, Doug had no idea what he needed, how he was gonna start it. He'd never been on a hot shot. Uh, he and I sat over Silverado Canyon in the, in the spring of 61. I didn't know who the hell he was, but he was asking me, because I did have a little bit of hot shot experience, how you tool, what you use, all this. I said, so we had sat there for about a week talking at night to one another. And he drew up the plan of what he wanted, and Forrest got it for him. 
that's where El Cuiso started in 1961. I got some pictures of what we look like. <laughs> uh, well, I got, it was, uh, somebody's got a DVD around here of, of what happened 61, 62 that Doug Campbell took. No hard hats, no gloves, rolled up sleeves, <coughs> no, no mix. Uh, we did have white boots though. Everybody forked out a hundred bucks to get white <coughs> boots after the second paycheck. Because that the first paycheck they didn't have enough money to do anything with. And that, those things cost a hundred bucks in those days. And pretty soon we became outfitted. Doug realized then pretty quick that the forests were not equipped to handle us. They didn't have the resources to take care of us because they, they had never seen a 40-man hotshot crew. Uh, Doug figured out that we had to take care of ourselves. So he, I don't know where he got the money from, but he got money from somebody in the forest. And they bought a whole bunch of dry light foods, dehydrated foods. And we carried about 55 pounds of dry light food with us, whenever we were went. So we'd sit down and take a break, we'd start a little fire, get out our camping gear and cook up our food. For two years we did that, 61 and 62. Late in 62 they began to realize that, because uh, they would spike us out somewhere and forget us. I got a story about that. It, Someday I might tell you about it being forgotten up on the Salmon River in Idaho. But they would take care of us by helicopter when they could. They would drop food in by parachute or actually with a helipad down there. They'd come in and land with a helipad. Often or not, they'd just push it out of the plane with parachute and let it go wherever it landed and made it go chase it down. Um, we were in competition with Del Rosa, but Del Rosa wasn't in any competition with us. They couldn't... I shouldn't say it. <laughs> oh, come on. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's all about being taped. Okay, well, I'm old enough. Who cares? <laughs> Del Rosa couldn't hold a candle to us. We outcut them. We out ate them. We out drove them. We did everything better than they could do. And it really pissed them off. We used to race down to Ontario Airport down here because they only had one plane that day. First one down there got the plane. Well, Del Rose is closer than us, but how come we got to go down this hill and get over to Ontario before they did? We drove like crazy people <laughs> to get over there. But we got over there, and they only beat us, I think, once. And that's because we had to wait for somebody. Uh, we'd fly out. Del Rose, I'm not, I'm not saying that they were any good. They were good, they, but they weren't as good as we were. Um, we practiced, 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 practiced. We had a little place out here called Sitting Peak Fuel Break. I don't know if it, I don't even know if it's still there or not. But that's where we practice because we go out there and cut brush, cut brush, cut brush, hour after hour after hour after hour. Take 15 minutes to break, eat lunch, then back to work here. Amen. We didn't have to get back into the station until 5 o'clock because then we went on what was called differential pay and for five hours. We got paid 25% of our base pay for an hour. And um, which, if you really want to know, it really cost us a lot of money to fight fire in those days. <laughs> As most of the time we fought fire at night. We'd arrive at a fire in the evening time. It had already been up eight hours. And so we'd have to spend five hours on 25%, and the only time we got overtime was 10 and 11. At 12 o'clock, the 15-hour period started all over again. So we didn't make much overtime in those days. And I, whatever overtime we made, it was, we liked it, but it wasn't enough. Uh, there, was, there was another hotshot crew up in Reading that was started. And uh, between Del Rosa and El Cariso, they couldn't touch either of us. Uh, they, I, I won't say why, how, or whatever, but they just couldn't touch either of us. We'd show up on fires together. Uh, in those days, first crew on the fire would just start cutting, and then another crew come in, and they would bump around that crew, walk by them, and go up on the brush and start cutting. And then the same thing would happen. Well, we took the two crews for crew one, crew two, and we would do the same thing with crew one, crew two. We'd jump around one another. So we would put in 
time, ten times as much line as the crews that were all standing in one spot doing this. And they'd bump it ahead about 100 feet and start cutting it. Bump, as soon as they caught up, they take a break, they go around and do the same thing. So we had, we had a pretty good plan of attack. Uh, I remember one fire up on the, uh, where were we? On the Shasta Trinity, I guess it was. Uh, it's above the lake. We had a lightning fire that took off. This was in 62, I think it was. And all of us showed up on the fire, all 40. Three of us showed up on the fire. The cooks would go to fire camp and they basically cook for the fire crews. We showed up on that fire, got off the truck, we started started cutting, cutting into the brush and cut into the timber and kind of going on and on and on. About uh, eight o'clock the next morning, some guy come huffing and puffing up there and he was beat. You could tell him that he had been hiking long and hard to catch up with us. And we had turned the corner on the fire, we were starting down. And they couldn't believe how far and how much we had cut because it Back in those days, if you cut ten chains an hour, you were hauling ass. Uh, we were doing, I think we probably wound up with doing a mile and three quarters before they caught up with us. They just couldn't believe we were up there. So they, and they didn't even have a crew coming up, up for us. He was going to come up there and tell us to sit while the crew gets up there. So we sat all day, and late in the night comes the crew. And we didn't cut any more line, we just stayed there. We were kicking back and relaxing, picking pine cones and taking the nuts out of them and chasing the squirrels around. And like I said, we had turned the corner, put the fire out, or anything going on. Nobody was coming up this way that we knew of. And then they finally came up there and released us and back down we went fire camp. Um, I occasionally, when I wind up up north on fires, would be reminded of that because they talked about that for some time, how the crew developed. And basically that is how El Cruiser got its reputation. Because you guys don't really don't know it, but there's a hell of a reputation that goes on with that ruptured duck. Uh, people are jealous of it. People say, oh shit, here comes El Cruiser. Because you know, they could be battling a fire and not getting anywhere, and we'd just jump in there and haul ass, put the fire out as we went. And we had hot spotting crews, teams that were out in front of our cutters, they were putting the fire out. It would rotate them, rotate them. So it was always every, every 10 minutes there was a fresh crew up in front putting the fire out. None of the other crews had that. They'd just cut, bump up against the fire, and pull back. So to say that you got a reputation to uphold is sort of an understatement. I think most of you, some of you guys have been here a year or two, I don't know how many old timers are here, but I imagine quite a few. Uh, fire camp usually is different when El Cuiso shows up. The crews that are in there, they have no clue that El Cuiso, like a, especially when we came in wearing these hats. But, uh, Nowadays, I don't know what fire camp is like because I'm sure it's not like what we had. And, and, uh, you got modern things, you got modern showers, you got things like that. Oh, speaking of showers, uh, I was on a, I was going to school in El Carrizo, or up at Humboldt, and I was working out of the supervisor's office as a dispatcher on weekends, making money, doing my homework and all the rest of that. Well, I was a division boss in those days, and there was only one division boss on the force, and that was me. Because they didn't have very many fires up there. They had crew bosses like, like that. But, so whenever North Zone would call over asking for a division team or a sector boss, I'm like, I would dispatch myself to the fire in the summertime. So I got dispatched to the fire down here on the Sierra. Uh, it was burning on Highway 50, I think. Oh, I don't think it was here. It was just North Siski or something like that. But anyway, they brought in a fire camp set up, pretty good fire camp, and they had this, some guy brought in a um, portable shower system and had a tarp all the way around it and portable showers and wooden things to stand on the sort of on the side of the hill. And they also brought in an all-girl 
uh, overhead group for the finance, payroll, and all the rest of that stuff. There were probably about seven of them. And this was about the third day, third evening of the fire. And it was a hot fire. All the guys would go in and shower, and uh, they were coming in all hours, shower, shower, shower. Finally, these girls got ticked off at this, and they took their clothes off, wrapped a towel around, so they walked right into the front. The guys were flying over the top. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't care. They were stinking. You know, they'd take the clothes out of the shower and like that. Well, that was our first experience with women on a fire camp in, in that capacity, because usually they had some place for, them, for the women to go down the district somewhere to shower up. Like that. That's way back in the back country. I could stand here and tell you stories about what went on all day you long. Know, I'm sure they're interesting, but that's not really what you want to hear. I had a question. I did some research, and I, uh, maybe you, you know a little bit more uh, working back then. Uh, do you remember anything about Cleveland Hot Shots? And I was, I was reading up on it. It was uh, Cleveland Hot Shots before there was El Carrizo and, and uh, Laguna. And I guess they stopped them. And uh, did they split between the two crews, or how yeah. did that go about? And I think it was in the forties, right? Pardon? I believe it was in the forties. Yeah. yeah. They used what they call brush crews too. They go out and brush along the roads and those things. They had those uh, crews like that up until the seventies. They had brush crews. They hired them. In fact, uh, Dalton hired up on uh, Fulton. Hot shots was a brush crew until Sandborg. He decided he didn't want to be a brush crew anymore. They were not, take the crew, got, they got dispatched to a fire. They were not a, a hot shot crew. They were just 14 guys that worked on this, um, on the forest, and they were what they called a brush crew. Brush roads and burned piles. Uh, Sandberg took the crew to this one fire, which was up north. They were really hard up for anybody. They were going to use them in the reserve. They put them in an area that had burned out, and they were going to cut behind I knew Sandberg quite well. Uh, the fire cooked up again. The wind shifted, they cooked up again. Fourteen hours later, the Fulton crew had cut the area around most of the fire and were walking back out. And the forest supervisor, I forget his name right now, but he happened to be on the fire just off the road when Fulton came marching down there, and he asked him, what hotshot crew were you? And he said, we're not a hotshot crew, we're a brush crew. He said, like hell you are. And that next day, they became Fulton hotshots. And this was in 68, 69, something like that. And so they have a pretty good tradition. The Sandborg built up a pretty good tradition with them. And they were good. Because all they did was cut brush all day long. <laughs> so you get good when you cut brush all day long. When was the first time you saw an all-girl hotshot crew? Have you ever seen one? Well, they they did exist. I don't know where they are now. On that same fire, out of Oregon, was an all-girl hotshot crew. There was 18 of them, and the superintendent was a woman. And I found out later that they were loggers. They, they logged for a living. That was a company that hired nothing but women. And they were up there logging because they said women have a better attitude <laughs> than men do when they're cutting timber and logging. Uh, I didn't know that I was being assigned to the, dis to the, to the, to the district that I had, the, the, the division that had the crew on there. So when I showed up, and I kind of took back the first time I saw it. And they were not exactly your five foot four, 110 pound woman. They were more like six feet tall, 185 pound shoulders that one. But they could cut line. And I watched them for about 15 minutes and just shook my head and walked away. I didn't know that's me being there. They know what they're doing. And they were on that fire for six days, I believe. The fire, finally put the fire out. But that's my experience. I never saw them again. But then I didn't show up on those fires after that. I wound up going to Sequoia.
Any further Any questions? questions? Any more questions? Do you not get to sit down? Yeah. <laughs> you have a My turn. Yeah. Turn over Richard Lee. Let me, uh, Okay. My name is Rich Lee. Um, it's really a pleasure to come down and talk to you guys. Uh, we talked to a lot of groups uh, in the last probably eight years, somewhere around there. Uh, we talked to fire wardens and uh, their organization. We talked to Laguna, uh, Palomar. Uh, we've been up in the Angeles talking to the other hotshot crews. It's, it's a pleasure for us to, to tell you and uh, at least my experience on, on the loop fire. Um, talk to you about the account, what really happened on it, uh, what I observed, and uh, what actions that I took on, on the fire. As we go through the, my presentation, if you guys got any questions, just, be, just ask me. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the guy sitting next to you saying, oh, that's a dumbass question. <laughs> so, don't worry about it. There's no dumb questions. Now, I might give you a dumb answer, but there's no dumb questions. Um, my account of the loop fire is somewhat detailed and technical in, in a few places. A lot of it might be a little bit boring, but it's rehabbing uh, some of the information that you learn early on in your careers. Um, but I, I, I have a cause of this fire, with why it blew up, more than what the, invest, the, the official investigation report showed. Um, that in, uh, the initial investigation report, there's a lot of errors, I should say, in it. Not correct. Um, but before I get into my account, I, wanna, I want you to understand that what I'm telling you today is not in any official investigation, okay? So I don't want you to think I just pull all this stuff out of my ass. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background on my, my qualifications in the fire department. Uh, I grew up in a fireman's house. My dad was a captain at Camp Pendleton. He put in a 30-year career. And um, so I knew early on that I wanted to, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, somewhere along the line, you guys decide, hey, I, I think I want to be a firefighter. Uh, you know, whatever that light bulb come up in your head, that's how you got here. Um, I graduated high school in 1964, and that summer my dad took me out to Camp Pendleton when they had fire school. And that's where they just went out and lit fires and put them out. And I thought that was cool, and I, that was thrilling to me. I was ready. I knew what I wanted to do, and that just made me believe that's, my, that's what I want to do. So I went over to, the, to some, looked like pretty officials over there, and I said, okay, where do I sign up? Not knowing what to do or anything. And they started asking me some questions, and finally they asked me, well, how old are you? And I said, 17. He says, well, I'm sorry. you got to be 18 to join. And that frankly pissed me off, because I was, I was ready to go. Uh, I was convinced that the adrenaline was flowing out there, and, I, and that, that's what I wanted to do. But instead, I went and started college, which is boring. Didn't like it at all. When I turned 18 in February the following year, I sent in my application up to Santa Ana. That's where the, the, the head office was at the time for the Cleveland. And I don't know what, a couple of weeks later, I got back a, a letter from uh, the Forest Service. And they said, you have just been hired to, to go up with the El Carrizo Hotshots. Didn't know who, who they were, didn't know anything about them. But I didn't care. I was going to be, I was, uh, my goal of a career as a firefighter, that was going to start. I was happy as heck. Um, my first year was 1965. And the first day I met Gordon over here, he kind of explained what the situation was, what the ground rules, a little bit of what the ground rules were, and what you, he expected of me. I said, fine. Well, immediately we went out and did calisthenics. 
and then we went up this this hill. We're going to show you here a little in a little bit. Uh, every morning we went up this hill. We went out and cut brush the first day, and come five o'clock I was ready to to go to bed. Next morning I woke up and I was sore. Yeah, uh, that was my my first day on the job. And I said, God, what the hell did I just do here? But anyway, uh, as time went on, uh, things got better. Uh, got used to the work schedule, all that kind of stuff. That first year, uh, I just knuckled down, kept my mouth shut, and did my job. And I observed what really was going on. Uh, and I think that really helped me out. Um, we went to several fires. I think we went to uh, probably close to 15 fires that year. Learned a lot. Uh, learned a lot about behavior of fire. Uh, so, and, and exactly saw how, how this group was, was, was working together. Um, at the end of the season, we were, we were seasonal. Uh, come in November, sometime around there, when the forest received two inches of rain, we were, we were let loose. So anyway, in 1966, I came back. And I, I couldn't wait to come back. Um, came up the first day, talked to Gordon, he, and he pointed me as a crew boss. OK, that's great. Um, and I was a crew boss on crew two. Um, And then, of course, in, in the middle of the season, um, we had people that, that go back to school and everything at that time. And the foreman up there, or the captains, which you call them now, had gone back to school. And Gordon appointed me as the captain of the crew, too. It was great. I loved that. I got a, a different side of the organization at that point. And I, I just continued to learn about the organization. But then, unfortunately, the last fire of the season was the Loop Fire. Uh, we lost 12 guys, lost uh, 10 guys on the mountain itself, and then two later died in the hospital. And that ended my career as a firefighter. And that was, uh, that was hard for me to take. I knew I couldn't do that job anymore. But I was blessed to survive. Um, I did suffer third degree burns, uh, a lot of it to my hands, as you, as you can see. My arms, I had my sleeves rolled up, which was a mistake. Wasn't back then, but it, it is a mistake. And uh, I had some second degree burns to my legs. Uh, but after I recovered from my, all my burns, I spent a couple years in and out. I, I think I had probably over 30 surgeries. And it got to a point where I didn't see any improvement as far as looking better or whatever. Uh, and I said, enough is enough. But uh, I was fortunate to continue my career in the firefighting world. Um, I had a 30-year career with the, with the Vista Fire Department. Uh, I started out as a dispatcher. And along the line, I went back to school got an A in fire science, which wasn't a whole lot back then. But then a position opened up in the Prevention Bureau. And the chief at that time uh, actually created a job for me. Um, and I took it. And I ended up retiring as their senior investigator and senior, senior fire inspector. Um, during that time, I went to a lot of different schools. I went to the California State Fire Academy up in Silmar. And if you ever had a chance to go to that school, it's really nice. It's right on the Pacific Coast out of Monterey up there. Uh, really nice, nice place up there. Um, there became a California State Certified Inspector and Investigator. Now, the investigator taught me a lot. It helped me figure out what really happened on this fire. Um, along, I learned a lot about fire behavior and all the, the fires that I investigated during my, my career taught me a lot too. So that helped me 
figure out what happened on this loop fire. Why did it blow up? Um, that's just a real brief summary of, of what I did. Uh, Okay, the loop fire. Was, uh, as you can see the date on there, 1966. This year on November 1st is 50 years ago this, this loop fire occurred. Uh, we have, we're developing some plans right now, uh, which would probably be, uh, involve you guys also, uh, of having a, a memorial service up at the El Carrizo County Park. Uh, it's in the works right now. We don't know exactly how it's going to come about, but it will be on November 1st of this year. Uh, but you'll be notified of it in plenty of time. Uh, at least Charles says he, no matter what, he's going to be there. Brian. <laughs> anyway, uh, Loop Fire was on the Angus National Forest. It was in the hills behind Silmar, California. And, of course, we had the... the uh, 12 fatalities on there. Three major factors that influence the fire behavior. Um, topography, fuel, but the biggest factor is the weather. Okay. In 1966, the season, uh, the weather uh, was very similar to what you're experiencing now. We were in a drought situation back there also. Uh, not quite as long as what you're in now, but there was a drought and we had the same type of fires you're having today. Not to the, the size extent, but very similar. Uh, and as Gordon was saying, we were into, uh, had a Santa Ana condition on that fire. We actually had six um, Santa Ana wind events prior to the loop fire. And they occurred in... Uh, September and October, just prior to the fire. Okay, so we had, we had a lot of Santa Ana wind events, and you all know what they are. Uh, they push the fire, and you never know what's going to happen. And it's, just, it's difficult to fight. Um, and, and as you know, uh, they usually last about three days. And during, when they simmer down, I should say, on the third day. That's just an average. They last longer, and they, sometimes they last less than that. But they change uh, they add the, the dynamics of what's happening with the wind. Um, so you never know what's going to, when that is actually going to take place, whether the westerly winds come back or the, the Santa Ana's continue back harder than, you know, like they were. That's the period of time when they're the most dangerous to you guys. You know, because it happens sometimes quickly and suddenly. Uh, sometimes it's gradual, sometimes it's not. And uh, that's what we were facing that day. Um, temperature was about 95 degrees. I think it was a little bit hotter than that, to tell you the truth. But uh, we had gusts of winds in the morning, uh, 30 to 50 miles an hour. Uh, humidity 10% which is pretty low. Uh, I have read some reports lately in, in this drought situation you guys are in now uh, that the humidity dropped to 3%. I said, man, that's, that's getting damn low. I mean, you get a deer fart out in the brush, it's going to start a fire. Uh, so it's really low. Fuel moisture is 60%, which is low. Any, any less than that, uh, the brush is going to die. It, it needs more moisture um, than that. Can we shut this light off? This is uh, El Carrizo Camp down on the Ortega Highway. Uh, it was originally uh, constructed in 1961 with, uh, uh, with Doug Campbell. And uh, this is... Uh, this is where we live. It's not like today you guys get to go home at night, and I guess, from what I understand, uh, we stayed there all night. This, this was our home. Uh, we got two days off a week, maybe. Um, but uh, that was our home. 
this was our five-star hotel. Uh, as you can see, we did we did have air conditioning. You took these screens off. That was air conditioning. We did have a heater in there though, because uh, it got kind of cold up there at night. I'm sure it's the same type of weather what we have right here. Um, 1966 uh, was a busy fire season, I think. We had a total of about 17 fires. Um, we got about 8 to 10 days off the whole season. Um, a lot of those days off were canceled. We stayed there. Couldn't leave. Um, so on November 1st, we were all just hanging out there because we knew we were going to be going somewhere. We just didn't know quite where. And um, we finally got the call to respond, like Gordon said, it was about 10.30 or so. Um, so we loaded up, took off. Uh, after I had learned that we were going to go to the Angeles, I had some real concerns about that. Not just because it was sent in and the winds were blowing, it was hot and dry and all that stuff. But the Andrews is, is a nasty place. I mean, we've got some steep terrain over there, and it, it's, just, it's just dangerous. That's, that's my opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's some other places. Lost Padres is kind of bad, too. This was a picture taken early in the morning. This is the loop fire. Uh, and as you can see, we had the Santa Ana winds were, were blowing uh, in this direction. Still a lot of heat rise uh, for the columns uh, blowing. Um, there was a, this, the fire actually started uh, on top of what they called Contractor's Red Point. And at that time, uh, it was the site of a, a Nike missile site. And uh, a faulty transformer blew up and dropped the lines on the ground, start, actually started this fire. Um, there was some concerns that we heard, or at least I heard years later, that one of the, the nuke missiles was up out, off, out of the silo, and because there was no electricity, they couldn't get it back down. And I guess they were kind of concerned about it. I don't know why, but you know, <laughs> that would have been, an, if that thing would have exploded, uh, we wouldn't have to worry about the fire at all. Uh, it would have been a lot larger than what it is, let me tell you. But. Uh, that was a picture just taken early in the morning. This is the district ranger station uh, at Little Tahunga now. Now, when we were there, it was just a little old bitty uh, structure. It was a place for the district rangers. That was his home, I guess. But like Gordon said, we got there. Uh, we got there about uh, 1,400 hours. And like Gordon said, there's nobody there. So we just continue on up and... Uh, Followed it up to uh, a little to hung up to, to uh, contractor's point. This is the top of contractor's point up here, and somewhere in this general area, right over here a little bit, that's where we parked our trucks. And uh, there was a dozer line that was put in that followed this ridge down down here. Um, Gordon met with the uh, division boss and the line boss up there. He got his assignments. And basically what it was, we were to cold trail this fire all the way down uh, to the bottom. And let me, let me make sure. Okay, here's contractor's point right here. Uh, we were to go all the way out here and actually tie in with the county crew down in this river bottom. We can't really see it, but it's down at the bottom of this, of this uh, hill or mountain, I should say. Uh, Gordon was told that uh, Chileo, Daltons, and Del Rosa were on the scene. They'd already been cutting a line. And uh, we were to leapfrog Del Rosa. And um, we did a talk with Laguna Hotshots a couple years ago. And we were talking about this, that we were going to leapfrog uh, Del Rosa, and one of the captains down there says, well, you know, we heard some stories earlier, actually reading off their script, I guess, I don't know, that uh, 
Someone from El Carrizo said, talk, told Del Rosa when they were passing by, and says, uh, step aside, let the room in work. And I said, really? That sounds pretty cool, but I don't know if that's true or not. Anyway, that was kind of funny. Uh, but uh, like Gordon says, we were good, and we knew it. Uh, a lot of guys resented us from that. Uh, we ran into a situation a, uh, a couple years ago where someone put something on the internet that we, we were negligent and all kinds of crap. We, we were uh, arrogant and uh, well, we took care of him. We responded to his little, his little article. And, uh, but uh, we were good and we knew it. And we proved it. We didn't have to tell anybody about what we did. We just proved it. <clears throat> so we got our assignment uh, after in, uh, Gordon got us together, told us we're going to go down light. Like he said, we didn't take our, our shelter, uh, anything, just the water. That's all we had in our tools. Uh, we didn't have radios back then. Um, the only radios that were available were, had already been given out. Del Rosa had the last one. Uh, but most of the time, we didn't have radios on fires anyway. Now, the Dalton crew, they bought these little portable uh, walkie-talkies, I should say. That's what they used back then, but they didn't work that great. You had to be real close to, to operate and everything. So we didn't, we didn't have any capabilities like that. We couldn't communicate with anybody. Uh, back then, uh, one forest couldn't talk to the other forest. So today is a little bit different. I don't, you guys are on 800 megs now, I guess. I don't know. Uh, where you can talk to all kinds of people. Um, but uh, back then we didn't have any kind of re uh, commu radio communications at all. But, uh, so we got a, got a, Gordon gave us our assignment and at that time we were shorthanded. We had a lot of guys that were going back to school at the time and their positions weren't filled yet. Um, so uh, we ran with two 15-man, basically two 15-man crews back then. Uh, but since we were running short, we, were, we combined both crews together. Uh, I was assigned to the first half of the crew. I was the captain on, on crew two. Uh, John Moore, the other captain on crew, he was assigned to the rear of the crew. Um, when we got up to Contractor's Point, one of the first things that I noticed is that the wind had died down, which I was glad. But I knew it was going to come back, possibly. So I was in the back of my mind. Um, but I also knew that westerly wind was going to come back, too. And we were in that period where they, those two weather fronts were competing against one another. The next thing that I observed, uh, and it was a red flag to me, uh, that we were going to construct line downhill. And as you can see, uh, it's pretty steep here and all the way down, and especially gets steep on the other side of this point. Uh, slope's about 60%, so it's, it, it's pretty steep. <coughs> so when we were up at Contractors Point, I'm, I'm assessing our, our, what our job's going to be from what I was seeing at the, at the time. I knew we were going to construct a line downhill, which I told you was a red flag to me, okay. Uh, but I felt that the, the fire on the ridge line had gone out. Uh, in here, come up to this point right there. Uh, the wind had died down, and that we'd be cold trailing. We'd have one foot in the burn. That would be our safety zone. <coughs> uh, I, and I analyzed that and I, I agreed, okay, this would be a reasonable risk to take. Obviously, it didn't turn out to be that way, but at the time, that's, that's what I uh, had, uh, that's my assessment. This is an actual picture of the loop fire. This was taken by one of our squad bosses. Uh, I don't know exactly where this thing was taken now. I'm a little confused. I, we, Ed and I took a staff ride a couple years ago up there. We actually walked down 
uh, the line. And I had a picture of this, and I kind of spotted where I thought was uh, where it was taken at. And then last year, we went on another staff ride uh, with the uh, Bear Divide Hot Shots. They were redoing their, their ride. And I met uh, Chuck Hartley of the Daltons. And he kind of explained to me that, that he didn't know where that was taken at. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, I have no idea where this is taken out now. Uh, but that was an actual picture of the fire. You can tell what kind of lines we cut. Um, we have crews all the way back up here. Now, who these guys up here were, I have no idea. This is John Moore. He's the captain on crew one. This was our assignment. Uh, after we got down to that point, uh, we were to cut, uh, come down here, and come down this this area right here. And this is the cat line that they were, the LA County was putting in, and we were going to tie into that that crew right there. This is the river bottom that existed at the time. Here's here's the portion where Gordon <coughs> slid down on his ass down to the, the river, somewhere in this general area here. I don't know exactly where it was at, but it was just straight up and down. And uh, the, uh, this is a picture taken uh, mid-morning sometime when, when the uh, fire boss noticed that the winds had kind of died down. He ordered the air attack to come in. Uh, this is the chimney that we were in. This is the point where we actually went around the side, came down this way, and was supposed to tie into this crew that was down here. Uh, which one is that? Okay, that's just another picture of the drop. Here's that, this is about the area where, where Gordon slid down somewhere here. You see how steep that is. Uh, It was a. Uh, Gordon talked about coming to an area where he saw all these rocks coming down. And that was right about in this area, right in here. This is. Now, this picture is a little bit weird. I had to expand it on the computer to, to get it large enough on this deal. So it, it's not quite accurate. It's a lot steeper than that, and it's a lot closer together. But this is where we crossed over into the slide area. Uh, this is the chute itself. We come down here. Uh, it didn't quite look like this back in 66. This is a fairly recent picture. Uh, but this is where we went. Uh, we, we come off the point, went around here, and, uh, and then came down this area here. This is another picture of, of the chute that we were in. It gives a little bit better uh, showing of how, how deep this thing is. If you can see right here, there's some little white specks. Those are men right there. So it's a pretty good size shoot, what we were dealing with there. So we came along, uh, after the point up here, we, could, we actually come around the, the edge of it. Uh, actually come down here to this point. This is where we crossed right here. At this point here, uh, what I observed, there was no smoke. There was no fire below down here that I could see. There was a little bit of smoke over, and this is what they call Deep Canyon. Um, but where we were at, we couldn't hardly see. We couldn't see on this side. There was no smoke that I saw personally. Our main concern was the rocks falling down. That was our main concern at this point. It wasn't a fire. Um, so we came down here. Uh, we crossed over. Um, this chute itself is probably about uh, 2,200 feet in length. Uh, some, some places was 25 feet wide, and it actually widened as you get down to this point here. Uh, it, this shows there's some vegetation on this side. I don't really remember that. 
he might have been burned out or something. But he got down to this point right here. This is where the fire made a run up this this uh, this side of the, uh, the of the wall, and actually went across over here. So we followed this Foscheck line. That's what the, the the planes dropped over and led us into this chute. Somewhere in this area right here is where Gordon talked about where he started. He saw something down in here. Okay. Talked about the helicopter coming down here. Um, most of the crew was, was up here in this chute. He had to make a decision what he was going to do there. He was going to this area right here, this is the, the fire line right here. This, this had not been burned off in here. And it went down into this, this canyon, into this ravine. Really too dangerous to go down that way. <clears throat> so I uh, decision way, we we're going to make an indirect line, cut it down here, somehow tie in with this crew. I had no idea what we were looking at down here. There's no way that we were going to get across this, this ravine. And this ravine really played a big part in why what happened in this fire. Kind of keep that in mind a little bit. But this whole shoot, there was hardly any brush at all. I mean, it was bare. Most of it was shale rock that we were in. Uh, you get down here a little bit closer, there was some heavier stands of uh, chemise, uh, but very sparse, really. Wasn't uh, wasn't that much. We could see the, the dozer and the LA County crews working over in this area here at the time. Um, about 15, 50 hours we'd been on the line, I don't know, an hour and a half, I guess, somewhere around there. Uh, this is when all hell broke loose. And if you go back and, and look at other investigations on fires, you're going to find out that a lot of fatalities, accidents, injuries happen around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it's just what happens. Uh, late in the afternoon, shit happens. <clears throat> we get down there and we heard the the command reverse tool order. And that was for us just to get the hell out of there. Our safety zone was right here. Um, it was uphill, but most of us were in here, except for the few that were down, in, down a little bit further. Um, I took probably uh, 10 steps, going back uphill, sliding back half the time, because uh, it was just it was steep and all that shale just couldn't get any traction hardly. And I heard a really loud boom. To me it sounded like uh, a, a jet engine coming at me. That's how loud it was. And, I, and as I was going back up the hill and I turned over and looked to see what the hell that was. And all I could see at that point was a solid wall of orange flame. That's all I saw. I had to actually I had to look straight up to see the blue sky. And uh, then all of a sudden, a shock wave hit me. And it knocked me to the ground. Similar to what Gordon explained what happened to him down below. And I was up above him. But it knocked me down to the ground. And then all of a sudden, it started getting really hot. Uh, it just kept, to me, it just kept getting hotter and hotter. And the official investigation report concluded the temperature was reached 2,500 degrees. That's pretty damn hot. Um, Ed will tell you about his shovel, uh, his experience with it. It melted. Uh, there was reports that. Our hat, our uh, hard hats. Of course, they blew off when when all this stuff took place. And they found on on the ground. It looked like a helmet. They went to pick it up, and it just crumbled. And underneath there was a ball of aluminum. 
So, just stuff like that. Now, to me, I under kind of understand that because there's just enough moisture in that paint to not it actually destroy it. But it was hot enough to melt that aluminum underneath of it. So, it. Uh, I thought this heat would never end. I mean, it just to me it sounded like it, it, it lasted forever. Um, but the official investigation report said it only lasted less than a minute. And personally, I think it was 30 seconds. That's I think that's about what it was. But anyway, the, the official report says less than a minute, which is 30 seconds also. So what the hell? But it's it's important to note that. The heat only lasted that short period of time, okay? And we're going to get into why that only lasted that. But I remember thinking, I don't know how much more of this heat I could take. I mean, it was just getting hot. Uh, I remember thinking to myself, this is it. I'm going to die. I actually thought I was going to die right there. It just, it was hot. Then I suddenly, I remember, I, I'm not hearing anything. I mean, it's just like an, I'm in my own little world. It's just silent. You know, uh, I thought maybe I was already dead at that point. I know I was in shock, probably. Um, and then all of a sudden it got real cool. As fast as it got hot, it got cool. Okay? I finally realized, hey, I'm still alive, you know. Uh, but I couldn't figure out what the hell had just happened. I just had no idea. At this point, I want to kind of pause a little bit, and I want to go back just prior to we heard the reverse tool order and, and try to explain what, did, what had happened. According to the official fire investigation, uh, they report several contributing factors to which they called a flare-up. I really disagree with their terminology. This is no flare-up. It's a damn firestorm, as far as I'm concerned. But when this happened, they concluded uh, it was just a normal spread of the fire under normal, moderate Santa Ana conditions. Okay, I go, I can kind of go along with that. Uh, the localized convection currents uh, moving throughout. Uh, the helicopter may be dropping water on it. Up here in the deep canyon, this is where he was dropping, right in this area here. Um, then they talked about the contributing cause of explosiveness of, of this flare-up was the radiant heat from the, the spot fire that occurred right in this point right in here. Okay? Uh, I have a kind of a problem with that. Um, I don't think that is quite accurate. But one factor that they didn't put in the investigation report was a strong shift of wind that came out of the west. Okay? Not even a mention of that in the report. And of course at that time you just got to figure, okay, this was the end of the Santa Ana wind event and now we got a westerly wind coming in. I, did, I personally didn't feel it, that wind change. But John Moore, who's the other captain, he was up in this general area right in here. He was up there with, with uh, one of the squad bosses. He and also our assistant superintendent um, was there along with uh, a newly hired uh, hotshot. This was his first fire. Uh, his story that he told me is, is that when this fire blew up and came up that chimney, that that kid just froze. But uh, him and the squad boss grabbed him by the grenade straps and actually pulled him over a rock where they, they got out of the way of, the, of what come up, the fire coming up. They weren't hurt. Uh, assistant the superintendent was over this area. He suffered some minor injuries. Um, but uh, that was his first fire. That's got to be shocking. But. Uh, the, uh, one thing you need to know, all these, these factors that they point out, 
they all came at the same time. They all, all these events came at the same time, and that's what really contributed to this, this blow-up. The only question I have is, what the hell caused the shock wave? That was a, I, I couldn't figure that out. I didn't know what the hell that was. But now I'm going to take you back again to the, re, before the reverse tool order, and I'm going to tell you what I observed at that point. About 10, 15 seconds before this whole thing just blew up. Um, I was seeing something, heat waves, okay? They were all around me. Uh, visualize a mirage out in the distance. You see these little heat waves going on. Or if you're looking at uh, gasoline vapors come out of a can on a hot day, that's what, it, that's what I was seeing. But I knew it wasn't heat waves because there was no increase in heat, okay, that I was observing. Uh, I knew that they weren't a mirage because a mirage is usually way out in the distance. You can never reach it. Uh, but what I was seeing, these, these, heat, these waves were all around me. 360 degrees. As a matter of fact, I actually held up my hand at one point and I observed these waves in between me and my hand. Okay, that's how close these things were. It was like being in these waves. Okay? I didn't know what the hell they were. I'd never seen anything in my life like that. I mean, I could just touch them. Uh, there was no smoke, no smell to them. <coughs> None at all. Um, I didn't. I didn't know what, was, what what they were, but I knew something wasn't right. It just, I just had that feeling. Um, just, and that's when the, that fire just blew up. Some of the reasons uh, why I'm coming up with a theory of of what really happened on this fire is you have to go back to the real basic elements of what is a fire. And we're all taught the fire triangle, you know, the uh, fuel, heat, and oxygen. That's what makes a fire. But actually, there's a, there's a fourth element to this. Uh, it's called a uh, chemical chain reaction. That's what's really actually taking place. Uh, if you notice, if you watch a fire uh, in your fireplace or an outside barbecue or whatever you got, and if you look real close, there's, there's a really a small little space between that flame and, and the wood that's burning. And what it is, it, it's, it's, it's producing gases. And that's what's actually working, or burning in, 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 in reality. Uh, now there are three basic stages of fire. You got your incipient stage where everything's preheating. <clears throat> uh, the smoldering stage, uh, it's just smoldering and it's, it hasn't reached its, its ignition temperature yet. And uh, there's no flaming involved. And then you get into your flaming stage, which we all like to see out there because that's what this job is all about. This is what drives us. We like that adrenaline, at least I do. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but this is what the job's all about. All three of these stages generate gases. Okay? The only exception is the first two, the incipient and the smoldering stage. They produce gases, but they're, they never reach their ignition temperature to burn them off. Okay? So what you have you got all these gases being transported all over the place, and uh, along with the convection movements of everything else going on, so they're all over the place. This is what was happening, I believe, on, this, on the wood fire. And there was large quantities of these gases being produced, okay? So then you get back to what really happened, okay? The explosive uh, flare-up, which they they had, they had, was just all these factors that came together at the same time. The moderate spread during Santa Ana conditions, um, localized convection currents within the canyon, the helicopter coming in and making a drop. Now he added the instant wind from his rotors pushing uh, the gases down this canyon, 
Okay. We had the buildup of gases in this canyon. Okay. The radiant heat from this spot fire. Okay. All these things came together at one time. But the key factor is right here, this ravine right here. The westerly wind came back and it's, it was sudden. And it was pretty strong. Forced wind up this, this ravine. Now we had the other gases coming down here. This is where the flare up was of the spot fire. This is where it took off. And it went right up this chimney where we were at. Okay. All these things came together all at the same time. My opinion is in their report they said it was all these uh, um, the heat from the spot fire and, the, and this brush that was burning down there to create all this heat going up this this channel. There's no way in hell that a little bit of brush down here burning for less than a minute would create temperatures 2,500 degrees and go up this canyon that or that that shoot this way. It, it won't happen. It doesn't happen. No way. I'm convinced of it. The only reason that I can come up with, and I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm accurate, but I, you know, my theories are debatable too. It only lasted for, I, I think, 30 seconds. Because what really happened is when this thing took off, it exploded. Okay? Just touched off all these gases in, in, in the canyon down here and went right up there chute and that's what was burning up there. That's why. They, gases burning create high temperatures. But it only lasted less than a minute and that's, that's what my theory is on this fire, why it blew up. Um, I have sent this, my theory out to several different places. I've got different comments on it. Uh, it's actually, I got comments like, say, yeah, that's what we're seeing today, what's happening where we've got all these fires. All of a sudden, this, uh, this whole hillside just blows up, okay? They're not saying that's what it is, but in theory, for me, that's what's happening. And that's what happened on Lufar, and I'm convinced of it. Uh, it's something that happened. Uh, I've never seen anything like that before, of course. I haven't been out on fires since this one. Well, I have, but not in fighting it. But when this thing exploded, that's what caused the shock wave. Because explosions call, cause, <coughs> cause shock waves. The best way I could describe that in real general terms is that we've all had charcoal barbecues at one point in time, at least say most of us have. So you load your charcoals up in there in your, in your barbecue and the first thing you do, you pour lighter fluid on it or charcoal lighter fluid. And I know as firemen, you, you put it on there and all of a sudden it disappears. Oh shit, I'll put some more on, more is better, okay? So then all of a sudden the, the match comes out or the lighter, okay? And I know from experience and I know probably most firemen do it, I know you're standing too close. <laughs> and you put that match in there, and all of a sudden you hear, woof, and then you hear this, this movement of air, okay? That's exactly what happened on this fire. Uh, only it, it's, it's on a larger scale. The wolf sound was that loud boom I heard, okay? Then the air movement. That's the shock wave that hit me and knocked me to the ground. That's that's my theory. And I'm going to stick to it until someone proves me wrong. But that's exactly what happened on this fire. It wasn't just that brush burning down in this little canyon here and generated 2,500 degrees to come up this chute for 30 seconds or less than a minute. Okay, it just it don't happen. Okay, uh, that's my theory. Uh, 
getting back to when all hell broke loose and the area got cool around me. There was no doubt I was in shock. Okay. My eyes were blurry, uh, but I was starting to hear noises again. <clears throat> Didn't know what they were, but I was hearing something. I got my eyes cleared out, and the first thing I saw was guys on the ground next to me, and they were on fire. Okay. My first response, oh, shit, i got to take care of my crew. So what do I do? I, I try to put the fire out with my hands. No gloves on. Okay. Um, I I know I did that to the first guy, and it I, I, it goes over in my mind constantly that I put this fire out in on his clothing, but he didn't move. I didn't understand it at the time, but I, the longer I think about it, uh, he possibly passed away right there. Okay, that's the only conclusion I I come up with. Uh, and at that point, I was looking at my arms because I had my, my sleeves rolled up like Gordon did and everybody else on the crew because that's what we did back then. And I'm seeing all this skin hanging down from my arms. And I look at that and I said, gee, that that's, doesn't look good. And that's, that's how you think of stupid stuff like that when you're in shock. I had no idea what was happening to me. I looked at it, I thought it was my skin, I didn't really, really know. I, I didn't have an explanation. I didn't hurt. There was no pain. Okay. Um, so I went over and I started putting fire on other guys. And uh, that's all I could think of doing, you know, to help, help my guys. And then I started hearing noises, voices. And I, I think I heard this guy, a character over here. And I don't know what he was saying. I just, maybe he, he asked me, he, he heard me too. And he said, is that you, Rich? He asked me, yeah, come on up here with me, because I was up a little bit higher than what, what he was at. So we got together along with a couple other guys, and we sat down in the middle of this chute somewhere. And at the exact location, I have no idea where I was at at that point. Um, Part of my job was to kind of control the crew. I'm, I'm up and down. So I don't know exactly where I was at the time this thing blew up. But we got together, and first thing I tell Ed, I'm quitting this damn job. It's too dangerous. You know, that's a stupid thing to say, you know, but that's what I was thinking. And uh, he agreed. He said he was going to quit too. So. And he'll tell you we we're going to go and get a beer. And not just a beer, pitchers of beer. But he'll tell you all about that. Um, the next thing I remember was the sound of a helicopter. And these helicopters were actually coming in. Um, and they were probably somewhere in this point, right about in this area here. Uh, see, it's, this guy had to come in because he was worried about the the, the sidewalls of this, this chute hitting his rotor. And also, it's a wonder he didn't chop our heads off. Uh, we had the steep slope, 60% coming down. But what this copter pilot did, and his name was Troy Cook. I've never met this guy. I don't even know if he's still alive, to tell you the truth. But he was one heck of a good pilot. And what he did, he found a rock over here somewhere, and he put one of the copter's skid on that rock. And he balanced right there, and we loaded people on. I remember helping everybody on, in the helicopter, because he made several trips. And I believe I was the last one to take the ride on the helicopter to get off the mountain. Um, But when I got on that, that helicopter, and I like riding in helicopters, so I, that, it's great. I love airplanes, but copters are really neat. <clears throat> I got on there, and he banked off that hill, and it was, it was the best ride I had ever had in my life. Uh, it was cool. There was no noise that I heard. I didn't hear the rotor anything. I was like in space somewhere. 
and he just banked off that, that hill, came all the way down here to the bottom. And this was a staging area. Now, it was an actual fire camp, but it had all their equipment down there uh, staging. And he got me down there, uh, put me on the ground, I got out, and this L.A. County fireman came over and, and put me on a, a blanket or whatever he had. And he started putting water in my arms. And I cussed this guy up one side and down the other. I, I was making words up, I think. Uh, I wish I knew who this guy was because I'd like to apologize to him because, man, I really treated him bad. But what happened, he was putting water on my arms and my arms were still cooking inside, like a piece of meat on a grill. And it's just making little heat explosions, steam explosions. That's what's what happened. And it was hurting. That's the first time I had hurt. I didn't hurt up on the hill, but I sure hurt when he put that water on me. And just like Gordon said, you got to put something on before you put water. And that's, I agree with him. But <clears throat> that was the best ride I'd ever had in my life. I tell you, it was, it was great. Um, of course, then we were all transported to the hospital. And I'm not going to get into much detail about that. Uh, I'll leave that for Ed to tell some, some stories. Um, this is a picture of the, <clears throat> of the shoot that we were in right in here. I don't know who this was. It was some investigator taking a picture of this after the fire occurred. <clears throat> this is the ravine, and this is the the area of the Pacoima River, river bottom down here in the dam. Uh, west is out this way and, and it was, the wind was forcing the, uh, the wind up this, this uh, ravine. Plus we had the gases coming down from the deep canyon. And it went right up this chute. This is just a picture taken at the bottom. Uh, this is where the spot fire occurred down in here. And actually went up that way, but uh, 30 seconds, that's all it was, it's pretty. Bottom line, out of all tragedies, some good comes, okay? That's how life works in our world. A um, lot of lessons were, were learned on this fire. <clears throat> uh, we had the 10 standard firefighting orders back then, but now they come up with the 13 and then the 18 watch out conditions. And they all came out of this fire, plus some other ones that have occurred before us also. One important thing is they needed for specific directions on how to fight a downhill fire. That was one of the biggest things that came out of this thing. Is they had to make crystal clear if Firefighter training in a chimney or any other uh, hazardous area like this, a saddle in, in top of a mountain or whatever, is hazardous even if devoid of fuel. There was no fuel in this in this chute right that we were in, okay, basically, none. Uh, the need for white uh, lightweight radios, which you guys have today. You got all the communications in the world today. It's unbelievable the technology that, that came out. Um, data for fire intelligence, uh, such as lookouts, uh, aerial observations, and all have capability of direct radio communications amongst themselves. Paramount. Um, you guys know who Paul Gleason is? Yeah. Few do. He was a, a guy that developed the LCES system, okay? He, uh, and that's lookouts, communication, escape routes, and safety zones, okay? He developed this. This was his passion. Uh, you can actually win an award through his organization for the work in, in, in this area. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Paul Gleason in the 1996 memorial that we had at LA County uh, Park. <clears throat> he, he gave a, a talk there about the, the, 
the lessons that we're learning this far. Very impressive speech. Um, and Paul Gleason was on the sloop fire. He was on the Dalton hotshots, and he was above us at the time. So it was very nice to meet this guy. Very intelligent. And he was a uh, sub now. One thing uh, about this, uh, they wanted to develop more lightweight fire shelters and all that kind of stuff. Back then, the fire shel shelters weren't like they are today. They were, they were actually a piece of crap back then, really. Uh, some worked, some didn't, uh, but they're still like that. <laughs> they're still de trying to develop stuff that, that will save lives and actually not deteriorate in a fire situation. <clears throat> but uh, even if we had these things, took them off our trucks and went down this, this chute, we would never have had time to deploy them. This happened so quick, there was no time for us. So it would have been nice to have them, but if you can't use them, if there's no time, it doesn't do you any good. <clears throat> El Carrizo has deployed their shelters at one point in time. Uh, their first time was in uh, 1964, and it was on the Cozy Dale Fire on the Cajon Pass. And Gordon could probably tell you about that. I wasn't there, but... That was the first time the El Carrizo's uh, deployed their shelters. And out of all this, you know, it came up, there was a, a need to develop uh, fire protective clothing. Duh, you know, and make them mandatory use on the line. Okay. This was our fire retardant shirts that we had back then. Just orange shirts impregnated with chemicals to, to, uh, so they wouldn't burn. Well, of course they burn anyway. <clears throat> after, after a while, all the, the chemicals washed out as you, after you washed them. Running. So they were just actually these these khaki shirts were better, really in, in reality. And by the way, that's me. Every once in a while, I look out of this. I like to look at this picture. My, I go right to this area right here. I look at it when I had good hands. I don't know, I just bring back. After 50 years, I, I, this is all I know now. And so I, I have to go back and look at this. Is, this is me. This is what I looked like back then, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's, and that's John Moore. He was the other captain on the crew. He, he came from the Angeles Forest. He was a permanent employee. And, and Ed's going to talk about him, and uh, he's got some interesting comments to tell you about John Moore. Uh, he was uh, Ed's captain. Um, but today, you guys have the capa capability to learn about fire behavior, okay? The most important thing I tell you is to learn, understand, and remember fire behavior, okay? It's the key to your success. It's the key to your safety. The more you know about fire behavior, uh, you'll be capable to understand what's going to happen, predict what this fire is going to do. And uh, so you can, and all, we have variations of fire out there every day. All these variations, they are predictable, okay? But you really need to understand what fire behavior is. I just, I can't stress it enough. It's so important. Uh, so when you guys are out there and you're, you're on the line, uh, I know back then when we were doing it, we had guys on McLeod's, and all they do, they had their heads almost up their ass, scraping line, and hardly ever looking up. You can't do that. You've got to look up and see what the hell's going on around you, just for a second or two. You see what's happening. That way you can observe what the fire behavior is doing and help you, okay? you you, you got to be on the, the lookout all the time. And as far as lookouts, back then, the, the, the LCS, or LCES system really wouldn't work for us back then. Uh, we didn't have any radio communications. If you had your lookout somewhere, we, he's observing everything, What's he going to do? Did he yell at you, or you know, 
it's too far away, couldn't hear. So we didn't, we couldn't use this system. Today you can because of the communications. Um, the biggest thing we had going is that Gordon, he's out in front. He's looking. He's seeing what this fire is doing. Our assistant, he's kind of roaming around. Now in this case, he was up at the top of the hill. He's looking what's behind him. The captains are kind of roaming around. They're looking also as far as look at But we're close enough to where we see something and we can tell people about it. Uh, with, the, with the LCES system, you got to have communications, get that, that guy to look out somewhere where he can observe a lot of stuff going on. Uh, and that was the only thing going that we just couldn't have the opportunity to do. But today you guys have the opportunity to learn as much about fire behavior that you can. Um, all the books have been written. There's a lot of them out there now as far as what happened on these large fires where we had fatalities and describe what happened. Um, all the fire investigations have been conducted. Uh, the internet. And there's bulk of information on the internet. And they'll be a little careful on that though because there's a lot of crap out there too. But uh, most of us are pretty good as, when it comes to the fire stuff. Over the past several years, we've been seeing fires getting larger, lasting longer. We're hearing from you guys here who experienced firefighters for a long period of time that uh, they're seeing fire behavior they've never seen before. And uh, there's a lot of terms being described, extreme fire behavior, area ignition, uh, simultaneous ignition, all kinds of crap out there floating around. What we were seeing is we got fuels in large areas just all of a sudden igniting, okay? Whole hillsides going up all at once. What we are observing now is not the normal fire behavior that we've been taught in the past, okay? We got something new that's being developed. Uh, there's a lot of research going on right now, uh, and there's a lot of theories out there, but there's no real explanation. It's just theories that they're working on of what's happening. Uh, but right now as firefighters, uh, we must be aware of an error of the new fire behavior. But we also need to keep in mind the stuff we've been taught in the past about fire behavior. Um, it's just important to learn, to understand and remember the fire behavior in a fire. I can't stress it. I'll, see, I'll keep saying it. This is the key, guys. Um, but it's also imperative to understand what's really happening in fires today, even though we don't have exact criteria of what's really happening. But we've got to realize something out there is happening, okay? There's so many variables that we need to be aware of. Uh, you never stop learning about them. Every fire you go in, you're going to learn something about fire behavior. Um, I pray every day not another firefighter will lose his life. But I'll tell you, in reality, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Firefighter duties are inherently dangerous. We need to fight them aggressively, but we also need to be safe. Any questions? Got to be something. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the orange color comes from just like uh, dipping them in retardant? And well, the material's orange to begin with. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then they dip it in their solution or whatever it was back then in those days. But uh, that's all we had. Now you guys have all the Nomex and all that good stuff. You know, when I was in, in, in the fire department in Vista, uh, I had all the Nomex stuff that I had. It, God, it's great stuff. It's lightweight, and it works. But that's all we had. We all ran out of these things uh, during the course of the year. Uh, John Moore, which is this guy right here, uh, had put in orders down in Escondido. That's where our supply house was at. And uh, put in orders several times. Never got anything. And it turned out, I don't know, after the fire and everything, there was, 100, there was 144 fire shirts down in Escondido that never got to us. 
So, uh, they, they had their head up their ass down there, I guess. I don't know. But that's all we had. We had the green jeans like we were wearing today. And uh, that was it. Of course, we had our whites. Uh, I remember Gordon mentioned 100 bucks for a white. I remember paying 50 bucks. Now, maybe that was for one shoe. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, they, when I first started up there, of course, all I had was the, was the uh, combat boots. And I bought surplus. And uh, they lasted about two weeks. And they were history. So I finally got the whites, and uh, and uh, it was great. Anyway, what do you say, Gord? Lunchtime. Oh, okay, you betcha. I'm done. How old were you in that photo? Nineteen. Just a young stud. <laughs> <laughs> Just an old piece of crap. <laughs> you know, that was a long time ago, 50 years. Actually, it was 51 years when I first started with Del Caruso, but time flies, guys. It really flies. But I tell you, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. I saw a lot of country. It was, uh, it was great. I wouldn't trade it again. I'd do it all over again, even though I got burned. It was, it was, it was great. Any other questions? Cool. Have lunch. It's really good. I'm the... trying some non alcoholic killers there. Good afternoon, guys. I think most of you know me. My name's Ed Cosgrove. I'm part of the El Carrizo Hot Hotshots 1965 1966 crews, and I am a loop fire survivor. Um, I watched Gordon and, and Rich this morning, <clears throat> and I, there was a couple of things that, that I, I caught that. That were, there were some questions asked that weren't completely answered. I, I didn't think. Somebody asked, where did the duck come from? Right? And I didn't hear Gordon um, answer it completely. And if you guys in the back row particularly can't hear me, wave at me or something, okay? I'm wearing hearing aids, and, I, and I, can, I can blow you right off the wall, but I'm used to, I don't know, it makes you, you know, you start talking with your fingers in your ears, nobody can hear you, and that's kind of what's going on with the hearing aids. Somebody asked about where'd the duck come from. There was never a duck. It's a ruptured duck. Okay? The official name of that duck is the ruptured duck. All right? And it came from Doug, <coughs> our second superintendent, Campbell, Campbell. Doug Campbell. I always remember real tough name. Doug Campbell. He he was he he needed a a, um, a symbol or a caricature or something to kind of define the El Carrizo hotshots in the early years. He was, he was there in 61, 62. And so he gathered a bunch of cartoon characters. I don't think he ever asked for any copyrights or anything. But he gathered a lot of cartoon characters and his wife was a pretty good artist and he took them all home and she picked out that duck. Okay? Anybody know who, who that, what the caricature was or what the real name of that duck is? It's Daffy Duck. No, Donald Duck was white. Okay. That's I gotta start using that one in my intro. It's not Donald Duck, okay? All you white guys, it's not Donald Duck. But she drew this thing up and if you look at it closely, he's got a split in his neck as his hard hat's flying off, and she put the orange hard hat on him. He's got lightning bolt hitting him in the ass. He's got a broken uh, left wing. He's got a band-aid across his chest. He's got blisters on both feet, on his heels. I mean, it's just perfect. It just fit perfect. And I know back in the mid-'80s and, and into the 90s, uh, it was kind of like the Green Beret, and you would, you would, uh, you would win or you would, uh, um, you, would, you would get to wear the duck. They would give you the duck symbol or the duck decal or whatever. 
And that's, so that's where the duck came from, it was 1961, uh, 62 crew. And it was, Gord, it was uh, Doug Campbell. And Doug Campbell is still around. <laughs> you guys are probably amazed. What, we didn't really come out of the Civil War era. We were, you know, I was born in 44, right at the end, toward the end of World War II. But uh, Doug's probably five or ten years older than I am. And, and uh, uh, yeah, at least ten. Gordon's ten years older than I am, so he's 82. And um, I just lost my chain of thought. Uh, Doug invented or has done a lot of research, and he's, he's made a uh, computerized um, fire prediction um, program. You put in the temperature, you give them all the information. You put in temperature, how much wind is blowing, which direction is it blowing, what kind of brush have you got, what's the relative humidity, what's the, the uh, moisture in the brush or grass or whatever the fuel is. And, it, and it's pretty good, and, and the topography and all that stuff. And, it, and it, I, I heard him the first time talking about it when Rich and I and Jerry were up at um, the Foresters and Fire Wardens in 2011. It's a pretty, pretty interesting thing. You can look it up on the Internet and find it. The other thing I wanted to tell you guys first thing before I got into my story, since I saw you last, I think we talked about, the last time I was here, I think I talked to you about uh, George Lees and Julian Lees. It's the same guy, okay? And I'll show you a picture of, of George Lee's here in a little bit. He is the consummate to me hot shot, El Carrizo hot shot. Of course, there aren't any other hot shots. They're all imitations of the El Carrizo hot shots. This is the hot shot group. Anyway, um, when I first heard about him, I, my squad boss in 1965 was Pete Ockberger. And Pete Ockberger is one of the funniest men I've ever known. And he's kind of started, he, he's the one that's come up with the hot shot stance for one thing. And he kept asking me, whatever happened to George Lees? I heard it all the way through the last part of 65 and all of 66. Or, and I kept telling Pete that when um, George went back to school a week or two before I got here, I hired in around Labor Day of 65, and George was gone. He was gone back to school, to college. And when I came back in 66, George Lees didn't come back that year. So he was here in 62, or 63, 64. He was in 65, but it was after, it was before I got here. And then he was with us again in 66, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. So I kept telling Pete for a year and a half, I don't know George Lees. I've never met George Lees. I don't know who George Lees is. So stop asking me whatever happened to George Lees, Pete, please. <laughs> Pete kept on and on. Turns out that when we, we went to a fire up in Mendocino National Forest <coughs> later in the year, it was, uh, it was probably early October, late, no, it was probably mid-September. And uh, we come in from a, a shift one morning. We were almost always worked at night. Gordon tried to always get us out there at night. Why? It's a hell of a lot cooler at night than being out there in the middle of the daytime the sun beating down on you. It's bad enough carrying all the gear you got to carry plus fight fire plus the sun shining on you. It's 85, 90, 95, 100. Not unusual, especially in the San Bernardino and you're back in the back on the east part of San Bernardino National Forest or anywhere around Los Padres if you're on this side of the mountains it's bad. Anywhere in Angeles, everywhere it's hot in the summertime. So we try to work at night, you could more efficient. And uh, it was just easier to do, I thought. I always liked working at night anyway. So we come in one morning, and this guy comes flying out of the bushes and starts hugging Gordon. And I said, who the hell is this guy? And it turns out Pete's standing right next to me. Pete says, that is George Lees. <laughs> I said, well, geez, I'm sure glad to meet him, you know. <laughs> so then I got to know him a little better. He, he quit right on the spot. He was, he was with the Forest Service deal for the summer, and he was on a hell attack crew up in uh, northern Nevada. I forgot the, the exact uh, forest he was on, but he was in northern Nevada. And his hell attack crew was sent over to fight this fire in, in, in uh, Mendocino uh, National Forest, Iron Mountain Fires, when we were on. And he was there just one day, and the fire boss commandeered the helicopter so he could go up and check the lines and everything every day. So now George Lees hasn't got anything to do. So he's standing around doing nothing. And about two or three days, he runs up, he looks up, and he heard that we were there. So he started looking for uh, Gordon King and the Oak Riso hot Hotshot. So he saw us coming in. He knew what we'd look like. He knew the Green Berets, all that stuff. He goes back almost as far back as Gordon does. And 
he gets a hold of Gordon and he says, hey, please, let me take me, get me out of here. I got to do something. Give me a job. Gordon says, you're hired. So he goes over and he, he tells the guy that's in charge of the helicopter and all that stuff, not the pilot, but the, the other guy he was with, the other crewman he was with, tell him I just quit. I'm going back to El Carrizo. Ship all of my stuff to El Carrizo. Gave him the number out here on the Ortega Highway, the address. Send it all down there. I'm going home with these guys. So he worked three or four shifts with us and then he flew home with us. And he spent the, another two weeks here, I think, and then went back to, to school. He's got three or four doctorates or two or two doctorates and two or three masters. Very, very, very intelligent man. Well, he's been out here a number of times. He came out when we talked to the foresters and fire wardens. He was here. He lives, he's retired, and he lives, him and his wife live in New Mexico. And he drives from New Mexico out here to the Southern California area just to hear us speak sometimes or to have anything to do with the hot shots. He just rewrote, he had a report out on the Decker fire, which was right here on the Ortega, going down the windy hill, down the windy slope that you guys go up and down probably nearly every day. It was in 58, and we lost eight guys there. Two of them were El Carrizo hotshots. There were several from um, Cal Fire or CDF in those CDF. days. And there was a ranger, a district ranger, that came from Corona. He was killed in that fire. I can't remember the whole thing, but it was... It was awesome. It was really a good, a good report. Well, he just finished uh, the the final report. It was kind of preliminary. The first one I read, and it was awesome. It was just awesome. It was the best report I've ever read on any kind of fatalities on any fire anywhere. It just, it just made. I mean, he went into such great depth. That fire was over 50 years ago, and he went when he was calling people. He quoted uh, a guy that was swamping for the for the dozer operator. He I, I, you can't believe how many people he talks to about that thing. It's all in there, and it's on our website. So if you go to El Criso, just Google El Criso Hot Shots 1966, and you'll see Decker Fire. We sent it back there, Rich did, um, to David Wesley, who, who handles our website. And it's all there. It's 22 pages long, and it is awesome. I had to sit down with a pad and pencil and write the names down and then put behind it, you know, CDF foreman. A tanker foreman, you know, whatever, El Carrizo hot shots and that stuff. The hot shots got into it. What happened, I was talking to some of the guys out there just before lunch. Two guys were down at the beach with a bunch of other kids and partying, and there was an argument or a fight started, and so they threw the keg of beer that what was left of it in the back of this guy's car, and they come screaming back up the Ortega, and they got to the top of the hill and started down, and he lost control pretty close to the bottom. If you look at the maps, you'll, you'll be able to kind of figure it out. You'll, you'll know it better than I do, because I'm not as familiar with that road as I once was. But the guy lost control, went over the side. I think the driver was killed. Yeah, Rich said, yeah. The driver was killed instantly, and the passenger was hurt real bad. And the car started on fire right away, down in the middle of the brush. Sunday afternoon, and the, the kid that got out crawled up to the highway, flagged down a motorist who took him, took him or came to the El Carrizo tanker station, and they just responded to the fire. They called for ambulance. They called for backup, and it's all in there. It's a great report. It's really good. So you can check that out. But when I met him when, in 2011, I asked him, "What, what is this? Your name is Julian Lees. It's not George Lees. How can you change your name?" He said. He said when he was born, his uncle came to the hospital and said, that doesn't look like a Julian, that looks like a George. And so his whole family called him George Lees from then on. But when he came to the Forest Service, he kept George Lees. It was a nickname. But when he went to college and all that stuff, of course, he had to sign in as Julian Lees. So if you see anything by Julian Lees, you'll know, you'll know who it is. And I'll show you a good picture of Julian here in a minute. Um, the other thing was Gordon was talking about, and, and Rich mentioned it too, that we didn't take our fire shelters with us when we started down <coughs> into Canyon. The reason was we were told, and, and Gordon was told, that we were going to leapfrog Del Rosa and the other hotshot crews and go down into the canyon, tie through and tie in with the, with the um, dozer line that was working down below. It was a con crew, and Los Angeles con convicts were working with that dozer down there. We were going to tie into that, look, into that line they were going to have people move our trucks down to the bottom of the hill, jump on the truck, come home. We're done. We thought we'd be out of there by 4, four or 5 o'clock, and we would have been easily. 
we were uh, uh, Ray and the and the first three or four hooks were already within probably two or three chains of being at the bottom, maybe four chains, which would have been another half hour total. It was a little heavier down there. Okay, now I want to tell you the story. He talked about green berets, and I wanted to tell you my side of that story. And I'm kind of glad that Gordon Gordon left when he did, because I don't like to say it in front of him. But when we got our green berets, and I don't remember if I started this in 65 or whether it was 66, and it really doesn't matter. Because, and I don't know who started this, but nobody else is taking credit for it, so I'm doing it. I've been taking credit for the last 20 years. When, when we got our green berets, it was a big deal, and, and we were all proud and all that stuff. And I started saying, the only difference between Gordon King and Jesus Christ is one of them wears a green beret. And I'm not trying to be facetious or anti-God. I'm, I'm a practicing Catholic and try to be a, a good Catholic. And I really believe in Jesus Christ, believe me. But that's how we felt about Gordon. He was about that much taller than he is now. And I mean, he led us everywhere we went. I mean, he was the man. He was very quiet. We didn't see him the way you guys have seen him, kind of joking around and making jokes a little bit once in a while. But he was, he was pretty serious. When he said something, everybody listened. You heard every word he said when he was talking. So I like to throw that out there. The only difference between Jesus Christ and Gordon King is one of them has a green beret. I told that story to my little brother. He's about six years younger than I am. And Alan's a really good photographer, and he'd heard about Jesus Christ and green berets for 50 years. And so when we had the rededication in the park up there a couple years ago, he was there. I called him. I said, are you coming? He said, oh, God, yeah. Is, is Gordon going to be there? I said, yeah. He said, oh, God, I can't wait to meet God. <laughs> so... And I was laughing, and he was laughing. So after it was over, Rich and I got Gordon between us, and we were standing in front of or behind the memorial. Alan's over on that side, so when he took the picture, you can read everything in it. You know it's the exact copy of the one that's outside. And you could read everything that's on the memorial. So I'm standing there, and Alan's, you know, cranking the camera, trying to get it perfect, and he's a great photographer. And I said, come on, Alan, God can't wait all day. And all three of us just started cracking up, and it's the best picture you've ever seen. i got to remember to bring that with me. That's the one thing I forgot this time. Anyway, I've talked about my past in the, again, but I uh, got out of the Army in 1965, and I just took that summer off, didn't do much, laid around the beach. Held, the state of California was paying me $33 a week. Holy Christ, I almost got drunk every day on that much money. It was great, man. I thought, this is super. After about seven or eight weeks, I think I got a notice that you, you're going to be cut off here pretty quick. There will be no more $33 coming. I shit. I started talking to my dad. And he was a firefighter, and uh, he, was, uh, he was on the New York City Fire Department for a little while um, before World War II, and then he joined the Army about 1940, and, uh, and just he was in for the duration of the war. And when he got out, uh, he went back to the fire department in uh, New York for a while. And in 49, he decided to move my mother and I and my brother, my middle brother. Alan was born out here for a couple years later. But we all moved to San Diego area. And he did some other odd jobs for a while. And then he got on the, the uh, fire department at North Island. He was an engineer, uh, drove a MB-1, the big bulky looking thing. You always see them foaming in the runway on all the action movies and stuff where planes coming in to crash and they foam in the runway so that's going to soften it or something. But uh, yeah, he loved it. He was into that. So I talked to him about that and I thought that'd be pretty cool because we used to get to go over there as kids and watch them foam in and they'd, they'd have an old crash jet and they'd fill it full of jet fuel and set it on fire and he'd rush down the runway, red lights and siren. Guys would be up there with the turrets and they'd home as it down. I thought that'd, that'd be cool. Went over and talked to his boss, and he said, oh, you're 21 years old, and you have no firefighting experience. You need to get some experience somewhere. And there wasn't any fire academies or anything like that in, in those days, at least none I'd ever heard of. So my dad noticed an, uh, an ad in the paper that the U.S. Forest Service were looking for young men to be on a fire crew. And he showed it to me, and I thought, hey, that'd be, that might be pretty cool, you know. I actually fought, fought a fire in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, so I had a complete <laughs> resume ready for whoever was going to, in, in, you know, in, interview me and stuff. Here's my resume. They gave us, uh, they took us out on the West Range, we were in field artillery, 
because some one of the shells came in and has phosphorus in it and it got away from them and started a grass fire that burned about a thousand acres. Well, they got about 500 GIs out there and they gave us gunny sacks, okay, tow sacks. And then we dumped them in the water and ran out there and beat the fire out. And that's all, all I need to know about fighting fire. I know everything, you know. <laughs> so I went down to 12th. The, the U.S. Forest Service at that time had an office on 12th and Broadway. And I went upstairs and she gave me an application. I filled it all out. I think I was might, I might have been the first one to interview that, that day. And that's the day I met God. I just didn't know he was God yet. And uh, he hired me right on the spot. He says, I, I, can you start tomorrow morning? This was a Tuesday night. In fact, I think it was the day after uh, Labor Day that I think about it. I said, sure, I can go right now. He said, good, go get your stuff and get back down here. My car was broke down, <clears throat> so I needed a ride. And he said, I, I can give you a ride back up. and going back up to camp right now. I said, where are we going, up the mountains? He said, oh, yeah, going up by Lake Elsinore. I said, okay. I had no idea where Lake Elsinore was. I've lived my whole life in San Diego. I've never been up on the inner part of Orange County or anything, or Riverside County. So I went back down there and uh, threw my stuff in the back of his car. And I had my combat boots. I was talking about my whites. He said, those aren't going to work. And I said, well, I've been working for them for years. And he just laughed at me and walked away. And it, yeah, he was right. The second fire, they were done. So I bought whites. But coming up the mountain, we saw all these signs out there, Guthrie Canyon, Slater Canyon. There used to be signs in all those hairpin turns, and they were named for the eight guys. Those little shoots were named for the eight guys that were killed in, on the Decker fire, 1958. And... Uh, I kept looking at those signs and I said, what are all these signs about? You know, these little chutes and canyons. He said, oh, those are memorial markers for the, for the eight men that were killed here. Bad fire we had in 1958. Hmm. Right here, huh? Yeah. I'm thinking, we got to be getting close to the hotshot camp. Uh, and I thought about it and I thought, eh, I better ask. So I asked, are any of them El Carrizo hotshots? He said, yeah. No. Oh. Oh, um, I think I can get out at the next curve, you know. I said, how many? He said, two. And I said, oh, God, that's way too many, you know. And I just thought, oh, this is horrible, you know. I, I don't know what am I into. Turned out to be okay, you know, at that point. I, was, I thought about it a while, and I said, well, you know, we'll find out more about it. He told me where the barracks were, and we'll, we'll grab a bunk. I went back there, and there was an empty barracks. Or an empty bunk right there, pretty close to the cadre room. The cadre room was on the west end of the barracks. And it was, I was about three bunks down, and the fourth bunk, this guy was sitting on it, eating an apple or something. I got there right about chow time. I think Gordon got us back up there just in time to have dinner. And I saw all this food laid out, and I thought, oh man, this is great. I mean, what do we got to pay for? Oh no, this is all part of the job. This is all paid for. I thought, wow, this is great, man. I think they did charge us a dollar twenty-five a day or something. Three thirty a day for meals. Three dollars and thirty cents a day. Of course, we were making a buck ninety-nine, so that, that was tons of money. And I was going to make <laughs> eighty, ninety bucks a week. This was, you know, this great stuff. So Rich and I just instantly hit it off. We just become friends, right? You know, you just you run into those things every once in a while. And uh, the next morning, they, we went out for PT. <laughs> Holy crap. They did set-ups, chin-ups, pull-ups, jumping jacks. I hadn't done anything but drink beer for two months. You know. All of the heart of June, all of July, and all of August. And then, oh man, I'm out of shape. I was horrible. And they started running. I'll show you the pictures here in a little while. Started running, went out behind the camp. Gordon's leading the whole thing right in front of the pack. We gets out on the, on the North Main Divide up behind the campground up there. And he runs in a big circle, and I said, okay, man, we're going back down. I can do this. All right. <laughs> All of a sudden, he turns and goes up. Poop out, we called it. It's another big hill that goes up. It's just pretty high. And I thought, oh, my God. I looked up, and I thought, oh, my God. I made it, and we were okay. Then they took us to Sitting Peak, which, of course, is in our vernacular, was Shitting Peak. They'd been cutting a fire break there. It's, I think it's reportedly about eight miles long. I've never seen the southeastern corner of that thing, but we, we did finish. The 66 crew did finish that fire break, oddly enough. And it's 400 yards wide most of the way. 
and eight miles long, and it took eight years to break it, to cut it. It was pretty amazing. Nine years, actually, if you, if you count 58 as one, which you would. <coughs> so we went up to Sitton Peak, and they showed me how to hand off tools, got it, you know, and all that. I was amazed recently. I went to work with the uh, San Marcos Fire Department as a senior volunteer, senior uh, aide, whatever you want to call it, and then watch them out there doing stuff, taking stuff off the trucks, and they hand each other an axe. And one of them says, got it. I'm, I know that. I know all about this firefight and stuff. And uh, so then we got out there, and they were showing me all this stuff, showing me how to use it. First thing we got, automatic, you've become a McLeod. I don't care who you are, you're a McLeod the first week or two. And uh, so I was <clears throat> figuring out how to use this McLeod. They showed me a brush hook and a Pulaski and the shovels. And, okay, this is cool. And we did a little bit of work and we started chopping stuff and cutting stuff. And radio goes off, everybody back on the trucks. What's going on? We're going to the beach. I thought, oh, this is great. Hour and a half of working, and now we're going to the beach. <laughs> Wonder if they're going to have beer there. This is going to be great. Hot dog. This is a great job. A big giant breakfast, a big dinner last night, and now we're going to the beach. Whew, I'll never forget that day. Somehow, and Gordon still doesn't know how it happened, but there was a high tide come in, and some very expensive homes down along the beach, right on the beach in uh, San Juan Capistrano, almost straight out the end of the Ortega Highway, right down to the water's edge. And there was the, the, the uh, seawall had fallen, part of the seawall had fallen apart. And so they, how they got El Carrizo hot chest down there, we, none of us ever will know. But the first thing we spotted as we drove down the street, they had several porta potties on one side of the street. And then in the middle of the street, they had two, I guess they were probably 10 yard piles of sand, two of them and a stack of gunny sacks that would fill just half fill half this room. Guess who got to fill the gunny sacks and haul them out there? <laughs> we did, El Carrizo. So we spent about two, two and a half, three hours filling those gunny sacks and tying them off, stacking them, and then we set up a daisy chain down alongside the guy's wall and we just hand them one to another for like two hours. My arms were reaching my ankles with them. Time that two hours was up, and then we stood around for quite a while, and uh, to see that we were trying to look. They brought they brought uh, a, tuck, a, a couple of yards of concrete in on the big concrete thing, and they pumped that back there and sprayed it all over the top of the bags. And then we stayed there till about ten o'clock, and Gordon was standing out on the I still see him standing out on a, a piece of the wall that was about that wide. He was standing there, and, and the water was splashing up. And he was calling it up, you know, and it was splashing up. It looked just like, uh, what was that Disney movie? Fantasia. Yeah, Fantasia. <laughs> it looked just like Mickey Mouse and Fantasia. It was pretty cool. He was having a ball, and he didn't care. He was getting wet. We, we were just <clears throat> roaring on back to, the, back to the woods the next day. But that was good, 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 fun, good time, good fun. I enjoyed that season. But next season I went back. I wasn't coming back. I was working that, that winter, oddly enough, in a napalm bomb factory. <laughs> We're not putting them out. We're starting them. Down in El Cajon, uh, Vietnam was starting to heat up, and they were building 22-foot long napalm bombs that were, God, they must have been 22, 24 inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't fill any of them. We were just building the shells. And some of them were still at uh, Camp Pendleton until about maybe five, six, eight years ago, and they, and they found they were leaking not good. They've been filled and they've been sitting there rotting all these years. And they started leaking, of course that's environmental hazard, so they had to get them out of there. But, but then the, the, the guys, they were paying us like 250 or 225 an hour. And the union come along, machinist union come along and said, you guys should be getting paid more than that. And so they had a vote and we voted to union membership or union representation. And so there was a strike when the company wouldn't even talk to the any of the employees or the union. And so I'm out there walking a picket line, and about this time, it's funny, this year is the 50th anniversary of Loop, and I've spent nearly a lot of days this year thinking about what was I doing 50 years ago today. And just about this time, it was about the end of, end of May, we went on a strike. And after about two weeks, I realized that this ain't going to be over anytime soon, and if I want to continue to work here, I'm going to have to cross the picket line 
where am I going to find another job? Well, my uncle, uh, Bill Volz, was the business manager of the electrician's union, and I knew if I crossed that picket line, I would never work for him or any other union job. So I, I, I just wouldn't cross that picket line. About two, two or three days after the picket line started, I got a letter from the U.S. Forest Service, from the Santa Ana office. That's where it was back then, or Anaheim, Anaheim. And um, opened it up and they said, congratulations, we'd like for you to go to work at the El Carrizo tanker station. Hmm, I thought about it. I thought, boy, this could be great. Be right across from the hotshot camp, I can visit all my buddies that are coming back this year. I'll be doing nothing on, during the day, maybe out waxing the truck or washing the truck. I won't have to do anything. This would be great. Just, no, this just kick back job. You know, firemen don't do nothing. They sit around, read papers. They don't pay they do nothing. This is great. This is for me. And it was like 10 cents an hour more. And I thought, oh, man, this is great. So I took the job. And I went up there and I signed in. And the hot shots were out on the Wellman fire. First fire of the season. They came back. They were gone 12 days, I think, on that one, weren't you? Yeah. Came back, and it was cool. They all came on, went over and visited, and said hello to all the guys. And next morning or two, I was on, on shift over there across the street, and Gordon came in to get his mail. And he looks at me sitting there in a the chair, having some Cheerios or something for breakfast. He says, hi there, pumper pussy. <laughs> I looked around, you know, what? no, it was me. <laughs> oh, shit. I, I was one sick puppy right there. I, oh, my God, I can't put up with this. It went on for about three days, you know, and he had a different singer every day, but that's the one I remember the best. I thought, oh, my God. So he came in one morning and said, don't say anything. I want to come to work for you. How can I get back on the hot shots? Simple. Go across the street and get one of those guys that want to come over here and you guys just swap. Cool. That's it. That's it. Okay. So I went to barracks right after dinner that night. Hey, any of you guys want a real fun job across the street? You don't have to do nothing. Guy jumps up. He says, I'll do it. His name was Gary Hotelli. Now, how in the hell I can remember that name? I never met him other than five minutes. And I pay, okay, Gary, come on. Help, help, get your shit together. Let's go. I helped him carry all of his stuff across the street, and he helped me carry my stuff back, and I took his bed, and he took mine over on that side, and I was back on the hot shots. Little did I know what was coming down the, coming down the road. <coughs> but we fought fire all summer, and in August we caught, the, uh, we caught the Indian fire, which was up on the North Main Divide, and it was right behind our camp. We were the first responders. It's one of the few times I think the El Carrizo hot shots were first responders, other than an accidental fire that happened here very close by that I heard about a few years ago. We won't need to talk about that. Some of the um, <coughs> guilty are still around. Uh, but but uh, it was bad. It was a nasty one. And, and our, our crew boss, the crew I was on, the crew boss was supposed to be leading the pack, and he started shying away. And, and uh, Gordon saw it, and he said, I can't have a leader like that. He called me in the office later, and he said, hey, I want you to take over crew number one as crew boss. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, huh? He said, you got to do it. you just got to do it. And like I say, nobody ever told God no, so I said, okay. And I was a hook, so that helped. I just, I just hooked to that tool. It was, it was me. It just works. You're either a hook or you're not a hook. And most of us are tall, lanky, thin. I was perfectly built for a hook, and I used to be thin. You know, not quite muscular. Anyway, uh, season went on, and we got to the we got to the loop fire. My father died that that summer. That was the one low light, and I missed uh, a trip to Idaho. But when I came back, we made another trip to Idaho, and I got to go on that one, and that was awesome. We we they flew us up there. I had to lay the chain link our. Uh, Bob wire fences down in a cow pasture so we could land that C-47. It's also a DC-3. Commercially, it's a DC-3. Military, it's a C-47, same airplane. They landed that thing in there. <laughs> thing flies at about maybe 8,000 square feet, uh, 8,000 feet elevation. No pressurized cabin, no air conditioning. I think we had the back door open most of the time to let air in. Here's 30 of us in there. Half the guys are throwing up in their hard hats, and the rest of us are over there trying to stop from throwing up, smelling all the vomit. Oh, it was fun, you know. They laid, actually laid down the fence for us, and they landed that thing right there. Whew. 
in the cow pasture. We bailed out and then they had school buses and they took us up a windy, real wild, wild ride going up to, the, to where the fire was. And all of a sudden they pulled over and they stopped. And I was sitting up front, I remember that, and I said, why, why are we stopping here? He said, I don't see any fire anywhere. And the guy says, just a minute, just be like, just a minute. About that time, a truck, a, lo a logging truck came around the corner and had three logs on the back of that thing. Must have been four foot in diameter, each one of them, and about 40 feet long. She ain't doing about 60. I said, any more coming? He says, not yet. And then we went up a little while far and did it again. I thought, wow, this is scary. Then they, we got, by the time we got to where the fire was, it was uh, probably about seven, eight o'clock. It was dark. This was in the summer. It was in August. And so they had a guide there to lead us back in there. We tooled up. We took our stuff and went back up in there. We got to the fire about, about midnight, maybe 1230 in the morning. And um, it was a timber fire. And we hadn't fought any timber fires much anyway. But we knew what to do with it. So we, we cut, it was 73 acres or 74 acres. We cut a line all the way around that thing in about four hours. We covered the whole 73 acres. It was on the side of a hill. It was a lightning strike. The fire season was so bad that summer that, that we were only, what, 100 miles, 150 miles from the smoke jumpers in Montana. But they couldn't get over to it. They just had everybody out. Was, they've had so many lightning strikes and fires going on that they just had to have us. They flew us to Montero to go up there and take care of a 73 or 75 acre fire. We cut a line all the way around it and we laid on it for five days. Then they were bringing in breakfast and dinner on a, on a mule team that was probably 15 or 20 mules and each one of them carried a GI can. You guys probably never saw a GI can. It's about the size of this cooler. There's one on each side of the mules. And one of them would have all the steaks and whatever meat in one of them. And the other side will have all the potatoes and stuff and all the way back. Just keep, they just kept bringing food, man. It was great. And so we just camped out for five days. We was on the payroll. We was making money the whole time. We was having a ball. Some guys were down there trying to catch trout. Said they couldn't eat them because it was the wrong time of year or something. It was, it was awesome, man. We just had a great time. It was just like a big camp out. The only thing missing was cold beer. <laughs> But we were still having fun and we were getting paid. We woke up on Friday, I think it was a Friday, fourth or fifth day we woke up and there was about two inches of snow on top of our paper sleeping bags. We raised up and had to knock the, the snow off the sleeping bag and Gordon got up and says, okay boys, roll it up, we're out of here. They're not going to ever believe we're still here fighting fire after this snow hit the ground. So they flew us home and on the way home is when they diverted us and we went up to uh, Iron Mountain and we found George Lee's. Julian leaves. Uh, September hit and we lost <clears throat> um, probably six or eight off of each crew that was going back to school. Uh, my guys, uh, Jim Brown left, um, this was late, late October, Jim Brown left and, and went back to Washington DC. He had an interview with the CIA. Jim had been in uh, the Army for two or three years. And while there, he was in. He went to language school at uh, Monterey, California, at the Army Language School up there by San Francisco. And he could speak fluent and understand fluent Russian. So they were looking for somebody with that kind of uh, M.O. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, Jim never got the job with CIA. He came home, but he missed the uh, loop fire because of it. But he ended up being a sheriff, San Diego County Deputy Sheriff for 35 years. He's Retired, excuse me, retired now and living in um, Alpine. Uh, Pete Ockberger got drafted, my buddy, got drafted by um, the U.S. Army. Vietnam was rolling on pretty good by that late, late 66. And Pete had to report, he reported to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas the day of the, the day of the loop fire. He just missed it. And Pete wrote, or called my mother, my mother owned a bar in, uh, in El Cajon. Pete and I and Jim went in there uh, a couple times that summer. We used to get a couple free beers, you know. Mom never tells her oldest son no, you know. <laughs> and I brought the friends in and she served them no problem, you know. And so they got to know her a little bit. So Pete called my mother as soon as he heard about the fire the next day. It was on the news all across the country. And he was just devastated. And uh, he gave her his address 
where he was at at Fort Bliss, and she wrote him a nine or ten page letter. And when when I saw Pete with George George Lee's Julian Lee's in 2011, uh, Pete says I got a letter for you. He kept that letter, 41 years, or 45 years, and I've got the letter. It's in my mom's handwriting. She died in 1994, and she died. Get this, she died on the 38th anniversary of the fire. Is that scary? Just it's it's just weird stuff with this fire. Anyway, we rolled on the fire, as you've all heard. Uh, let's go to the mountains. We got to the top of the hill, just like Rich said. Which one do you want? Oh, yeah, let's, 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 let's talk about this guy. Where's, your, where's our pointer? This ugly sucker right here. You may see this video sometime. Go back one. Good. One. Back one. Okay. Can't see him there. I'll show you another picture of him in a minute. That's, uh, that's John Moore. He was my foreman. He came, uh, he came to El Carrizo just that one year. He was sent down there, down here to us, by the Ang off the Angeles. He later worked and uh, was one of the, one of the uh, founding fathers of the Little T Hot Shots. They were founded in 1970. Uh, John was a little skinny, squeaky son of a bitch is what he was. And we couldn't stand him. <laughs> and besides that, he was from the Angeles. And everybody knows, unless you're from El Carrizo, you don't know shit about fire. <laughs> and that's how we felt, and that's I still how I feel about a lot of them. But that was him. And he used the only thing he'd ever say to us is, assholes and elbows. That's all I want to see from you guys is assholes and elbows. Green in the green, burn in the burn. Assholes and elbows. And we had a reunion up here in 2011, and we, were, we, got, we met at the Outlook right here at the top of the hill. And I was getting out of the car, and, and David Wesley was with me. He flew out. He's our, he, he's the guy that did our website. He flew out here from, from Arkansas. It's the first time he'd been back here in, in 46 years, 47 years. And uh, he got out of the car, and he saw John standing there by the outhouse. Uh, I didn't recognize John. He did. And <laughs> he got out of the car and started hollering, Assholes and elbows! That's all I want from you, John! John turned around and looked at him. I said, what the hell? I've, we've become much better friends than we were during this fire book going on. Let's go to uh, something else. What do you got? Yeah, that's a good, that's, is that the it's, loop fire? That's not no, a loop No, it's fire. just another fire. Yeah. It's, uh, these bombers liked us. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, yeah. They, we were the ones that had the orange helmets, and it, of course we were always on hotline fire. Right. Right. And they saw us, and they started dropping. It was a target. It was a perfect target. And you can see is, all those. This is what we ended there up There he doing. is. That's George Julian Lees right there. That is the consummate hot shot. Four years on the Elk Reese hot shots. Look at that picture. There's his, his night light, okay, that we could strap to our helmets, if I remember right. There's the, the uh, suspenders that, that Gordon was talking about, the utility belt, and we had an empty canteen on this side that we'd keep extra cigarettes in or, or gum or whatever, you know, whatever you wanted to carry in that little, that little bag. And, of course, you can see it dripping off his hard hat up here. See it? They've just been hit. He has a shovel in his hand and by the handle. Good dude. Very, very good dude. Check out that, that uh, report he did. It's awesome. Just a great report. It's on our website. Anybody can read it. What do we got next? Well, you know what that is. It's right there in the corner. It'll be stolen one day. Yeah, and they'll just come, at, they'll come to both of our houses. One of us will have it. <laughs> or maybe I did have it, and he come and stole it from me. I'm not sure which. <laughs> that is the official El Carrizo Hot Shot stance. You'll notice the thumb is perfectly placed within the belt. <laughs> and you got a, a good I don't give a shit attitude. You know, I'm goddamn good at this. And that is good old me. How do you like them ears, man? That's before the loop fire took about half of them off. Yeah, they, I got my ears burned out. Same, same badge, see it? Same ones right here, 50 years later. That's the cadre room right there. Give me another one. Oh yeah, see, we got living proof right there every morning. There's our trucks, our bu that's our buggies. They didn't have air conditioning, but we had a lot of ventilation in the back. <laughs> You could fart all you wanted, nobody would care. Nobody could smell it. It went right on out. We did that every every morning for one hour, and then we ran up poop out. Okay. What do we do here? I don't know. You're running it. 
And I probably broke it. That can't be the end. How do you get this little thing off the screen now? But, uh, oh. There you go. Okay, perfect. Yeah. That's the barracks, and there's the trucks. That's that's the tool room right there. None of this is there anymore except for these old pine trees. They're still back there. Um, that's our two crew trucks right there. We, the part, the shot you just saw was a concrete slab that was right in front of the barracks. We parked our cars over here, which is kind of suspect because there's only one or two cars over there. But uh, we would we would do PT and all that stuff. And then we would take off and we'd run out through the campground and up to, the, this is the North Main Divide. And Gordon would run a big circle right here until he saw us all right there and then we'd go down here just a little bit and then run up this break, that fire break right there, all the way to the top. That's poop out right there. Fun times, Mom, had by all, every morning that we were, if we weren't on fire, even in the middle of the season, we did PT and, and then we'd go out to sit and peek and cut fire, cut, uh, Cut brush. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a good look into the back of it. We had tools on one side, personal items, backpacks, and all that stuff on the other side. Those doors on either side that flipped down, I believe. I think that's you. I think that's my truck. Yeah, it is. Yeah. His, his, and we had the stairs right here, and they folded up into the truck. Now, by seniority, if you'd ride the best seats in the house, were back here, the last two seats. This one particularly because you could catch women pulling up beside us on either side with short skirts. <clears throat> and I knew about that because I was usually the driver of this truck. And you got 15 guys running to one side of the truck, you're in big trouble, man. You better start turning left or turning right with the other direction or you're going to roll that truck over with all those guys in it. Yeah, that was good. There's the helicopter. You know, hold, go back one. I just never noticed that before. There's the helicopter. That's the helicopter, the helitack pad that I don't think it's up there anymore, is it? I'm it's right across there. by uh, the tanker station, Elk, above Elk, the tanker station. It's still Is it still? They still, they still got a helicopter? Okay, okay. that's it. Just the pad. Just I, the pad. It's, yeah, it's grown a lot more now than it did back then. We, when I was on the tanker station, we used to put hose, uh, 70 pound or 70 foot, or I don't remember, 70 pound hose packs on our back and walk up that walk up that uh, trail that was back there. Go ahead. I just no, I never noticed that. That's where we kept the the trucks during the winter time. This was where the showers and the laundry were. And uh, they're threading pipe but I don't got got no reason why. And that's my truck, the Ford. That's that's crew one. Okay. And that's Screw Two's truck. One's on the other side. No, that's one, and that's two. That's the Dodge. Well, there's the duck. See the duck on the backboard? It would be repainted every other year or so. Anyway, okay. Another shot of the trucks. We were very proud of our trucks. <laughs> you see the the shield with the with the ruptured duck in it on everything. That's Gordon's office. It was about eight foot by eight foot. Honest to God, he said, I talked to him just, just a few minutes ago when he was here, and there's the duck on, on his truck. Uh, he painted that duck on there. Um, he said at one time they had eight guys sleeping in that eight foot by eight foot office, and they had to move uh, one of them out onto the, out onto the porch, this little porch right here, uh, because they put a desk in there, so they couldn't, they were double bunks, they were uh, uh, bunk beds in there. That was probably 60 or 61, I don't remember. Okay, that's drunk dude. <laughs> <laughs> we, when we started going to L.A. a lot uh, and meeting up there, and then we were going to Little T. We went to Little T one time uh, for their uh, 40th year of existence, and, and we were all invited up there. And uh, this guy's name is Bob Terrian, and he lives in Marietta, and he's a retired 37-year uh, engineer on San Diego Fire Department. But on the way up there one day, he talked about when the thing that he liked best about being an El Carrizo hotshot was that he was only 18 years old, but he could drive down the hill to Elsinore if he was in uniform and a green beret on. They'd serve him all the beer he wanted all night, and he'd come back about smashed. So as soon as we saw this picture, 
We said, that's drunk dude right there. <laughs> as soon as he told us the story, Rich and I said, drunk dude, drunk dude, that's him. We, could, we kept saying, whatever happened to so-and-so? What, you know, whatever happened to George Lee? Well, whatever happened to drunk dude? God, I don't know. I don't even remember his name. We just always called him drunk dude. So we found this picture, and we said, there he is. There's drunk dude. But I used to say that this is, and this is what I use when we've talked to the foresters. See, this is, Gordon would come in and let us lay down on their bunks and take about a two-hour nap after the morning PT. Yeah, right. This is, probably, <laughs> this is probably right after lunch. We weren't allowed to go in and lay down or whatever. But that's definitely drunk, dude. Go ahead. <laughs> that, my friends, right there, is Ray Chi, the greatest hook who ever lived. And if you go down the, down the road and up to the memorial, and Rich and I stopped there this morning, you'll see a brick there. This is Ray G, greatest hook ever. My wife and I put that brick there. I'll tell you the rest of his story in a little bit. He was about five foot six. Could swing a brush up for 24 hours on a pint of water. I don't think he, we wore gallon canteens in the back as Gordon was talking about. And we had an extra pint on our hip, either hip, whatever you wanted. He, I don't think I ever saw him take that big canteen off and fill canteen for any, you know for any other purpose it was just and I'd heard all these stories about him because he was gone back to school in in, uh, in 65 when I got there he'd gone back to school he was a student at Brigham Young University and he wasn't scheduled back in 66 but his father died he was a full-blooded Navajo Indian his father was the chief of the Navajo Nation and oddly enough it was up to up to the family to pay for the burial expenses of the chief that, I still don't quite understand that, but that was his. That was why he was back in 1966, and he was by far the best hook I ever saw. And I and Gordon said he was the greatest he'd ever seen. That's all I need to talk about, man. If Gordon says he's the greatest, he's the greatest. He's, he worked with lots of people, and uh, he was just amazing little guy. And he knew he knew what he was doing. He wrote home. We've heard the story that he wrote home and mailed a letter to his brother with detailed instructions on how he wanted to be buried two days before the loop fire. His brother got the letter the day after he was notified for the Forest Service that Ray was gone. Amazing. Let me tell you the rest of the story when I get to my personal thing. Go ahead. I want you to remember him. Okay, that's Glenn, Glenn Spady. I, th I think earlier I told some of you guys that we had, sometimes we had permanent uh, McLeod's was kind of an insult to be on a McLeod, or at least I took it that way. But you'd always start the new kids out on a McLeod, who was pretty basic, you know, dig here and scrape, dig and scrape, you know, not much to it. And and he was really good. He's about six foot six, six foot seven. And you're going to hear a lot more about him when I get into my part of the fire story. But he's holding a machete there, and you know how often you guys use machetes, right? So it was a stage stage photo, actually. Good guy. There we go. That's me with the official hot shot stance. See, we got it better there. Everybody's got a cigarette going. Or maybe Rich don't. Yeah, do. This is Jim. Yeah, you do. Right, right there in his mouth. Yeah. He's really cool. He's just hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> look, at, look, at, look at the looks, man. You don't fuck with those guys. We all uh, had the same shades as Gordon did. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. As soon as we saw Gordon's shades, we all ran into Elsinore and got the same kind of shades. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> That's great, yeah. yeah. Jim Paluzzi's in the middle, and he was my, uh, he was my, he was a squad boss the first year we were there, wasn't he? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember, but he, he had a, a 61, Chevy Impala with a 348 in it with, with uh, three deuces, three two-barrel carburetors on that thing. And he could go down, as I rode with him, he could go down the hill on one wheel or two wheels because I rode with him once and I never rode with him again, never. I was scared to death. He, that thing could fly. He'd run 75, 80 miles an hour down that hill. And that, I said, you crazy son of a bitch. We stopped at... Uh, we stopped at Corona on the way to the fire, to the loop fire. And we found out later why, but when we pulled up, Jim came out and said hi to Rich and I. Three hours later, we'd lost almost the whole crew, four hours later. 
One funny. thing about these three dudes here, uh, we used to go out and party a little bit. Just once in a while. Once in a while. We were, we were over in, somewhere in Riverside, I don't have no idea at this point. We were coming back, we are on the old road uh, from uh, Temescal, coming the back way to, up the hill. Yeah. And we're all feeling good, and, and all of a sudden we see this smoke on the side of the roadway. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this. I don't know we usually don't talk about it, but we stop and we get out and here's this stupid ass pillow on the ground that's on fire. Well, you know, we didn't have no water with us, so the only thing we had was just beat on it. <laughs> you know? We put that sucker out and we thought we did something good. We get back up the next day, tell Gordon what we did, say, did you make a report out? Oh shit, no. <laughs> We, that was the end of that one. <laughs> yeah, he wanted us to report it. We, we wanted, Rich decided he was going to be the, the, the fire boss, and I was going to be a line boss, and, and Pelosi was going to be the other line boss. We had that thing circled, and we had those feet all over it. <laughs> Gordon said, did you make reports out? He grabbed, pulled out a pack of paperwork and threw it out. No, 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 forget it, Gordon, we're done. It was okay, yeah. That's about the time we did that, too. That red El Camino on the end, that's off burgers. Uh, El Camino, 59 El Camino. Cool picture. Go ahead. Okay, that's uh, that's my crew. Right there, that's me. That's Jimmy Brown. I need my pictures. I can't remember all of them. Jim Brown was the number two hook. This this picture was taken about two weeks before the loot fire. It was somewhere in the middle of October, and Gordon took all the pictures. It's, it's different from some of the other crew pictures that's in that. He left his scrapbook here. You guys need to take a look at that sometime. It goes all the way back into the early 60s. And a lot of stuff in there. Okay. All right, here we go. That's Jim Brown. That's uh, assholes and elbows himself. Don't he look happy? <laughs> that's, John, that's John Moore. I, actually, we've, we've gotten to be uh, much better friends. Uh... Okay, Jim Reichert. No, that's not Jim Reichert. That's, uh... That's Moreland. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't read. Jim Moreland. Jim Moreland was my number two hook after Brown left. Brown was gone that weekend. He was gone for about four days when he came back. There wasn't anybody there but a few green kids. But some of us were in the hospital and the rest of them were just gone. He was the number two or number three hook the day of the loop fire. He was right behind Ray Chi. And right next to him is uh, Jim Reichert. Was he killed in that fire too? God, no, I can't remember. Hang on, I got it marked. Terrible. On the this is terrible. Yeah. No, this isn't the one that's marked. Yeah, no, Reichert was not killed. I'm not sure where he was. Next to him is Big Andy Silkwood. I'll show you another picture of Andy in a little bit. He lives up in Oregon now. We've got reconnected with him. Next to him is William Waller. We met his two sisters. He was 18 years old. He was number three hooked that day. And his two sisters were um, like 16 and 15 or something. And their, their parents had just been killed earlier that year. I don't know if it was a car wreck or what it was, but their, his parents were gone. And we met his sisters at the Little T Station. Uh, Little T Hotshot Camp um, for their 70th or 40th anniversary um, in October of uh, 2011. And um, neither one of them, well, what the, old, the one, the shorter one, didn't want anything to do with the Elk Riso Hot Cots, didn't want to hear anything about Gordon King or the Loop Fire. They were just there because she had dated one of the guys that was on Little T. By the time the day was over, we were the best of friends. And they climbed up the hill. I'll show you that picture. To the memorial, there's a there's a, a marker, the lowest marker in the in the trough is is marker D, and that's where they found the bodies right there, and that's where their brother was found. And that's to uh, Rod Seawall. Yeah, Rod. Uh, where am I at? I've lost track now. Yeah, yeah that's Rod. Right there. He was he's that's he was my squad boss, and he's the guy that took the famous picture of the, of the fire, where John Moore's looking back at him, going, "What the hell are you doing with a camera on a fire line?" Yeah, that's that's Rod. Good good dude. He told me later. He told me he came down to San Marcos, and Rich and I was doing the talk, and Gordon came. So when Gordon comes, 
a lot of the hot shots show up, you know. And uh, we went out to lunch afterward. And he told me that after the about seven eight o'clock that afternoon, after the loop fire, some of the Forest Service upper management people came by and asked him and John Moore, John Moore and Rod, and the Green Kid come over to Oak, Oak Grove Station, Ranger Station, they had the bodies there and they had a lot of mothers. It was all over the TV stations and everything as you can imagine. And they needed to get those bodies identified as fast as possible. And would they come over and look at them and see if they could tell them who it was. And um, Rod said, told us that he went and he really couldn't tell. They were burned so badly he really couldn't tell. So one of them had, and Rod couldn't remember which one, but one of them had a belt buckle on that was a little different, and the buckle was okay. And but that, but he said that's all he could identify him by. So they said, well, no, look, they went to dental records on him. But that's, I heard that first time about four years ago, and I thought, damn it, I'm glad I got burned. I don't think I could have stood that. Yeah, and then next to him is Dan Moore, and up on this corner is Bobby Chenard. Bob Chenard, we found out at a reunion in 08 that Bobby Chenard had stayed 30 years with the Forest Service and I saw him at the 96 and Rich did too, the 96 rededication of the park and the memorial and he was in Forest Service uniform and had shorts on and the size socks had come up and he had his green beret on and he came up and he started hugging me and he was just trembling. And he whispered in my ear as he was hugging me, and he said, please don't call me Green Kid anymore. He'd been with us about three weeks. And I think he was a McLeod at that time. And I switched him back, and I said, Bobby, I'm the Green Kid. Look at you. You spent 30 years in the Forest Service. I'm, I've just been a couple months. And he committed suicide. He had drinking and drug problems, and, and the Forest Service did a lot for him, I was told by a lot of people. And I was doing my talk at a, at a function in San Marcos uh, High School, uh, the junior college in San Marcos. And there was a kid, I was telling the story of the fire, which I'm about to tell you guys if I never shut up long enough. There was a kid sitting in the front row and he was taking copious notes. And when I got done, I, I said, is there any questions? And the kid, hand shut up and I thought, yeah, wow, what a surprise. And he said to me, did you ever know a guy named Robert Chenard? And I just started crying because I knew then it was true what I'd heard. I said, yes, he was a good man and a good friend. He said it was my uncle. And I got lost it. And I said, you know, I've got some pictures and I do, still got them of Bobby and I. And he's all pumped up the day of that, the 30th anniversary of the fire. And he was really on fire that day. He was real happy, he seemed to be. And we went out to the site and we rode in the, the guys' buggies, the old buggies. There were probably two buggies ago, that was 20 years ago. Uh, and then we found out about seven, eight years later, maybe 10 years, I'm not sure when, when he died, that he, that he was gone. And I asked the young man, his nephew, I said, I've got pictures and I'd like to talk to you about Bob. I'd like to tell you the story about meeting him at the 30th reunion, and he said, yeah, I'd like that too. And I said, okay. So I had his phone number from the from the fire captain at San Marcos Fire that had me come over and talk to those kids. And I called him, and I got him on the phone about a week or two later. And I went to, I'd gone to Costco, or yeah, Costco, and had copies of all those pictures made for him. I was going to give them to him. And uh, he said, I've talked to my dad, and my dad and I don't want anything to do with you or the El Carrizo Hot Shots. I'm sorry, he hung up. Strange how things happen like that, you know? This guy right here is John Verdugo. And Rich told me years ago that he's the first one that he got to. He was on fire. And Rich was trying to put the flames out with his hands. Let me remind you, he was 19, this guy behind me was 19 years old that day. If, if there was ever a, a hero of that fire, he's standing right here. This big guy is Stephen White. And he's one of two brothers. 
he's the older brother. He worked with us all summer and he was killed. And the little brother, we, we think, he was back, we were pretty sure he was back in line a little bit. And he ran down into the flames to see what was happening with his brother. And they were both killed right there in that canyon. <clears throat> it was the only sons that the family had. And we, I, through the internet, I, I got a, a message from a gal that lived next door to the brothers, the white boys and the, and the white family. And she had dated Stephen uh, back east. I think they were in Baltimore, somewhere in that area. His father was in the Navy and her father was in the Navy. And um, their father was a, a vice admiral or a lieutenant commander, commander, something pretty high up in the Navy. And uh, he was moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, and his, her family moved out here too. So they dated more after they got here. And she wanted to know any information I could get from them. And I said, I really, it's been so long to tell you the truth. I knew they were brothers, and I thought they were fine. I said, I do know one of our trips up here about six, seven years ago, uh, one of the guys that was here showed us um, a scrapbook. And, and in the scrapbook was um, two death certificates. And it was Stephen and his brother, death certificates. And that really tore me up. And then on the next page was a letter that Stephen had written, and I think it was like a week before the loop fire, talking how good his younger brother was doing. He was fitting in well. He was a good crewman, a good fireman. And one more check, he'd have enough money to buy his first car. He was only 18. He just graduated high school that, that June. Tore me up. And the girl on the phone told me that his mother was still alive. This was only about five years ago. <clears throat> his mother was still alive. She was 93 and sitting in a wheelchair, and all she did was rock in that wheelchair and grieve for her sons. And that her father, her husband, had made up this a bunch of photos and sent them to the Forest Service. And I said, which Forest Service? What? What? you know what forest it was or what the address was or what city was sent to. She says, I don't know, but I think it was Angeles. So I went over to Angeles one day, right there by, in Arcadia, and, and went in and tried to talk to the lady. And she said, I have no idea what you're looking for, but the lady that takes care of the, it would be in the archives, I'm sure. And the lady that's in the archives um, isn't here. She's, she's off for 10 days or two weeks or something. And I said, okay, uh, give, him, give him my name and number. And I wrote a little note and gave it to her. And she said, yeah. And in the meantime, Rich and I had come back by here to see you guys about moving the memorial outside. And uh, one of the guys came up and he says, we got this leather book that's been here for years. And I opened it and it was the pictures. It was everything that she wanted. I couldn't believe it. I took all the pictures out. Took them to Costco and I tripled them. I made a set for me, and I made a set for the girl, and a set for the mom. And then I sent the, the originals all back and sent them all to this girl. And she was living close by to the mom, and she got them over to the mother. And she called me up. She was bawling, <laughs> and I'm bawling. And uh, it was just really a neat, a neat thing, you know. And when they were here the whole time, the whole damn time. The, she had, his father, the father had sent them to a, a forest up in Oregon. Because he knew one of the rangers up there or something. And the ranger was going through some old stuff and found them 10 or 15, 20 years ago. And said, oh, these don't belong here. This had nothing to do with Oregon. But he knew the El Carrizo hotshots. And he, he mailed them here to this, to this address. And we, and we got them and got them back to the right owner. It was kind of a needle in a haystack thing. And then Joel Hill is right, right here. Right now. Is that Joel Hill? Yeah. It's got to be. No, that's Joel Hill right there. That's Joel Hill. Okay, Joel Hill. That's not Stephen White, is it? Oh yeah, that's right. That's Bowman over here. Bowman was fine. He got he got out with me. He was in the hospital with us. We haven't. That's one of the survivors. There's about five survivors that we've never been able to get contact with. They just don't want to see us, or we've got the wrong address, or we just can't find them. I wrote a three-page letter, four-page letter, to Glenn Spady, the one with the machete, uh, 
about uh, three years ago, and I mailed it to him. We found out that he's been working for the sheriff's department in Flagstaff, Arizona, and he just retired. And so I sent the letter off. <coughs> he got it the same day that the 19 hot shots were killed over there. About two months later, the letter came back to me and said somebody had written on pencil on the outside of the envelope. It looked like it had never been opened. No one by that name lives here. I'm not sure that I didn't send it to the uh, sheriff's department itself and not to his home. i got I got to still work on that. That's kind of a typical of what's happened. Let's go to your crew. There was seven of the guys, seven of the twelve worked for me because most of my crew was in the front part of the, of the uh, crew that day. That's Rich and Ray G. Uh, middle row. That's crazy Jerry Smith. And he's still around and I run into him sometimes. You see all these, a lot of these guys you'll see at the 50th. <coughs> you guys must be there. Unless you're on fire, of course. It's going to be on a Tuesday. We're not moving. It's going to be on the actual day. And that's uh, Joe Beatty. Joe was our original um, crew boss on, uh, yeah, squad, crew boss on, um, crew number one, and he was shying away from his planes up here on the on the Indian, and, and Gordon didn't care much for it, so he bumped, bumped him back. And right next to Joe is Kenny, Kenny Barnhill, and I'll tell you more about Kenny in a little bit. He died right beside me. He was laying right beside me. This guy here is um, Frank so good. Huh? Frank Kiesling. Yeah, Frank Kiesling, and Frank became a um, Union electrician, and I worked with him for about five years at San Wilfrey. And uh, good dude, it was a good dude. But he he died of a heart attack about ten years ago. So that's one that we know we've lost. But he thought these two were inseparable, absolutely inseparable. And he thought that if he'd have been on that fire that day, he wouldn't have died. I don't believe that. I don't think Kenny knew how fast it hit and how little time we had to do anything. But uh, he was a good guy. He had to take off that day to go to Anaheim and pay about 35 part, uh, speeding tickets. You know, he was 18 or 19. Good dude. And that's uh, Tom Rother. That's Pete Ockberger. That's my buddy. He was in Fort Bliss, Texas on the day of the, he left Saturday. And, no, that's, and that's, the, that's Mike White. Oh, that, that's right. What am I looking at? That's right, Mike White. We'll get to him in a minute. Mike is the other brother of Stephen. He's the younger brother. He was served saving to buy his first car. That's Joe Smalls. Joe's in the hospital with us. That's John Figolo. Right? Yep. Figolo is on one of the ones that died. He's on the memorial outside. That's Fred Danner. Fred was the last to die. We lost Fred. He was burned the worst of, of the survivors, 70-some percent, I think. And um, he was in the hospital in about the middle of December. We'd been there six weeks or something. In the middle of December, the doctors came in to the ward we were on, and they said, <clears throat> we've done everything we can but we think he's lost the will, the will to live. And they had seen us. If you came to see any of us, we would start picking on you. We didn't want anybody talking about how my ears had burned off or his nose was burned off or his hands were all rot. We wouldn't put up with it. We'd start, look at this goofy sucker. He's got a mustache. This one over here has got some chin on his hair. We'd just pick on you as fast as we could. We, didn't, we would turn it around. We wouldn't let anybody stand there and start crying. It was part of it was the spree de corps of the El Criso hot shots. Was really, it was part one of it was. But they said, see if you can get it under his skin a little bit and start getting him to fight a little bit. And right after that, they moved me and uh, Smalls and uh, four of us down to uh, Balboa Navy Hospital in San Diego on the 19th, which would have been my father's 52nd birthday. And uh, we heard about 10 days later that uh, Fred had died. His mother and father went out in the hall to have a cigarette. You could still smoke in buildings, even hospitals. And his father was very upset with his mother because she'd been off work for six weeks and been at his bedside for all that time. 
which a lot of the mothers had. It was not unusual. It wouldn't be today either. And he was pissed off that they were getting into financial debt and all this shit, and they got into a little bit of an argument. Well, Fred heard him. The, the story I got was Fred heard him outside. When they came back in, he told him, don't worry about it, I won't be around much longer. And he died that night. It was uh, uh, New Year's Eve that he died. And that's the great and wonderful Peacock Burger. <laughs> what a character. He looks just like, if I get him to that door, he'd look just like that right now. And this guy, here's another one we haven't been able to get a hold of. Good friend of Rich's. I think you kind of talked him into coming to the hot shots, didn't you? He was a year behind you in high school. Yeah, I got him the job. Yeah, Pat, Pat Chase is his name, and he's raised his horses now. He's back in Wisconsin or Minnesota? Wisconsin, Minnesota. We're not sure. And Weird places back there. <laughs> that's the biggest McLeod operator you've ever seen. That's Glenn Spady again. Glenn was in the helicopter with me right after the fire, and he got out, and he was one of the ones. Uh, that was moved to San Diego. His folks lived down in Imperial Beach area. Good kid. I just, I just, I just haven't seen him since then. I don't know why. Okay, let's go. Oh, way too long. But that's our, 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 our helicopter. No, airplane. Our, our helicopter, airplane, DC-3, C-47. That's Gordon King standing right there. I can tell by the stance, believe it or not. Anyway, that's it. And that beautiful thing is what you now know as Ontario International Airport. Don't look too busy right there, does it? <laughs> it wasn't. It was just a big long strip of concrete, and I think they had a wind socket one. <laughs> that was pretty much about it. You know, a lot different than it looks now. That's the hell attack pad. That's our ride. Yeah, that's up at the top of El Carrizo, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It looks a little different now. You can see the fire brick going up there. Okay. Ah, that's uh, that's that's line. That we, that's an average line that we cut. It's about 12 feet wide. Sometimes we'd go 14. This is some pretty heavy brush, pretty tall brush right there. This is sitting peak. Okay, they've seen enough rocks and dirt. <laughs> this is the Hotshot Olympics. If we had a dispute or a disagreement, this is Jim Brown standing there. He's the official judge. They would stand about 10 paces apart and throw dirt on one another. It's called hot spotting. I'm pretty good at that. I used to be, and I tried it on my dog not long ago, and I hit her. <laughs> you pull it up over your shoulder, and you pull down the handle and push. And hit, I get hit him every time from here. And you stand there, and you put the goggles. That was our, our safety equipment. Hard hat, the wraparound goggles, like a ski goggles, and the neckerchief, you know, to kill it, keep the smoke and the dirt out of your mouth. And you get the throw, and any other one gets the throw. This guy's... Either just dumped it or he's just picking up a load, most of it's on the ground. Or, no, that's probably the stuff hitting him right there. He's got him right in the chest. Good shot. <laughs> it was great. This, this was out at Sitting Peak. Yeah. Any kind of an argument. Oh, yeah? Get over here, get a shovel. It was great. And then we'd all be all yelling and having a good It was great. It was fun. Oh, man, here we go. This is Drunk Dude. <laughs> that's him. And look at that baby face. When we were on the Iron Mountain fire, Gordon had to box him up and send him home with the check or with the uh, payroll so we'd all get paid when we get back because he had to go back and finish high school. He was 18 years old, but he hadn't finished high school. He must have flunked somewhere along the line. Yeah, that's drunk, dude. That's big Andy. He's drunk. Yeah, he was drunk probably. <laughs> I don't think he ever drank before he came to El Carrizo. I really don't. That's Andy. Uh, a silkwood, good dude, funny, funny, funny man. Baby Huey. Yeah, and that's me, that tall, good-looking, stout one right there. That, you don't know what that is? That's a generator. That's before we had alternators. I don't even know if they got alternators on cars anymore. I was changing out the alternator on our truck, and that's Tom Gallion. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Tom was in a, a student at UCLA, and he went back to school right about the 1st of August, or 1st of September. And he was, uh, among other things, he was a great guitar player, a big Dodger fan. I was too in those days, hate to admit it. But, uh, hey, 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 I heard somebody in here disparaging the Padres while they gone, you're lucky you're still alive. <laughs> anyway, uh, Tom, 
<laughs> All right, grab it. I'm ready. You guys um, don't have shovels anymore. Uh, yeah, you guys don't have shovels. You don't know what a shovel looks like. I, I think I could take them all on it. But anyway, Tom, um, Tom was in the band and he was into music a lot. And and at that iron, one of those an iron mountain fire. And that Gordon remembered it. We come off a shift one night, or one morning. It was about probably eight o'clock in the morning. We come dragging into camp, man. We were just dead tired. We put our green berets on because as soon as you got to the truck, you put your green beret on. And we were we were just dragging into the camp. And Tom was way in the back of the line, and he started whistling the Colonel Boogie March. And it goes, <whistles> and man, we picked it up, and it went right up the line. Everybody started whistling and singing, and we marched in. And here's the Del Rosa sitting there. We get around the corner, we collapse in a pile. And they're sitting there. Here, one of them saying, "Look at those crazy motherfuckers." <laughs> it worked, you know. We we impressed him. And the, Tom is uh, is now a an attorney in Escondido and a very fine fine when I talk to him all the time. He's getting involved with the 50th anniversary. He uh, emailed Rich last week. There's our favorite duck. Yeah, the ruptured duck. Remember, this was painted. And of course, it's hanging right there on the wall. This was painted by Tom Sullivan, a guy that I thought wasn't even on the crew. And he autographed that for us in 20, uh, 2013. He put his, his name on the bottom. If you look, it says T. Sullivan over there. And I've got, right here, I've got my crew book or my little notepad that I used. And we got to looking when we were going to redo the, the memorial. Uh, I can't find the right page. There were a lot of names on there that weren't on the crew. Yeah, the we looked at them and we said, I don't know who these guys are, but they're not on the crew. They put, how they did it was they went to the records. Gordon's in the hospital. Burchett's out of his mind. They had nobody to talk to officially about who should be on the memorial. So they went back in the records and whoever was on that, the payroll that week got their name on that memorial. Okay, and that's what we were, we knew all the guys who had died. But uh, Sullivan, I've got him in here somewhere. Anyway, yeah, there he is. T. Sullivan would be the number eight shovel on the second odd spotting team. And I, and I saw his name on the memorial before I saw it in my own book and my own handwriting. Because I'd lost this book for about 40 years. I just found it about 10 years ago. <laughs> There's Sullivan's name and I wrote it in there. Number eight hook. Gunther's in there too. He's on the thing. Chenard, they were all new people. Parshall, Parshall, that's the, the missing kid. They, when they, after they did, tried to identify the bodies, they came back and, and uh, John asked this Parshall kid, hey, he said, have you called your mother? It was about 10, 11 o'clock at night. He said, no, why? And he said, oh my God, hand him a phone. You don't pull him out of your pocket in those days. You hand him a phone. He said, call your mother and tell her where you are. She said, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm fine, Mom. Where are you? He told her. And uh, yeah, this picture was, was done before he'd signed this. We took pictures of this and then enlarged them so we'd have it for the deal. But what I never noticed till today is here's the flames coming up below to get us. I never noticed that. I've, looked, I've been looking at this thing for about 15 years and I get a lump in my throat. But I just noticed today for the first time he put it, the flames coming up from, from the lower ground. Make, make Finish that yeah. story about the kid out there called his mother. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. His mother says, found out where he was at. He says, you stay right there because I'm going to come and get you. She pulled up there within a couple hours, took that kid out, put him in the car, and never heard from him since. We don't no know idea if he where got a paycheck been. or not. <laughs> he was on the loop fire, though, and he's got his name on that memorial forever. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's kind of strange. Okay. This is at Little T. That's Tom Gallion today. He's the one that's the lawyer. That's Richie. This is one of the two sisters, one there and one here. Um, and she was dating this guy in high school. That's um, Larry Saul. Larry Saul. Good guy. He got involved and got us invited there. And this is the rock. This is what got us here was this rock. Turns out the Lions Club of, I don't know, Silmar Pacoima. or Pacoima or something right in that area. Uh, put this rock out in front of their meeting hall on, foot, on Foothill Boulevard 
And, and if you get close, we might have a second picture, I'm not sure. But it gives the, a little bit about the Elk Reese Hot Shots, the Loop Fire, and it names the 12 who died. Okay, yeah, they were it, a little, they got it real early on in this thing, and they call it the Pacoima Fire. Right, that's right. And and that's what's on that thing. We never knew that even existed. And when, in 2010, 2011, when we went up there, here's my boy John on the end. Crazy Jerry, me. Uh, that's David Wesley who did our uh, website, still does it, drunk and that's dude. drunk dude today. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, he'll all, always he be known as drunk dude. He'd never get over that. But we found this rock, and what they, what happened was the rock was out there, and then the neighborhood fell into disrepair, and drunk some people were going out there and putting cigarette butts out on it, and you know peeing on it or whatever they were doing, and it was getting into bad, bad shape. And this was, this was like 1971, 72, somewhere in there. And so a dozer operator from Little T borrowed a, serv a, a, a backhoe or a skip loader and a backhoe, a, a, back, a skip loader and a liftgate truck from the Forest Service. And of course, he brought them back. And he went over there to Foothill Boulevard and he absconded with the rock put it in the, on the lift gate, put it up in the truck, brought it back to Little T and they spotted it. This is their old training center. It's a brand, that's not there anymore. But they have a brand new one now and this rock, they've turned it just a little bit and the sidewalk comes off a little funny. We were there about, what, two months ago for a staff ride and Gordon met us there. It was pretty neat, pretty neat day. And they call themselves to this day the keepers of the rock. I thought that was really cool. So all of us went up there to uh, wish them well on their 40th. They're really only 37 because they were inactive for three years. But it's, it was 1971, 70 or 71 that they got, uh, they got it. But if you look real close, you can see a green beret. It's this guy's, my oh boy Tom. He, put, he took his green beret off as soon as we saw the rock and set it on top of the rock and he left it there all day long. Must have a 500 pictures of that thing sitting on that rock by everybody that came around. There was a lot of people there that day. It was really fun. It was really a fun day. Okay. There it is. Yeah, there. Memory of the El Cariso Hot Shots uh, and the Placoima Canyon fire, which was wrong. Yeah, this is, uh, this is when uh, Gordon, there's Drunk Dude, me, uh, Rod Seawall, Gordon, Tom and Richie. This is at uh, the uh, Fire Academy in San Marcos. It belongs to San Marcos uh, Fire Department about four years ago. That's the new, the brand new memorial. It's exactly like the one outside, only this one is kind of sculpted. You can't really tell. The edges aren't smooth. You can sit a little bit better over here on this side. <coughs> Skateboarders were getting on it, riding up on it. And it was sitting at about the same angle as this one out here, as the old one was. And we, we, when we saw that, we knew what to do. We lifted it, and this one's about 40 degrees. Too much for them to try to skate off of. And the contractor put, if you, it's hard to see in that picture, but this is the Maltese cross. See the different color right there? And then down here, there's a Maltese cross right here, and they set it, we set it dead center right over the memorial. Just and like it, the one down here right. uh, on, up the Ortega. Yeah. It's designed after that one. Yeah, it's yeah, very much like the one on the Ortega. Okay, there's the picture my brother took, and I said, you can't keep God waiting. <laughs> Gordon just started busting up. And, of course, when he laughed, then we all three started laughing. This is just a few minutes after the, uh, the, the rededication. Oh, well, that was awesome that day. We had, I think it was closer to 700 people than even 600. It was great. Just great. That's the the setters of the stone. <laughs> they were going to bring some Mexicans out there. No point to any Mexicans. <laughs> they had the guy that cut the stone was a Mexican guy named Angel, and he did a great job. And he only charged us eighteen hundred dollars to redo the whole stone plus all the engraving. It was amazing. And so, and the contractor was this guy. And then down here is is uh, is the people we wanted to thank for helping us pay for it. But we, we paid for those out of the funds we raised. That's Crazy Jerry, Rich, me, Rod, and Joe, and uh, Jimmy Brown. And we picked it up. He had a dolly he rolled in there, and he even jacked it up so it was right exactly at the right angle. All we had to do was pick it up and do this kind of thing, about three steps, and set it back down on his, on his dowels, and we were done. But we didn't want anybody to touch it to set it but us. You know, we just, 
we felt real proud of that thing. You know, we'd redone it ourselves. There you can see the Maltese cross much better there. Yeah. Okay. That, you know what that's that's at. what it used to look like. Yeah. Seems like the deer ate all of the roses now. There's nothing out there now. The guys did a really nice job on that. We really appreciate it. This is the old old memorial. Yeah, down off the highway. Yep. And it's a new one. That's the new one. We just stopped there this morning. And the fire. Yeah, well, you guys have all seen these. I noticed there. there's a few more on the plaque down here. Yeah, that's among the bodices. We keep seeing more and more showing up. This one is up at the Nifsey, uh In Boise. In Boise, Idaho. This uh, this woman contacted me. I uh, wanted to know about the. She was doing a report on for their six minutes of safety, whatever that program they has up there, and she wanted a, a lot of information about. Uh, the timelines of what happened on the loop fire. So we gave them all that stuff and everything. Really a nice person. And she said she, she went out and bought these uh, little shells and everything and put them on our uh, memorial out there. We didn't even know it was up there. We didn't know it was a memorial. Those are little uh, angels. You can see this one much better down here, this side. But she put 12 angels on there for us. Never met her. She called me on the phone. Call Rich first. And then she called me, and I talked to her for, God, an hour and a half at least. But, and then she put this little angel on top. Get up there and see that. This is yeah. way back. This is that's the, rich. the Iron Mountain Fire. This is the Iron Mountain Fire. That's rich, and I'm almost sure that that's Joe Spade. Uh, Joe, um, ah. Beatty? Yeah, Beatty. Joe Beatty, and I think this is uh, Jay Shilcutt. No, no, I still think it's you. <laughs> You think it's who? Me? No, I don't think that's me. Yeah, no. no. This person right here, the first one, yeah. that's, that's Julian Lee. It is. You're right. That's where he met up with us. Yep. And this might have been the, one of the first days we were out there. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. That was a great fire. That's Jimmy Brown over there. Now I'm starting to recognize a few. Yeah. He found this picture about two years ago, and we've been looking at it for two years, John. He swears up and down that's me, but I don't think so. My wife didn't either. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Orange County. Yeah, this we went is, down yeah. And to this group. yeah, we talked to them last year. Or earlier this year, wasn't it? Yeah. This is the staff is, ride. This is LA County crew. Mm -hmm. uh, we met, this is uh, Camp Nine who organized this, this trip. Uh, they're actually stationed on Contractors Point now. That's uh, right. And they took us down there and it was we got a group picture. pretty great. And before we went up there, this is the wait, go back to that one one more time. This is probably the most recent picture we have. This is the shoot right up here. Yeah. But that's the drop off, and this is where the dozer was working. I'm going to tell you about real quick. So before we got into our program and everything, they took us out in one of their planes, helicopters up there. Now they didn't take us out in the new Cobra. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what they really fly up there on their, yeah. on their assignments. But this is just their bell. Uh, it's bigger, has bigger windows, so you can see better. Yeah. And they flew us around that mountain up there probably 15 times around in a big circle. So we got to see everything from the air. Totally different look. Very different. I, I got kind of choked up just thinking about, you know, what the history. That was, uh, what, last year in January? Yeah. That's Rich, Gordon, me, and George That's Julian Lees. Lee. Came all the way out to... Yeah, he drove all the way out from New Mexico just for that helicopter ride and hear us talk. <laughs> Good okay, guy. that's the last picture. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's go, let me go back to the mountain. Can we go back to that? Mountain? Yeah, we just start the whole thing. Anyway, we got up We got up there and we, we drove the top of the hill. Richard already told you that and so was Gordon. And... Um, when we got off the trucks, oh, let me back up. There's one, one thing that was very important that happened. The, the night before, the 1st of November, is what? Halloween. Huh? Halloween. 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 Well, it seems like Rich got real thirsty, pulled out a gun and a knife, or two knives, pulled them on my throat and said I had to go down to the O'Hara's or wherever the hell we went and drink one beer. We had probably about 101, <laughs> and I woke up the next morning hearing that this damn thing's going on up in the Angeles, and it's about 98 degrees, and the wind's blowing up. Oh, God. 
I was really hung over and really feeling bad to the point where John Moore said, you can't drive your truck today, I'll drive the truck. That's okay, do that. Then it turns out that Gordon's pickup, you saw that in one of the pictures, he always drove that pickup and the three trucks followed him. You know, like uh, Mother Duck and her ducklings behind her. So it was weird. Gordon comes over and I had to slide into the middle and sit next to John because Gordon, of course, was going to ride shotgun in crew number one's truck. We drove up there and we got to Contractor's Point and we came down just to everything. Oh, let me back up. I'm, 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 I'm doing this backwards from how I used to do it. Um, we got to the top of the hill and we started crew it, uh, tooling up and I grabbed my brush hook and Ray Chi come over to me and he says, Ed, he said, you don't look so good. And I said, Ray, you ought to see it from my side. I, I really messed up. He says, well, I'll take the lead until dark and then you can handle it from there. I said, God, I love you, brother. I really do. This, I can, I'll be fine in two or three hours. I, mean, I can probably take it before then. He said, no, we'll just swap off at, at, uh, at dark. Well, I didn't know and I don't know that he knew that all we had to do was get to the bottom of the hill and we were going home. But he did, and he took the lead. And my guys, four of my guys were the first four right behind him. And so, because I was the second crew boss, that meant my position on the line was the very last one, the trail man. It was my responsibility to make sure everything was clean and that everything was done properly. And if anything was wrong, either I had to fix it or I had to call a McLeod or Pulaski or whatever I needed back there to get it clean, get stob. We'd take the stobs out of everything. We didn't leave anything sticking up. It was dirt, rock, that's all that was there. So I had, you know, being the trail guy, I was, I was pretty light duty, especially in the stuff we were in. It was all shale and it was no, there really wasn't anything there. You'd see a little grass growing here and there and that was about it. So I come down the hill and I'm leaning on that shovel, or that shovel's holding me up most of the time. And we got down, I was at just about where we were going to, we had the, the part where we climbed down into the chute was about maybe 10 or 12 feet deep and it was about 80 degrees. So you had to hand your tool down to the guy in front of you and then kind of back up and climb down the wall, you know and get the next guy's tool and we just daisy chain and come on down. I was coming down that chute when John Moore come back up there and said, Ed, you ain't doing shit back here. I've been watching you. All you're doing is holding that shovel up. I said, no, John, you're wrong. That, cho that shovel's holding me up. And that was the most honest thing I said all day. It really was holding me up. So he says, this is bullshit. Go down there and relieve Rod on the first hot spotting team. He's down at six, seven, eight position, and send him back here. He's going to run trail the rest of the way. So I said, okay. And I grumbled and bitched. I couldn't really argue because he was right. And so I bumbled and grumbled and that old son of a bitch went down, you know, and caught, just walked right by the crew as I went down. And I got into the line. It probably took me 10 minutes to get down to where he was. I told Rod, this was after he'd taken the picture. I told Rod, go on the back, you're, you're running trail. John said, we'll replace you right here. He said, okay, fine. So he started walk, climbing back up the chute to get to the trail position. And apparently, by all the stories we've got, he was at that trail position when the blow up happened. Okay? Now, it's the, the most difficult thing for us is to remember timelines. How long was I in that number six or number seven spot? Uh, the, the hot spotting team compare, uh, was comprised of a, of a shovel and uh, a two Pulaski's or two, Pulas two, two shovels and one Pulaski. And I don't remember exactly how we were set. Yeah, we had, we had two, I had two Pulaski's and I was the shovel for them. But it seems like I was in that spot. We were real low in, in, in go to the, the long shoot. Which one? Do you this is the old one, one of the old pictures. The one where the guy's standing there looking, looking back up. Oh, okay. That, uh, no, that next one. Yeah, hold that. I'm guessing 
that the flare-up was down here. The, the, the stuff that they dropped water on was about down here. Okay? I'm thinking that we were right in here, which is, I think it's usually called the diamond. Is it right here or right here is the diamond? Yeah, up, 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 right, up above, right there. That's right the there? Okay, I was... All right, now where's where's the four marker? It's right in here, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think right about where you got your yeah. laser. Right okay. Here. So I'm up in here, and the four marker's here, which means that Chi and the boys were right here, the four hooks. Chi and, and three more hooks or four more hooks were right here. It's right where the D marker is. We know that where they were, because that's where they found them. Okay, I'm back up in here. I hear, and you heard Gordon say, call a hot spotting team down. He said, get me, what did he say? He said, get me five or six guys down here. Gordon yeah, just this the hot morning. spotting team. Well, then she then, then said, number one hot spotting team, come down. There was two or three hot spotting teams in that, in that crew, and we had them designated so everybody knew who they were. Go ahead. So you guys had, it was like four hooks, three hot spotting teams, and the rest of McLeod? The no, they were McLeod shovels. Uh, there was probably maybe three McLeods total on the line that day. I, I, I'd have to go back and really study, and I'm not sure we could really tell them how many McLeods, but I don't think it was more than three. The rest of them were carrying shovels or, or Pulaski's. Yeah. After the first four or five, there's no more, no more hooks. The hooks are the first four or five, depending on what, how we're running the crew. Okay, so we, we're right here, and I hear number one hot spotting team. So I turned to Shilcut and Barnhill and I says, let's go get it, boys, like that. And I turned back around and it's so steep and it's shale and sand and rock and you're, you're, you've got a full-time job to just stand still. You know, you've got to be real careful with your footing. So we're crow hopping sideways, just two or three inches at a time to keep from going down. It's 60 degrees. You, you, can't, you can kind of tell how steep it is here, but if you're standing down here where where the uh, site, what they call the site area now, where the, the river bottom, you look up in there and you're going, oh my God. It just, the first time I stood at the bottom and looked back up was 96 when they took us out the site. And I stood there and I just got cold chills and I was shaking. I just looked at that and I thought, oh my God. So I turned around and I'm, and I'm kind of bouncing a little bit. And, and I saw, I heard, or I either heard or saw a helicopter come in. So I stopped. And I remember looking up, and I could see the chopper coming in from the west. And he come in. We could see a piece of, of scrub, scrub oak or something down there that was maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 feet across, circular, how they grow in a, kind of a big circle. And there was fire coming out right in the middle of it. But it was, you know, it wasn't anything big. It was just some fire, maybe a foot around, you know, just coming up. Didn't look like nothing, really. But we knew that that's what he wanted us to get. And so I stopped, and I looked up at that chopper, and he came in and he started slowing down as he got over the drop. And when he got to the drop point, he let the water go, and I saw it come down. And I thought, cool, we ain't going to have to go. But very quickly, I thought, oh, this, he gets it. We, we're good. Well, he hit it, and he didn't. As he banked off to the south, he just pulled up and just went just like that. The prop wars just those flames just exploded and that's what the boom was that Rich heard. Gordon said he never saw the helicopter. He said he never saw it but he heard it. I saw it and I heard it. There's no doubt there was a drop on that on that flames right there. It was probably a hundred feet below me, maybe seventy. When that thing went off it sounded like a howitzer. I just spent two and a half years in the army on a 155 toad howitzer. I know what howitzers and eight inch guns sound like. That's what it sounded like was one big gun going off. It's like, boom! And it just, all of a sudden, there was flames as high as you could see. I had to look almost straight up. I'd say 300 feet, 400 feet in the air to see blue sky. And it was a wall of flames coming right at us. And right at that moment, I heard reverse tool order. Well, I don't think I needed to hear that. But, because I knew what to do. It was, I just, I think I remember it froze. And all this is in like a 10 or 15 or 20, 30 seconds top period, okay? It takes a lot longer to talk about it than it, what it took. I'm looking at it, and it boom, and I look up, and I'm going, oh, my God. And the first thing I thought of was, this is it. 
This is it. This, I'm, I'm, this is where I'm going to die. And I turned, and I, about that turn, I heard reverse tool order. And for 40 years, or 45 years, I thought it was Gordon calling for the hot spotting team, and I thought it was Gordon calling reverse tool order. I just turned out, when I started talking to Gordon, or Gordon started talking to us about what, he, what happened, and what happened between him and Ray at the bottom of the hill, I now know that Ray gave both orders. Anybody in the crew that saw something could holler reverse tool order. Not a big deal. It's a big deal. You better know why we're going to reverse tool order. But anybody that sees a safety problem should be hollering reverse tool order. So I turned quickly. I saw it and I heard reverse tool order. So I turned and tried to run back up that canyon right up in here. It seems like I was, it, it felt like I was on this bridge. I was very close to it. Um, That almost looks like a little ridge there. I'm not sure, but it felt like I was right on a ridge. And as I turned and started back up, I took a big step and I slid back. I took a big step, I slid back. I was probably taking 30 inch steps and sliding back at least a foot or two. I think I took maybe three steps and it all hit me. And as I went down, I started, I was leaning already and the ground's at 60 degrees. So, you know, I don't got far to fall. I felt something bump me right here on this shoulder. And I remember looking back to see what was going on, and it was Barnhill, and he bumped me in this shoulder. And he was on fire. His clothing, his hair, everything was on fire, and he was just screaming like mad. So all, we fell. Shilcut was coming on the right side of me. He fell on my right side. Barnhill fell on my left. And all three of us landed almost at exactly the same time period. They just, boom, we hit that that area right there. And I think, now that I've listened to Rich tell this so many times and I've listened to Gordon, I think it was the same shock wave that probably knocked the three of us down. But Barnhill definitely bumped into my shoulder because I felt something, you know, just a little tap. And, and, but I felt force knocking me to the ground too. So I hit the ground and you could hear for a few minutes, I could hear a horrible screaming and, and guys calling out to Jesus and and mamas, and it, it was just horrible. I can still remember that. I don't like to remember that. And all I could think to do was just hold my breath, pray. I was praying like crazy, and other guys was praying. They were calling out to Jesus, like I said. And all of a sudden, it just got dead still, silent. Just, uh, just silent. Couldn't hear anything. And I'm holding my breath, or I think I am. And Barnhill's still screaming next to me, just before it went silent. And and Shilcut got up and climbed over me. And he was pulling his tan canteen off. And I could feel him go over my legs. As the fire went over me, back up a little bit. As the fire went up over me, the only thing I felt was real heat on the back of my thighs and my calves. And it felt just like it does to stand in front of a bonfire at the beach or anywhere and it gets too hot and you, woo -hoo -hoo, and you move away from it. That's exactly what the feeling was. I had nowhere to go. I didn't care to go away. I just, I just laid there because I really thought I was dead. I remember yelling at both of them, tell them, tell them, shut up, hold your breath, shut up, hold your breath. And I was down very close to the ground and trying to hold my breath. It was probably still breathing because I'm yelling and we're excited, but I was trying to mentally hold my breath. And it just roared right over us. And after it went over us, that's when it got really quiet. And I laid there, I don't know, probably a minute, maybe less. And I heard a rumbling sound, and I'm laying, and I'm, you know, I'm on a 60-degree angle, so I'm pretty stupid. And I looked up to see what it was, and it was a boulder about the size of a basketball, and it was right here. It was about three or four feet from me. Boom, 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 coming right at my head and face, and I thought, <gasps> and I ducked my head, and it took my heart out right off. And it hit me on the back of the left leg hit right on that ankle bone. And I've got a scar, a burn scar, right on that ankle bone right there. But there's no scar or no burn spot on these whites. I never have figured. I guess it was 
induction or something. I don't know how it happened, but that's and it kept going down the hill. I laid there another minute or two, and I got up, and I remember standing there. And as I pushed off the ground, all those rocks were just super hot, just very hot. I, I burned my palms a little bit just pushing off the ground to get up. And as I turned, I had to step over Barnhill. He's laying right there on my left. Shokut was back on my right. And that's the weird part, is my brain will not let me identify Barnhill and Shokut. I've thought about it a thousand times, 10,000 times. No memory of them, either one of them laying there. They didn't go anywhere. They had to be laying there, but my brain the eyes, just, my eyes just didn't see them. I do remember walking off to the left just a little bit, and it was, and I was kind of crouched a little bit, and it was all smoky and foggy. And I thought, wow, am I in heaven or am I in hell? I, I really didn't know where I was. But I thought I was dead, but I couldn't figure out where I was. And about that time, I could hear this guy making some noise up the top of the hill, calling out or something. And I hollered, is that you, Rich? And he immediately hollered, yeah, is that you, Kazi? I said, yeah. He said, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. The ground, everything is super hot. So he said, come up here. Right up here. I got a real cool spot right here. And so I stepped out and I walked around. It seemed like there were some rocks there or something. I'm not sure, but I remember going out around to the left a little bit and I walked maybe to the back of the room. I, I, we, we both not sure exactly where he was or where I was, except that we know where the bodies were. And they were found right in here, I think it is. Yeah, right, right about there. This is the next day or within, within the next week. You can see some blue skies. But, um, that's something else I want to explain to you, too. Um, you know where those guys were, so I had to be right up in here about 50, 80 feet above them, maybe 100 feet. So I walked up to where Rich was, and he's sitting on the ground, and there was a strip about as wide as these tables, and it was almost like grass or moss, and it was about as long as two of these tables. And I looked at it, and he said, have a seat. So I turned around and sat down next to him. And we're sitting there, and a few minutes later, Glenn Spady came from up the hill, came down and sat down next to me. He would have been on my right. And then a few minutes after that, um, Shilcut walked up, and I think he sat right between us or next to Spady. I'm not sure. It seemed like there was somebody between me and you, but I can't remember who it is. But it's not that important. But he says, I quit. I ain't doing this friggin' job no more. I said, you got that shit right. So let's get the hell out of here and go get a beer. Shokut says, I'll buy a pitcher. And I said, no, I'll buy a pitcher. And he says, I'll buy it. So we're sitting up there, three toasted dudes, talking about who's going to buy the first pitcher, right? About that time, the helicopter comes back, the same guy. He saw everything happen. He spun around, came back, and got down as low as he could, like Rich said. And two hell attack guys come bailing out of that thing. And he was getting pretty low, and it looked like we're sitting down, and he's right out here, almost right above us. And how we're yelling at each other, we, we must have been yelling. But we're talking like we're just talking, but we hadn't been yelling. I said to Glenn, I said, if that guy gets any lower, catch that runner, and I'll climb up you, and we'll get in that chopper and get the hell out of here. Rich, Rich in the meantime, says, Let's go. He starts to get up, and I, I must have been next to you because I remember grabbing, pulling, sit down. They got all these goddamn helicopters flying around. They can fly us out of here. We quit. We don't work for this outfit no more. We're done. He says, good idea, and he sat back down. So the guy got a little bit lower, and Spady grabbed the wheel, and I climbed up Spady and pulled him in to the middle seat. I was in the outside, and the pilot's on the left side, and the guy just went, I yelled, get out of here, and he just went down, and down at the bottom of the riverbed, which is right out in here, there was a lot of apparatus in there, a lot of engines and water tankers and trucks and ambulances and, you know, uh, pickups, a lot of stuff. And it, to me at that time, it looked like that area was being um, graded 
for lots. Like every 50, 60 feet, there was like a little hump, and then another hump, you know, and it was all kind of flat, and it had been beat up, and so it was real sandy. We're in the helicopter, and when he peeled off and started down, I looked back into the canyon, and my mind, I said, my God, they're all dead. They're all, the whole crew's dead. They're all dead. I'm the only one left alive. I just talked to Spadey. Spadey's sitting next to me. Rich is sitting down there. Jay Shokut's sitting right there. But my mind, they're all gone. Every one of them's gone. So we got down, and he started hovering and coming down. You know how they'll pull over an area and then come down. He got down close to what I thought was close to the ground, and I opened the door. This is after I'm thinking they're all gone. I threw the door open, and I hollered back over my shoulder, go get the rest of them, and I bailed out the helicopter. Well, the thing was about 25 or 30 feet above the ground when I bailed out that sucker, and I did a perfect belly flop, just flat. But I hid in all that soft sand and a little bit of rock, and so I was okay. I come up with a face full of dirt, he's spitting, and two uh, Cal Fire guys ran over, CDF guys. No, I think they were LA County Fire, same guys that got a hold of you later. They come over and picked me up by my arms, and when they did, and I had my sleeves up to here. This sleeve fell off, and this one I looked at was still smoldering. And they, they grabbed me right here, so I was getting up off the ground. They grabbed me right here to help me up, well they didn't see the burns back here, you know, on either sleeve. This one fell off, and I said, God damn, don't touch me. They said, can you walk? I said, yeah, I think so. And so we, they kind of went beside me, you know, guided me over to the back of the big engine was sitting there, the L.A. County fire engine, red engine, with a big chrome dock bumper. It looked like it was about that wide. And they said, sit right here, we've got an ambulance coming. I said, okay. And so I sat down on that ambulance on that dock bumper of that truck. And I started thinking about the guys up in the canyon again. And again, I thought, oh, yeah, they're all dead, they're all dead, they're all gone. And I started throwing up. I don't know how, because I've been throwing up all the way down the mountain earlier. But I started throwing up. And all of a sudden, I saw two spit shine shoes standing right in front of me. And I'm, I got my head down between my knees, and I'm rocked in the middle. That's coming out. And I remember thinking, oh, buddy, you're standing in the wrong spot. And uh, finally I looked up with well, the guy standing there and he had a fire, fireman's uniform, a class A uniform on, had a tie, tie clasp, all that stuff. And I looked at him and he said, can you walk? And I started, and what I meant to say was, no, they just stuck this engine under my ass. Of course I can walk. He said, get my car and I'll take you to the hospital. That's good, I said. Yeah, that was another thing we were talking about when we were sitting up there, Rich said, I started to light a cigarette, I skipped that part. We sat there for five minutes or something, and I started to light a cigarette. That's what you needed after being burned. Little last cigarette. I got cigarettes out and I looked and I said, oh my God, and my hands from here to here was just a big bubble, both hands. And I looked at it and they were already kind of cracked open like the top of a muffin, you know how, both hands. And I thought, oh my God, and I started trembling. And I said, look at this. I turned to Rich and said, look at this. He holds his arm up and it's <laughs> two feet. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> he said, uh, I said, we got to go get it. We get our lungs checked. We're still arguing about the beer at this point. And I says, then we'll go get a beer. He said, good plan. We get, we get our lungs checked and then we're going to go get a beer. I said, right on. We, don't, we have no idea we're even hurt. We don't think, we don't even know we're hurt. I figured out oh, they could put some gauze on it or something I can drink with this hand or something and they they took us and he took us over and he put me in his car he had uh, it was a fire department car it had red lights and siren on it Glenn Spade he's already in the back seat Glenn smart he rode the damn helicopter the ground stepped out walked in and got in the car I got in the front seat and he's in the back seat and he's laying over in his side and when I sat down it was like Gordon sitting in that pickup truck uh, my ass was not burnt and my back wasn't burnt because of this little tool. I usually don't burn this. This was the coolest thing ever if you were cadre, was to have one of these. Had a little pouch in the back, you could put maps, area maps and stuff. We actually used this on fires, believe it or not. They would give us big area maps and you can roll it up and you can stick them back there. Worked great. I had this little beauty on. 
and uh, it's got a few holes in the back. This was a little burn spot, and this was too. Now I think the moss have kind of got it a little bit, but that, that's what I had on, and it saved my back. Because I was wearing this, my back wasn't burned at all. The back the side of my head, my ears, the back of both arms, because I was laying like this with my hands down, beers, arms, both, both hands, the back of both legs, but it stopped right where the wrinkle is in your Levi's or jeans, right behind your knee, you know how that's always wrinkled back there? That little wrinkle was enough that I had no burns. In fact, I don't think any of us had burns on right there in that three or four inch area between the upper leg and the lower leg, and none of us had burns on our feet. All of us had burns on our hands, every one of us, including Gordon. Um, something else I left out, I can't think of what it was. Anyway, we went, started for the hospital, and the guy's driving, he's got the red lights and siren going, and by this time, they know they have a major problem. They've got 24-man crew that's just been burned over in a canyon in Pacoima, Selmar area. And so they've called for all the ambulances they've got in the San Fernando Valley, and you can hear, you know, sirens coming from every direction. And all the people in the neighborhood, just a regular, like a residential neighborhood, just a couple blocks from the site. We could see the homes from up above. And all the people was coming out of their homes, and they were standing on the corners where the red lights and the stop signs were. And they're gawking, looking to see what's going on, you know. For some reason, it really pissed me off, and I started screaming obscenities at them like hell wouldn't have it. I called them everything, everything I could think of. I don't think I made up anything. I had plenty of vocabulary. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the back of my head started hurting. And I thought, what the hell? I looked around, and at Glenn, he's slapping me in the back of the head. Bam, bam, bam. Ed, Ed, Ed. I said, what? What's wrong with you? Why are you hitting me? He said, the guy driving's a chaplain. I said, oh, God almighty, I'm going to hell for sure. I looked over there, and there he was, a little collar, a little cross on his collar. I thought, oh, God. I said, I'm sorry, Father, Reverend. I don't even know what your title is. And he said, that's okay, son. They kind of bugging me, too. Go ahead and yell at him some more. <laughs> he was pretty cool. He spoke at the 30th anniversary of the fire. And I wish to God, I've thought a hundred times, I wish I'd have gone over and thanked him and told him who I was and that I was the first one that he got to the hospital. It was, it was really nice, but I've heard since then he's, he's passed on. But they, we got to the hospital. I yelled at a few more people out there. And we got to the hospital, and I waited for the car to stop, and I opened the door, and I stepped out like a regular human being. And Glenn and I walked up three little stairs, it seemed like, and had a ramp there for ambulances to pull in, and it was uh, double doors. And we stepped in, and the doors opened, you know, so we stepped in, the doors closed, and we're standing there looking, and, you know, we're, we're, absolutely, my legs are starting to get stiff, you know, and uh, we're kind of walking like this, you know. Uh, Hello, anybody here? And, uh, we, it seemed like we waited forever, it was probably two or three minutes. All of a sudden, a little candy striper came around the corner. She's about 16, 15 years old. She had a tray full of pills, those little cardboard cup things that had pills on it, about six or eight of those. She's standing there like that, and she's looking at Glenn, she's looking at me, she's looking at Glenn, she's looking at me. And all of a sudden, she throws it up in the air and just turns around and just hauls ass down the hall. Ah! Screaming, yelling. And I thought, well, what the hell's wrong with her? I watched her go all the way to the end of the hall. And I turned to Glenn and I said, you okay? I said, do I look okay? And he said, you look fine. I said, yeah, you look good too. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I didn't. He looked okay to me and he said, I looked okay. She hit the end of the hall and a big black woman come around the corner. And she's still wah, wah, pointing and screaming and not making any sense. And the woman went pow, pow, and hit the shit out of her. <laughs> and uh, I turned to Glenn and I said, Remember that one, she'll kick our ass. <laughs> yeah, I, she got my attention right off. So this woman come around the corner and she looked at us and she said, oh my God, and she grabbed the candy. She said, go get Dr. Brown, Dr. Jones, and name three or four doctors. Get them all, everybody out here right away. And they came down there and they, they put us on gurneys and they took manila envelopes and they cut them in half and they taped them, duct taped them to the side of the gurney. So they had a, like a tray all the way around, about six inches deep. And they covered it nice and laid a, 
uh, cloth over it and laid us on those things and started cutting off my whites and I grabbed up, don't cut my whites, you can cut the laces, but don't cut them whites. So they did, they cut the laces. They pulled uh, this sleeve off, they cut my, the rest of my clothes off, covered me with another thing. And then the guys just started pouring in, you know. And I remember laying there till about 11. About 7 o'clock, 7.30, uh, Pat Chase said, uh, I want a priest, I want a priest. He was, he was burned pretty bad. He was probably burned, I was burned, I think, 34, 35%. Pat, I think, was 40, maybe 45%. And Pat wanted a priest, and so they called the priest in, and um, when the priest finished with Pat, he turned around, and we were in a big room like this. And there was 10 of us, wasn't there? 12 of us? Well, well, we lost 12, we had 24. Three got out, four went, didn't go. Yeah, there was about 10 of us in this room on these gurneys. And this hospital had like six rooms, you know, total. It was just total overload in that hospital. And uh, I called the priest over. They were giving us morphine by this time. And I kind of, I said, Father, I, I'm Catholic. And he came over and, and I kind of blacked out. And then I woke up and I realized he was putting oil on my forehead and the sign of a cross. And I thought, oh my God, he's giving me the last rites. I reached up and I grabbed his wrist and I said, no, Father, I can't die. I'm getting married in three weeks, I thought. And I grabbed his wrist and he said, no, 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 no. And he laid me back down very gently and he says, just a good blessing, just a good blessing. I said, okay, Father, but none of that last rite stuff. That blessing, okay, none of the last rites. I tell you, I'm going to get married in three weeks. And I said, I was supposed to be married in three weeks. She'd already sent the invitation to the to the uh, hotshot camp and there was a bunch of us going to go up. Well, of course, I was going. Richie was coming, and I think well, Peter was going to come up. I can't remember who else. Jim Brown. But uh, that wedding was didn't consummate until end of end of April, seven months later, six months later. There's something else about that. Oh, here it is. Everybody talks about, oh, my shovel. When they... Um, when they hit reverse tool order, and I, I would guess you do something of the same now, the very first thing we were taught to do was get rid of your tools. Get them out of the way, get them away from you as far as you can. Wind up and let them go, you know, off to the left, off to the right, as long as you're not throwing them toward any other crew member. So I spun and I threw mine right here, and I'll tell you where it landed. It landed right up here on this ridge. This is the deep canyon that they talk about. We were right in here. This, that's the diamond area. We were right at the diamond area, I think. My shovel landed right on that lip right there. Okay? And the handle was in the black. And the metal blade was in the flames. And they knew it was mine because I had my initials, you know, where the, where the, the metal handle, I mean, the metal part of the shovel comes up about that far and it kind of wraps around the back and there's a little V back there with wood where it goes in. Okay, right where that little V is, it had an EC in there, okay, with red. We, all of our tools, we had personalized tools, every one of us. And, our, and it was in this particular order in the truck, okay. I had two, two shovels and two hooks in that truck that were mine and they said EC on the handles of both of them. And they went to the truck they found the shovel and the blade was curled up like tinfoil. Just like that, they told me later. They went to the truck and they got my other shovel off the truck that had my initials on it, just like the, the handle was completely unburned. That's how they knew it was mine. It was in a million to one shot, but that's where it landed. And so they took my other truck and they took it to UC Riverside to the fire lab. And they ran tests on it and they said that it had to been, that's where they got 2,500 degrees. It had to be 2,500 degrees in that canyon for that shovel to react like that. Now, how humans, even for 15 seconds, could stand that kind of a blast and live is, is, is a miracle to me. It really is. Um, I told you about Fred Danner, died six weeks later, eight weeks later. Uh, when we first got to the hospital, well, they moved us the next day to L.A. County, like Gordon was talking about, and it was just a hell hole. And um, Rich's mom and dad came to see me. He was in a, I was on the ninth floor. I think you were up on 11 or down on 7. I still don't remember. He was in intensive care. I was more in a general 
uh, hospital area, serious but not critical. And uh, they came and visited me, said he's doing okay, you know, he's got his hands down. I saw his hands and his arms, so it wasn't a shock. And, and so about two weeks later, ten days later, they moved Rich in right next to me. I had the bed right by the board with a big double door right by my bed. He was right next to me. Uh, Chenard was over in the corner. I think Jerry Smith was in the next corner. I can't remember. Gordon was right at the bottom of my bunk. When I woke up, I went unconscious. I, I stayed awake. That was a Tuesday night. I stayed awake till about 11 or 10 minutes after 11. I remember seeing a great big clock like that up on the wall. And I stayed awake till about 11 o'clock at night, and I was gone. The next thing I knew, I was in a very strange bed, and I had no idea where I was. And they had they had <coughs> sheets over me, but they were about this high above me. And they had a string of light bulbs coming through there and coming out and going back around. And the sheets, nothing was touching me. I was like naked underneath that thing. But they had all those light bulbs in there to keep me warm. And my hands were wrapped up like boxing gloves. They had gone in there and taken strips off the top of my legs and, and put skin grafts on the back of both hands. And they put gauze in there, okay? And they packed gauze and they wrapped uh, like an ace bandage all around it. And they were, they looked, they were huge. They looked like two boxing gloves. Well, all I remembered was those two giant blisters. And I wake up and I got these two God awful looking bandages. I thought for a few minutes that they had amputated both of my hands. And I went fuck screaming. Talk about obscenities. I went nuts. And they got a nurse in there and she said, No, 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 they're fine, they're fine. Well if you can't touch and feel your own fingers and hands, how do you know they're still there when you when you've got that? I do now, but I mean you wake up and you're where the hell am I? And uh she unwrapped them enough to where I could see the top of my fingers and I could kind of go like that a little bit on both hands. I said, okay, and she wrapped them back up. And the next thing I started looking around to see where I was and I couldn't see anything because of this big tent thing that was over me. Finally, I leaned out enough to look down where this table is. And right there looking back at me was God himself. I thought, everything's going to be fine if God's here. <laughs> I felt, as soon as I saw Gordon, I knew that you know it was okay. And Rich and I started getting together the next week or ten days, and we kept hearing the same eight or nine names. They wouldn't tell us who had who had passed on and who had made it. And the, the biggest shocker, I mean, I never heard the name Ray Chi. I never heard the name John Verdugo. I never heard the name of all the guys that had died. We were pretty close with who we thought. There was one shocker, and that was Jay Shilcutt. Jay, when he got up to try to save Barnhill, pretty much did himself in because he was up stand not standing, but up a lot higher. And he pulled his canteen off and was trying to put the flames out on Barney. And he ingested a ton of hot air, super hot air. And in those days, now nowadays they can do a lot of things for firefighters that that singe their lungs or something. Back then, nothing. They put him in an iron lung at, at LA County. And uh, he lived about three or four days. And eventually his lungs filled up with water and he literally drowned on his own bodily fluids. They said there wasn't a thing they could do for him then. About the second, first or second week in December, I'm laying by the bed, so it's my idea. I gotta, I gotta guard the door. Anybody starts in, we start chirping at them, you know. Don't come in here with any tears in your eyes. We ain't putting up with that shit. You got anything to eat, by the way? You got anything to drink? You got a beer in your pocket? Anything? Anybody? No? Okay. You sure you haven't got a hamburger? You know, we do that shit all the time. And then if they come in and they look normal, we'd start picking it. Look at that. He's got both his ears. And look at this sucker. He's got a perfect nose, you know. <laughs> we'd be after them. We wouldn't let anybody feel bad for us. Well, it was a stunningly beautiful, tall, rather thin Hispanic girl standing there, kind of weeping a little bit. And I, I didn't know, but I thought, She's looking for one of our guys. And I said, hi, can I help you? She said, yeah, I think so. I, I'm looking for the El Carrizo Hot Shots. I said, come on in here, baby. You found all five, five of us or eight of us was in there at that time. I said, you found all seven, eight of us, handsome dudes, handsome studs. I forgot what I told her. And she kind of smiled a little bit, and I thought, that's better than the little weeping head. She wasn't crying, but she was close. 
And I said, hi, I'm Ed Cosgrove. And she said, oh, hi. Jay talked about you all the time. And I just went, oh, my God. I, it, it, I almost lost it. And I, I quickly, I think I said something to Rich, and, and we both started kind of picking at her a little bit. She was wonderful. She come and saw us two, two, three times a week. He left two or three kids, I can't remember. He was 26. Of the crew members, he was the oldest of the crew members. He was 26 years old, and he left at least two kids. And she used to sneak us in the little pudding cups, and sometimes she'd bring in hamburgers. And we weren't getting anything to eat. Nothing. It was the the food was terrible, and when they did give it to you, it wasn't enough to keep an ant alive. And so anybody that came to see us, we'd beg them to bring to bring uh, food, and she did. She brought them a lot. In fact, um, her and my wife got together, fiance at that time, and we exchanged Christmas cards with Juanita Shellcut for probably ten years after after the loop fire, and then I th she probably remarried. She was twenty five, I guess, twenty three. I don't know beautiful young lady and she was just terrific and, and we really got to loving her. She was great to come come in there. She always made us feel good. But we had uh, LA County brought in cases of Coke. And I don't think we ever drank any of that Coke, did we? I don't remember. Either. I don't remember either. I think about it, but we had a TV. The Coke was piled up at least as high or higher than that white bookcase right there, that filing cabinet. And on top of that shut up oh, about a 19 inch TV. Well, we're all in beds, and the ceiling was real high, so it was even higher than that, probably another foot higher, and then the TV on top. Well, we're all strapped into these beds, and we got IVs and all this shit. Can't hardly walk. <laughs> no remote. Oh, we figured out a way to do it. We'd just take turns. Ah! Ah! Oh, I'm in horrible pain! Oh, nurse! Nurse! And they'd come in. What do you need? Turn on Channel 5, will you? And they'd change channels for it. So after a little while, we'd holler, TV! And there was no more yelling, just taller TV. And they'd come in and they'd change channels or turn up the volume. Whatever we needed, they would take care of it for us. Gordon, before he left, he said, Bashir, and tell him about Big Mama. We had a, a black nurse that was on night shift that came in. And, and we grew to love this woman. But it was a little tough at first. She'd come in every night. She was shaped just like Aunt Jemima on a syrup bottle. You know, big lady. <coughs> She'd come in and stand there and say, how are my boys doing? <coughs> and I was the first one, so she, I'd, I'd start right here. Oh, Mama, oh, I can't walk. I can't move. I'm hurting so bad. I, oh, I can't, Mama, not tonight. I just can't do it tonight, Mama. Okay, she'd rip the covers back off us. Get your white honky ass out of here and down the hall where I can change these beds. Did it every night. We did the same. We'd lay there and try everything we could think of. And every night she'd run us out. And here we'd go down the hall. I had one leg working and one wasn't. Oh, God. It was hysterical. And we'd have to sit down there on them drafty cold benches, <laughs> half naked, every goddamn night. But she took so good care of us. Rich and I went back up there and we took her a bottle of scotch about three months later after we both got out of the hospital. Mama Mitchell was our favorite. Oh, Mama, we just, we just can't make it tonight, Mama. Oh. Sorry, Mama. <laughs> Off come the covers. Get your white honky asses out of here. Did I miss anything? <laughs> uh, that's, what we, that's what she said to us every night. She was great. She, and, and the rest of the, the, rest of the nurses' aides and, and um, LVNs or whatever they were, I don't even know if they even had titles. Every one of them that worked on that ward were uh, black or Hispanic. Every one of them. And they were the sweetest ladies you've ever seen. I mean, they would try to be so gentle with us when they could. There was one particular thing that we just loved. They didn't have the ways or the means or the money or whatever to pick the dead skin off of us. So they wrapped us in gauze, and they pulled the covers back, and they took a gallon jug. It was a white or clear bottle of what looked like water. They kept it, literally, kept it on the fire escape because it had to be colder than 60 degrees. That's cold as hell. They'd come in after they changed all the bandages and they'd dump it all over us. Up and down both arms, up and down both legs, and this stuff would all puddle right underneath your ass. It turned everything it touched brown, including our skins. I looked like a Mexican <coughs> time I got out of that hospital after seven weeks. <laughs> Honest to God, I was dark as any Mexican. <laughs> And they'd, lay, they'd wait 
they would really they would wait four hours, and they'd come back in, and they'd take some scissors and cut right up through the bandages, and then rip them off after they'd dried out. You talk about pain, boys. You don't ever want to be in a hospital where they're doing that. We did it six times a day for six weeks. And they moved me to Balboa Navy Hospital. Rich was moved real shortly after I did. His dad got him into Cal California Lutheran. You know what? I got it written right, right down right here on the back of this little <laughs> book. I just saw it. And I know I got that from your dad way back then, a long, long, long time ago. Um, they moved us down there. And when I got there, when I joined the Hot Shots that summer, I was about 150, 155 pounds. When I got to Balboa Navy Hospital, I weighed 94 pounds. Dr. Len Ketchum, Command, Lieutenant Commander Len Ketchum was my plastic surgeon and my doctor the whole time I was there. He was awesome. This guy was, he was having to serve two years or three years of active duty because the Navy had put him through medical school or graduate school, I'm not sure. Don't care. It was 1966, almost 1967 when I first met him. And he took one look at me and he said, God Almighty, they've been using silver nitrate. See, we were told that, that, the, that we were in the finest burn center in the United States. It couldn't have been any further from the truth. As far as the Forest Service knew, maybe that was true. I don't know, but it was a horrible place. And they told us that, oh yeah, you're getting the finest treatment, the finest everything. Dr. Ketchum said, oh my God, they've been using silver nitrate. And I said, well, yeah, of course. I thought it was the finest treatment anywhere. He said, we stopped using that in 1952 after Korea. I said, oh my God. This was 1966, almost 67, 14, 15 years later. He says, we have gauze impregnated, gauze that's impregnated with disinfectants and stuff. And they would lay that on and then wrap it up as they did before with an ace bandage. And then when they came back to change it every day, they only changed it once a day, they would cut through it, and then they'd put a corman in there with a pair of tweezers, spend about a half an hour peeling that thing back so he didn't tear anything loose. And then he would get a pair of tiny little forceps and start picking at the dead stuff back in there. You couldn't even tell he was there, you know, just a little, little twist, a little, I thought it was great. And they put me in a bath, bathtub the first day after he checked me out. So put him in the bathtub, five a hex, and get this stuff off of him. First he says, do you drink beer? <laughs> Pissed me off when Gordon said he had all the beer he could drink. Did you hear that? I never heard that till this morning. Oh, I almost went through that roof. I looked at that doctor and I said, are you shitting me? He said, no. I said, I'll drink it all, doc. I said more than that. I'd promised him anything for a bottle of beer by that time. And... Uh, he says, give him a bottle, what do you drink? I said, bottle Coors. Get him a, a six-pack of Coors every day. And I had my own little refrigerator, one of those little college apartment refrigerators, a six-pack of beer sitting in there every day. About one o'clock, oh, Corman! They'd come running in, I'd pop me a beer, and down it'd go. They put me in the bathtub the first day, and they were trying to get all that shit off, and he was kind of, he had a real light sponge, and he was rushing, and a little bit of it come off. Most of it didn't. It took a long time for it all come off. And then he cut, the, cut through the bandages, and he's sitting there, and he's peeling it back, peeling it back, and I'm watching him, and I'm thinking, this is going to take all day, you know. <laughs> I'm sitting in this tub of water up to here. What the hell? So I, I said, wait a minute. I just reached over and pulled it and threw it on the floor, pulled this one off, threw it on the floor. And he looked at me, and his eyes got big, and he went, punk, and hit his head on the side of the bathtub and knocked himself out. I'm, I'm shaking him, trying to wake him up. But hey, 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 I don't know his name. I've just been there about an hour. I don't even know who the hell he is. And I'm hollering and hollering, and I don't see nobody coming in or out. And I looked over, and it's a push button on the wall, push for nurse. And I pushed the button. It was an intercom. Yes. I said, I think you need another corpsman or whatever it is you guys call him. He said, you got one in there. I said, I know, but he's got a big knot in his forehead, and he's out cold on the floor. Oh, my God, we'll be right there. He came back by a couple hours later and he said, you're the toughest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life. I said, that's nothing. They were soaking wet. You'd been soaking them for two, an hour. He said, I said, they used to do that six times a day at L.A. County, dry. And he went, yeah, all right. And he walked away. It was the truth. They did them dry over and over and over on Fridays. They'd wake us up at what, 5 o'clock or we'd hear them coming? It was earlier than that. 4.30, 5 o'clock. 
it was staff day, and they would come through. Jordan said it's a teaching school. It's the USC Medical Center. So they bring all their med students in there. 20, 30 doctors following them around, looking, gawking, you know, look, what's he got, you know? We're Burns, what the hell you think we got? They'd rip all them bandages off and leave us laying there in the open air. If a burn is covered and sealed, it doesn't hurt at all. I can sit here forever talking to you guys and have all the burns in the world, but if you peel them things off and it's just like burning, burning, burning. We'd lay there four and five hours. I had one huge advantage. I was the first one by the door. They'd come in, they'd look me over, okay, who next? Richie would be right behind me. I'm huffing it down the hall, naked as a jaybird. Didn't give a shit. Down the hall, into the, into the tub, and then make sure the other one's full, because he's going to be about 30 seconds right behind me. Come running down there and jump in his tub, and then we'd sit there. Ah, that's better. Every Friday morning, we hated Fridays. Just hated it. It was just terrible. Every morning for breakfast, we got a hard-boiled egg, burnt toast, and cold dog meal and milk that was usually out of date. No wonder I weighed 94 pounds. I lost like almost 60 pounds, or right at 60 pounds, in six weeks. Part of it was the burns, I'm sure. The time I got out of the hospital, I was back up around 130, 140 or something. But he did all kinds of operations. He did redid my ears, that they looked even worse before he did them. He cut, a, cut me right here in the neck and on this side. And then he sewed it up, and it was attached here and here. Looked like little fingers up there. And he waited about a week, and he went back and he cut it right here. And he attached it to the bottom of the ears. And he took bone marrow out of my collarbones, and put it in there and formed an ear. And then cut it from the top part and put that on top of the ear. It was the weirdest thing, especially when it was just here and here. It looked like little handles on the side of my head. <laughs> yeah. Took him, oh God, about a month to do that. I did that as an outpatient. And I got out uh, late February, I got out of the hospital. Three months in the hospital. It was a bitch. Did I forget anything? Two. I think we're good. Any questions? We bored you guys long enough? For the, the six and seven crew, do you know by any chance, because I know you guys, you guys you guys left after that, um, how was the recruitment effort for the, filling the crew for six and seven? Is it a hard thing to come by? Or I don't guys? think so. Yeah, I'm not I don't know. Sure. That's a good question. I really don't know. We Rich? were down at the memorial this morning looking at some of the bricks that were in way down there. Yeah. <coughs> and Brooke dude, his, he had a, a one down there. He actually had it made, or someone had it made for him. And it said that he was back on El Cariso in 67 and 71. And that's that's the first we've heard. That's a new brick down there. I got I got to email him and find out if that's if that's true. And Tim Sullivan, who painted the '66 shield, Tim Sullivan was definitely there in '67. He went back. Yeah. He that's the reason. He was the reason we stopped at Corona, because just as the bells went off to go to um, L.A., uh, he drove up with his wife in a in an old kind of junker car, and the clutch was out in it. And Gordon told him where we were going, and he said, that's perfect. I know a mechanic in Corona. I'll meet you. It's right by the Corona station. I'll meet you at Corona station. And that's why we stopped in Corona on the way up there. But he didn't get there in time. I don't know if his car, I never did think to ask him. He just said when, we, when he got there, we had already been there and gone. Gordon waited around like five or ten minutes, and we took off. Or Sullivan would have been in that fire, too. He'd have been toward the back, though. Yeah. The three guys in the back, the new, the new kid, Rod, and, and uh, John Moore were out without a scratch. And, and our assistant superintendent would, had just a little bit of burns on him, for, a little bit of first-degree first burns on him. He was way up in the back, too. All, all the rest were, were burned. Oh, um, they said there was guys at the bottom of the hill watching. We were the El Carrizo Hotshots, you got to remember, world famous. <laughs> at least in the fire department anyway. They were down there with glasses and they saw the thing blow and they could see the, crew, the first five guys, the five hooks coming toward them. And they said they, when they hit the flames or just before they hit the flames, they bounced back. They were running downhill and they bounced back. The force of it knocked them down and they found the bodies just in a pile. Those were the, they took those remains to 
Oak Grove Station and tried to identify them. They ended up using dental records to identify all five. They said they saw them bounce back. Ray did right. He tried to lead them into the burn. He knew it was safe on the other side of that fire, but who would have ever thought that it'd be coming with you that kind of force? And for the Forest Service to call this a uh, flare-up, I think you guys can all agree now it was a hell of a lot more than a flare-up. And it was a whole lot more than brush. You can't get brush to burn at 2,500 degrees. There has to be a tremendous amount of fuel, like jet fuel or something. In this case, it was gas. And, and, and they know that, uh, that uh, brush will often well, it's not often, but sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, won't burn completely, but it emits an odorless, colorless gas. We were surrounded by it. The offshore winds changed, the, the, the direction of the winds <coughs> changed in that summer, but in that late afternoon, 3, 4 o'clock, we were burned at 3.55 at the afternoon. It turned around and it started burning up, I mean, it started blowing up canyon, and it came out of that, the deep canyon, and it pushed it right up right where the spot fire was. When that guy dropped, it was just like a match in the gas tank. That was the loud combustion we heard, the loud boom, and knocking people down. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. You get on the fire and you see them bubbles get the hell out of the way. Let everybody know. Very rare. That I've told is very, very rare. You know? Yep. Anyway, thank you gentlemen for having us and putting up with us all the bullshit. But we feel important that you guys know, you know, because you're going to be out there all summer. It's rare, but it can happen. But you've got a lot better protection than we had. No max and all the stuff, you know. Keep your damn gloves on, or you'll end up looking like this. Show them what you look like. Give them the finger. That a boy. When we give you the finger, we really give you the finger. That's one of Gary uh, Casey Jerry's favorite lines. We give you the finger, we really give you the finger. He lost his pinky on this hand. He had to learn to guitar, play guitar left-handed. I think we got it. I don't believe so. Rich and I went back up there to the camp uh, in the summer of 67. I took my, uh, my new wife with me. We'd been married a couple of months by that time. And we went up there on a Sunday knowing that they would be in camp. Uh, it was tradition for the hot shots to be, if we weren't on fire, to be in camp on Sunday, particularly Sunday afternoons. That's when we would cut the grass and clean the trucks and change the oil and clean out the barracks, wash windows, and whatever had to be done as far as maintenance, cleaning up uh, leaves that have fallen all over the place, stuff like that. It was a maintenance day in, in the morning and then in the afternoon where you saw those trucks backed up where the picture of Rich is talking when he's got the orange shirt on, the fire shirt. That's, that was our classrooms and, and there was a little TV in there got like one channel. We'd watch TV in there at night. But we, Gordon would hold classes in there on weather and safety and wind conditions and all that, all that different things that he was trying to teach us about. We'd spend all Sunday afternoon in the, in the barracks or in the our classroom it was just an open shed, really, big open shed, where they kept the trucks in the wintertime. Buggies, as you guys now call them. Yeah, but we went up there, and they had full crews. It was July or August, I'd say July, and they were, they were doing fine. You know, they were, they were good. They all looked at us like we were ghosts or something. What was that line? I said, they're looking at they told you, they're looking at it like we're ghosts. And what did you say back? No, I don't remember. Oh, it was you guys we were talking about. But 19, 1996, we were at the dedic rededication of the park, and Jay was the, was the, was the uh, superintendent. And the 96 class, I don't think any of you guys were here 20 years ago, but uh, the 96 El Carrizo Hotshots were there with their buggies, and we marveled at how fine they were. <laughs> and we lined up for a group picture, and I turned to Rich, and I whispered in his ear, kind of, I said, they're looking at us like we're kind of heroes. And he said, nope, they think we're fucking ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember that line. That was a good one. I said, I, that's got to be a great picture somewhere. I was dying laughing when he said that. Thank you guys, and have a great summer. Keep it, keep it safe. Right? Yeah, be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, well, one more thing to say is, is I hope you guys get your, your type 1 classification yes. oh, back God, this yeah. year. It's been too long now. Wait, uh,